A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Makati Productions presents an unabridged recording of Star Wars Legacies Edge 3, The Waiting Dark, written by Gregory O. Scott. The long battle for the soul of the Empire is nearly complete. Moff Veer's rebellion is nearly defeated. But Emperor Davek fell, his Imperial Knights, and his sons, a greater reckoning awaits. Prophetic dreams fill Prince Vitor fell with dread while Rome struggles to find a place in his father's domain. Meanwhile the Hope's cluster suffers under the cruelty of his Sith Queen. Alana Solo, Jay Skywalker, Arlen fell, and the Jedi search for ways to help and to uncover the hidden secrets of the Sith. For Arlen's daughter Marin, Secrets of another kind are about to change her life forever. However, it is one rogue Dark Lord, Darth Tarot, once known as Warren, who will defy his masters and bring a war between light and dark to its thunderous climax. Part 1 Youth in Wartime Chapter 1 Anshin's nightside face was only a slim crescent visible at the edge of starless black, colored warm browns and greens by the planet's vast steppe. As the approaching freighter drew close to the planet, it filled the cockpit viewport and Ronfell could pick out constellations of dense, artificial light-marking cities. They were tiny compared to the major metropoles on Bastion, but Anshin was a much less populated, less important world than the Imperial capital. Nonetheless, it still had a population of some hundred million sentients, mostly non-human, which made it all the more remarkable that the Restoration Front would find shelter here. The freighter's pilot and co-pilot, both gaunt-faced and yellow-skinned Ancyon natives, worked the controls as the ship shuddered into the atmosphere. The co-pilot tapped his earpiece and reported, We're being hailed on schedule. They're requesting we follow their flight plan and land at Quipernum South Spaceport. Can that get us to Duljurhan? Asked Rome. Calculating trajectory now, the pilot tapped his nav computer controls. Done. Stand by to launch in four minutes. You better get to your pod, your majesty. Understood. Thank you, Rome said, then ducked out of the cockpit and hurried to the back of the ship. He reminded himself that the two Anshini who crewed this ship had volunteered to do so. There weren't many of their race and imperial intelligence, but that pair had stepped up for a risky mission to deploy four imperial knights into potentially hostile territory. He also reminded himself that, if all went to plan, the hardest part of their job would be over in four minutes. For Roan and the others, it was just beginning. He knew there were many on Bastion who questioned the wisdom of sending the Emperor's teenage son into a combat situation, but Davik fell led by example and had personally commanded his fleets against the Restoration Front led by Corrine Veers and Leono Grave. He led them again and again over the past eight years as the Empire's forces had taken planet after planet and finally driven Veers and Grave into hiding. Following his father's example was Rome's duty as a newly appointed Imperial Knight and as Prince of the Empire. When he reached the cargo hold he checked his equipment, his backpack, then lightsaber, and his clothes. Not the ceremonial, red armor and cape imperial knights were known for butt green plasteel plates over an insulated camouflage jumpsuit. Then he bent low and pried open the access panel in the floor. Just as he followed his father's example, Rome followed his older brother's lead. He dropped into the pod next to Vitor, lay down on his stomach, and pulled straps across his shoulders and back to secure himself. He found himself staring at two sets of boots belonging to the other two Imperial Knights assigned on their mission. His younger cousin Morgan Walter, still an apprentice, and a slightly older knight named Tresende. Do they think we can hit the target? Asked Vitor. Ron nodded. They made the calculations. Trajectory set. We're good to go. Assuming this bucket doesn't fall apart on us, muttered Mokarin. Have faith, apprentice. Vitor muttered, though Rome could feel the edge in his brother. That was natural but not encouraging. When this had started, when their father had declared himself second emperor of the Fell dynasty, Rome had been just nine years old but Vitor, at fourteen, had been thrust immediately into the fighting and had never seen, stopped. 
Vider's skill in the force, especially in combat, had grown immensely in that time, so much that Rome doubted whether he could ever live up to his brother's example. But even a hero of the Empire could be afflicted with anxiety. The pod's internal speaker rang once, and the pilot's voice announced, Stand by to eject. 30 seconds. Copy, pilot. Vitor called back. May the force be with you. And you, Prince Fell. The calm went silent and Rome took a deep breath. He counted in his head, 20, 15, 10. He glanced sidelong at Vitor and saw his brother's lips twitching in a wordless whisper as he brought it down. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Just on time, the pod jerked violently and began his fall. Disguised as an external cargo crate mounted on the freighter's hull, their capsule had no directional repulsor jets like a traditional escape pod. Any emissions of energy might give them away to watching sensors. Instead, after five seconds of free fall, the pod seemed to jump backward, almost throwing them into the roof as its double-layered parachute extended to slow their descent through the night. The parachute helped, but they were still dropping fast toward the surface. The knights closed their eyes as one and reached out with the force. This wasn't their first mission working as a four-man team, and Rome was familiar with their minds. Viter's battered resolve, tree stoic determination, Morgan's eagerness tinted with anxiety. They tasted each other's thoughts and turned their will to the common purpose of slowing the pod's fall. It was that singular goal that drew Rome away from everything else. The smell of the pod's recycled hair, the tension of the restraint bands over his shoulders, his cousin's boots just inches from his face. Even the individual thoughts of the other knights, his friend, and family. The goal drew him out of time, as well, and after undetermined minutes or seconds, the capsule shuddered one last time as they sat down. From there, they quickly released their crash webbing. Vitor rolled onto his back and unlocked the hatch over their heads. With a push from the force, he knocked it open and shoved away the parachute that draped over them like a great blanket. Then, one by one, they crawled out into the night. Roan had never been to Anshin before, but he knew they were supposed to deploy on the southwest corner of continent called Dojurhan, where intelligence reports suggested the Restoration Front had constructed a base. While Anshin's government pledged loyalty to Emperor Fell, his society was a confusing mess of various tribal allegiances, and at least one of those factions seemed to be giving Veer's people shelter. Dojurhan was the only continent on the largely flat planet to include in major mountain rangers, and the plan had been for the Jedi to drop into this range and begin scouting for the Restoration Front base. Rome spun on one hill in a full circle and quickly decided they were not, in fact, in any mountain range. Rather, they landed on one of the planet's vast rolling steps. We missed the target, Rome sighed. Quite a night view, though, Trees muttered and tipped his head back. Rome did the same. The sky over the flat plain was a great black dome dotted with innumerable stars. You never saw the sky like this on Bastion, only from the inside of a spaceship. It felt weird to see so many stars and feel the wind on your face at the same time. We're not far off, Vitor announced. Rome spotted his brother in the starlight, already about 10 meters from the landing pot, and scanning the area with a set of night vision macro binoculars. Check your north northwest. Rome slung his pack off his back and fetched his own binoculars. Using the device's internal compass as a guide, he scanned the low rolling hills until he spotted the rise of mountain in the distance. At least 15 kilometers to the foothills, said Vitor. After that, the tough part starts. Any idea what time it is, local? Asked Morgan. No hint of dawn, Tree said. I'm guessing we have at least four, five hours before sunup. Best get walking, then, said Vitor. Everyone have their packs. When the younger knights gave affirmatives, he said, Okay, let's get marching. As they began stumbling through the grassy plain, faint and slightly silver in the moonless starlight, Morgan muttered, So this is the glamorous life of an imperial knight. We live to serve, apprentice, Vitor said, playful but firm. As they marched through the night, Rome set his eyes on the darkness ahead. As he stared, he began to make out dark ridges eclipsing stars near the horizon. They seemed so distant, but he knew that soon enough they'd reach them and find the danger they'd come for. By the time they reached the foothills, the sun had come up, 
and by the time they climbed halfway up the first set of mountains it was going down again. Though it made passage more difficult, Vitor was glad when night fell. The ancient skies were cloudless and he'd been worried all day that they might be spotted by a patrolling airspeeder or even an orbital satellite. There was still the threat of that at night, so they waited until they found a shallow cave to remove the portable heater from Tree's pack and turn it on. In this dry, windy climate, the days were hot and nights cool. Temperature changed fast. Morgan was clearly relieved to be off his feet and resting in front of the heater, but Trees remained tense. He'd been through enough infiltration missions to be healthily paranoid. Rome still had energy, so he volunteered to scout the surrounding hills. Vitor stopped him from going alone. This took the younger brother by surprise. Then his eyes narrowed in suspicion, and he added they should stay together for mutual safety. Vitor didn't have it in him to argue with his brother. Rome might even be right. Their night vision goggles amplify starlight and visualize the rocky crags and nearby ridges and shades of black and green. They split off at first, using the force to keep track of each other as they ranged off in different directions. Rome didn't come out and say it, but his suspicion was clear. He thought his brother was chasing a dream again, and he wasn't wrong. Vitor had gotten this one on the flight to Anshin. Like all of his premonitions, he remembered only basic and blurry details on waking. There was nothing in those dreams to suggest that they were, in themselves, force visions, but it had been a long, long time since he'd remembered anything from a dream that hadn't pointed to the near future. Of his vision on Anshin, he remembered night and cold wind. He remembered the rough rocks of a mountain range while the electric light and warmth of human activity peeking out beneath an acres-wide camouflage net that would have blocked the reach of outside sensors. He remembered seeing tiny figures moving about in that light, many wearing the rough surface, bronze-tinted Cortosa stormtrooper armor of the Restoration Front's elite units. Vague and confusing as those barely remembered dreams were, they always pointed him true. They said the future was always in motion, but the dozen or so dreams he'd had since this war began had always pointed to what was coming soon. He didn't like those dreams, especially since they came months apart and never when he was expecting them, but more than once they saved his life, his brother's life, and the lives of loyal Imperial soldiers in this grueling slog against Veer's rebels. If they were to be his gift then they'd be his gift, it wasn't like he could ask the Force to stop them. He and Roan crossed over different ridges and peered into different valleys. Vitor kept his force connection with his brother in the back of his awareness but put most of his concentration on the path ahead. This slope was treacherous and he progressed slowly, stopping regularly to break out his macro binoculars and scan for signs of life. The binoculars didn't do much good, but with his naked eyes he spotted one diamond-shaped hilltop jutting up under the starlight. Though he hadn't remembered it from his dream until now, it stirred some latent echo. He started toward it, dipping first into a shallowed valley, then more slowly climbing up. As he moved, he reached out to Roan and told his brother to come in his direction. He kept moving forward, out of the valley, and onto the next ridge, then found a high outcropping nearer to the diamond-shaped peak. He lay down on his stomach and prepared to scan the next area with his binoculars but stopped. He spotted tiny slivers of light peeking through trees downslope. It was a constant glow, electric and artificial, rather than a flickering fire. He looked up at that half-familiar peak and was sure he'd found the right place. Rather than approach the enemy camp, he waited for Ron to catch up with him. All he had to do was point at the dim light for his brother to understand. Without sharing any words, they worked their way separately downslope, through the trees, toward whatever was waiting. Vitor was operating on his force visions again. Rome was sure of it. He'd been with his brother once before when this happened, years ago during a mission on Gemis. Vitor had anticipated an ambush and maneuvered their party of knights around to take the enemy from behind. The Restorationists had found the perfect hiding place, and there had been no way for knights to have spotted them. So even before Vitor admitted it after the fight, Rome had suspected the force guided his hand. Vitor rarely seemed pleased with those visions, though they saved his life again and again. The fact that they came arbitrarily seemed to frustrate him, but Rome couldn't help but feel a familiar spike of envy for his brother. 
Both of them were strong in the force, but Vitor seemed especially blessed. One day, hopefully far in the future, he'd naturally succeed their father Davik as the third emperor fell. Where that left Rome, the young man didn't know. His fate was less written than Vitor's in more ways than one. He followed Vitor's lead down the slope, winding around the tree trunks as they grew closer to the light. They found a small rise in the land and lay down on their stomachs, shoulder to shoulder between two trees. From this spot they could see that the bottom of this valley had a large sensor scrambling camouflage net drawn over it. Through the broad but narrow horizontal gap between rocky slope and the camo net's roof they could make out the activity inside. Several large hovered anks and squatting inactive walkers sat surrounded by cargo crates stacked high. At this hour of the night only a few men and women moved about. The restorationist gorillas had stopped wearing olive green imperial uniforms years ago, and these ones wore a variety of drag gray or brown civilian clothes with only the scarlet bands around their right biceps as symbols of their affiliation. They watched the activity for a few minutes in silence before Rome saw what he'd been afraid to see. A half dozen figures in stormtrooper armor marched into view, probably on a nighttime patrol. Even from a distance Rome could see that their armor had a rough surface instead of a smooth one, and was tinted bronze instead of white. Back when this war began nearly a decade ago, Malfvirs had received a huge supply of rare cortosis, or probably from his Sith ally on Kuit. That ore had been smelted into stormtrooper armor specifically for his ability to short out a lightsaber, and many Imperial knights had fallen to cortosis protected stormtroopers over the course of this long slog. As Veer's forces dwindled and the restoration movement became a ragtag scattered force, the Imperial Knights had allowed themselves to hope that they'd run down the last of the Cortosis troopers. Ro nudged his brother. Do you want to head back to camp and report this? In a minute. Vitor lowered his binoculars. I want to get a little closer. That's dangerous. They've got to have sensor traps around the perimeter. I know. I spotted a couple. I'll stay clear. What's the point of getting closer? See that there? Vitor pointed to a square metal cabin that Roan had taken for an equipment shed. I'm pretty sure that's the house for a lift that goes underground. How do you know that? See that power generator on the side? I'm pretty sure it's for a turbo lift. If they've got an underground base, there's no way we're sneaking in. Get back to camp, make the call, and let the military do the rest. Roan hesitated, then asked, is this about something you saw in a dream? Vitor shook his head. I only saw what we're seeing here. The rest? He shrugged. I just want a better look. Stay here. Watch my back? Not a problem, Ron muttered, grateful to be staying undercover and embarrassed that his brother was once again the one taking the bold risks. Vitor crawled over the ridge and scampered further downslope. Rome took out his binoculars to track him and track the motion of the Imperials moving in the encampment, apparently unaware. He kept his force awareness locked on his brother. He could feel Viter's cool intent and the current of anxiety that ran beneath, healthily restrained. He watched as Vitor dropped to his stomach again and started scanning the camp with his binoculars. He felt his brother's curiosity rise but couldn't tell exactly what was drawing his attention. The Cortosis troopers were nowhere to be seen. Only a few men and women with red armbands moved about. Then Rome sensed what he should have sensed earlier. A few miles behind him, unfamiliar but dark with intent. He swore aloud and sent a cry of alarm to his brother through the force, then pushed himself off his stomach and stood upright with one hand on his lightsaber. He scanned the dark forest but saw nothing clearly. He only knew they were close. He looked back over his shoulder. Vitor was already hurrying up the slope toward him, a crouched silhouette against the light from the camp. Roan hesitated, uncertain whether to run or wait for his brother to catch up. That was when the first laser blast streaked out of the dark. Roan's danger sense gave him a second's warning, enough to switch on his lightsaber and catch the first shot on his pure white blade. Then more blasts fell, so fast and so many that he couldn't bet them all back. They came from different angles, and though he couldn't see the enemy, he knew they'd formed a semicircle before moving in to take him. He felt Vider's alarm in the force. His brother wasn't under attack yet and was racing to help. 
The next thing Roan felt was the sting of a laser blast that sizzled across the edge of his left shoulder. His entire arm tingled and went numb. They were using stun shots. There was no point in falling back to Vitor. The enemy camp was at their backs. He charged forward, hoping to at least mess up their entrapment formation. More laser shots came, and he ducked low to avoid the first few, but another stun shot snapped at his boot. He stumbled and reared upright. The enemy was close now. The white glow of his saber revealed one Cortosis armored stormtrooper on his right, another on his left. Through his panic he couldn't even sense Vitor anymore. So Ron did the only thing he could. He threw himself at the trooper on his left and got close enough to cut through the barrel of his blaster, then pulled his saber back and angled its tip for a quick forward thrust. His blade slipped in between two Cortosis plates and scorched through fabric and flesh right beneath the trooper's ribcage. The trooper twisted in pain and before Ron could withdraw and the lightsaber scraped against the edges of two Cortosis plates. The saber's handle seemed to rattle in his fist and then the blade shrunk out as though he'd released the switch. As the other trooper's stun blast took him between the shoulders, Roan had a half second to berate himself for being stupid. He didn't even feel it when he hit the ground. Vitor felt his brother's blaze of desperate panic wink out, not in the agony of death, but the sudden cessation of a stun blast. He felt the stormtroopers who got in him too, felt their determination leavened by relief. If they didn't know he was there, Vitor had two options. He could try and rush and to save Roan and take them while their guard was down, though there was no telling how many there were. He had to assume the soldiers were armored with cortosis and virtually invulnerable to his lightsaber. His other option was to fall back to their camp in the cave, where Trees and Morgan guarded the communications equipment they'd used to send short text-based messages to the listening posts. They'd been promised that within 30 minutes of a hail they'd have enough backup to take out whatever hidden outpost the Restoration Front had built on Anshin. It would take him at least 20 minutes at a reckless pace to get back to the cave, and there was no guarantee all their backup would be worth a damn to rescue Rome. He felt torn but only for a moment. Then duty set in. His father had drilled into him over and over that Imperial Knights existed to serve the Empire. They did not go in for flashy heroics, or pointless sacrifices. They were soldiers of the Empire who used the Force as their greatest weapon, that was all. As a soldier, Vitor knew his duty. If he got himself killed or captured trying to free his brother there'd be no help at all. He reached out with the Force one last time, felt the location of the soldiers gathered around Rome's unconscious body, then rose to his feet. He moved as quickly and quietly as he could through the dark forest, away from the troopers, away from his brother, and prayed this was the choice that would save him. Chapter 2 The holographic map that glowed in the center of the room displayed the Empire as a thousand pinpoints of white light, each one marking an inhabited star system. This was the space Davik Fell had lived in all his life, but it was only in the past eight years that he learned the names of every one of those thousand systems. When he first assumed control of Imperial space nearly one-third of those white lights had been colored red, marking them as swearing loyalty to Corian's Veer's restoration movement. He'd looked at that map every single day since then, giving each point of red special consideration as he chipped away at Veer's power base. At first it had been a grueling series of military campaigns. Veer's and his allies had made a fortress out of the Velkar sector and especially the Entrala system where Moff Thane had pledged loyalty in the fight against what Veers consistently labeled the Puppet Emperor. Davik had started the war with a clear advantage in territory and manpower. His forces held control over the capital at Bastion and the two largest naval shipyards at Bilbringi and Yaga Minor. Despite that, it had taken two years to establish control over most of the Velkar sector. Veers fighters had proven unexpectedly ferocious and worse. They were led by Admiral Lionel Grave, an officer about Davik's age who'd proven exceptionally formidable. After four years of bloody struggle had come the turning point. Davik's forces had laid siege to Entrala, and after a month of heavy losses on both sides, Moth Thane had finally surrendered. Veers and Grave had fled the system aboard the last major warship in their possession, the battered but still very deadly superstar destroyer Nemesis. 
Four years ago, the last red lights on Davex Holo map had turned white. From the map alone, his supremacy looked assured, but Nemesis was still out there. So were Veers and Grave. The Admiral may have been a hardliner swayed by nostalgia for Palpatine's oppressive empire, but he quickly learned how to fight like a rebel. For four more years, Davik had been forced to fight defensively against an enemy that appeared out of nowhere, hit fast and hard, then fled to hidden bases scattered among the thousand inhabited systems in the Empire and the thousands more with no populated worlds. When this all began, he looked at the red on his map with determination. Now that the stars had been all white for four years, he felt no triumph when looking at it, only weariness. There was still no hesitation. He'd accepted the lifelong burden guarding his father's legacy when he declared himself emperor. As he stood at the edge of the holographic star field, near the marker for Bastion at the rimward edge of the map, Davek tapped the controller in his hand. A handful of stars began blinking red, on and off. He shifted his attention to the figure standing on the other side of the chamber, near the coreward end, and Bill Bringy. The black uniformed, blue skinned Chiss commander marked the blinking systems with narrowed red eyes. We're sending scouts to some of these systems now, Davik explained. Anshin. Brado Asaji. Lenixtra. Gatika. Roxuli. Imperial knights are military scouts depending on the alleged situation. If the Restorationists have bases there, we'll find them. Are you searching the primary inhabited planets or the whole systems? Ask Meshkan Anshila. Again, that varies by system, depending on our intelligence sources. We know they have other bases in uninhabited systems. Mining operations on asteroid fields and the like. Nemesis is certainly in one of those systems. But they're also laying low on habited systems. Gathering foodstuffs and other supplies that can only be gotten on habitable worlds. Have you considered Veers may have moved outside your borders entirely? Have you seen any indication that they have? Davik asked his cousin. At the start of this war, Canar's people had been most enthusiastic helpers. The Chiss ascendancy held Veers accountable for many of their dead and had wanted him brought to justice. But as the war dragged on, the Chiss' typically isolationist attitudes had taken sway again. After Entrala, they withdrawn most of their forces. Davex and Wainsa, last surviving child of his grandfather Suntir fell, had taken the lead of the Ascendancy's interventionist wing, but the old woman's health was failing and she could no longer play a major role in the Ascendancy's policy making. Her adopted son Canarn and a task force of a dozen Shiz destroyers was all the Ascendancy had left to aid Davek's war effort. Despite his limited military capability, Canarn was still good at relaying information from Chiss intelligence. More than once he pointed Davek to signs of covert restorationist activity. In this case, however, he just shook his head. I'm sorry, I don't have anything specific. It's not unfeasible that Veers might bribe an Alliance member world near the border to give him shelter. If that were the case, I'd trust Alliance intelligence to inform me, Davik said honestly. The democratic government on Coruscant had been, unsurprisingly, slow to accept Davik as rightful monarch of a remade empire, but eventually they'd come around. Once their economy started taking a hit from interruption of trade, they started quietly backing Davik with supplies and intelligence. Besides, he waved at the map. We've been aggressively going after Veer's cash flow. He doesn't have Kuwaiti Sith Lords building superstar destroyers for him anymore. He's a pariah running out of money and equipment. That's why he has to scrounge for allies on worlds like these. I do hope you're right, Canarn said. Still, he and Grave are both. Canny opponents. Trust me, I'm aware. The comlink in Davek's pocket buzzed. He retrieved it and switched it on. This is the Emperor. The familiar voice of his Keldor aide said, My lord, the listening station outside Anshin has just been alerted. Davik tensed. The scouting team. They're calling in full backup. Is the team still planet bound? Yes, my lord. Thank you. Please keep me informed of any developments. Stiffly, Davek turned off the comm and pocketed it. The map updated in real time. The light marking Anshin began blinking gold to denote a contested zone. It appears one of your recon missions was successful, observed Canard. Oh, yes. He couldn't make himself sound pleased. 
Was this team a military one or was it your knights? Knights? Four of them. Ah. Uh, Ken Arn didn't have to ask the question. Roan and Vitor both, Davek explained. Ken Arn's red eyes went wide. You let them go together. Vitor and Roan are Imperial Knights. Their duty is to be on the front lines, protecting Imperial citizens. As the Empire's princes, it's especially important that they not be sheltered from their responsibility. He said it firmly, half reminding himself. He never feel comfortable with sending his young sons into potentially dangerous situations, but it had to be done. He expected Canar to point out that even Rome, at 17, would be considered an adult in Chiss society, but he refrained. Instead, he asked, What sort of backup have you prepared? One Star Destroyer and a retrieval team led by the First Knight. Canarn's eyes widened even more, but all he said was, Ah. Sending his sons to Anshin was a necessary risk, but Davek had never intended to put his sons in more danger than he had to. It would be infuriating to stew on Bastion and wait for battle updates, but that was part of his own duty as Emperor. He could at least console himself with the knowledge that the most capable help his sons could want was on the way. Tycoons in the defense industry often justified their work by claiming that nothing produced technological advances like a war. The battle between Davek Fell and Corin Veers for the soul of the Empire had yielded some evidence to prove them right and none had become as quickly iconic as the Nupelian class Star Destroyer. After losing a Sith Lord Chairman, Kuid Drive Yards became more than happy to sell to the Empire's legitimate government. Design innovations from Veer's nemesis had been put to use on a mass-produced scale in the Fell Empire's fleet and were easily visible in the smooth, symmetrical slope of his hull radiating outward from a low-set bridge. While the same 2-kilometer length as the older Predator-class destroyer, it boasted almost 50% more firepower and 30% stronger shields. One brand new Pelion-class destroyer would be more than enough to subdue the entirety of Anshin it would certainly be sufficient to demolish the hidden restorationist base. For First Knight and Empress Maragia Valtafel, none of that mattered more than saving the young men on the surface. Both her sons were down there, as was her nephew Morgan. She hadn't felt any of their deaths in the Force, which was cause for hope, but she knew from Viter's short message they were in trouble. After all these years, she still felt like she belonged in the cockpit of a TIE fighter. In the long grind against Veer's rebels, she'd flown her tie saber into too many firefights to count. Now she plunged unimpeded toward Anshin, at the point of an attacking wedge consisting of a half dozen knights and starfighters followed by the Star Destroyer's whole ground assault. Compliment. Anshin's night side filled Miracia's viewport with empty black. She checked her scanners. Viter's location beacon was still broadcasting, but there was no indication of activity nearby. The restorationists were well hidden and didn't seem to have noticed their approach. When that changed, when they realized they were doomed, Rome's life was very possibly forfeit. Her duty to the Empire was to eliminate this rat's nest. Her duty to her son was to save him. She still hoped she could accomplish both at once. As her cockpit rattled with the friction of atmospheric entry, Miragia tapped her comm console and hailed Vitor. At this relatively close range, his portable audio transmitter should have worked. She waited for a few ten seconds before her son's voice, scratchy but so good to hear, said, This is ground team responding. Ground team, this is night one. We're tracking your beacon and inbound, about 200 seconds away. Can you give us direction to the prime target? His mother's voice seemed to take him aback, but after a moment Vitor said, Prime target is 2.3 kilometers north northwest in a ridge valley with the camo net thrown over. Night one, we still have a team member inside the facility. Understood, ground team. Take your people and meet us at the target. May the force be with you. You too, mom, Vitor said, and killed the switch. Maragia adjusted her homing sensors to the new location and patched an update to the nav computer for the other ships in the attack group. Then she switched her helmet kamink to a team-wide broadcast and said, All units, target is marked and two minutes away. All troops prepare for deployment. Fighters, maintain air superiority. Primary aim is interdiction. Capture when possible but don't be afraid to defend yourselves. 
She took a breath and added, Be advised, hostiles have Prince Roan in custody. Safe retrieval is a top priority. Over. She killed the switch and felt the shock ripple through everyone in the attack group, from the other knights all the way down to the troopers and pilots. After shock came determination. Just as Davik had been on the front lines in the war against the Restorationists, so were his sons. In leading by example and taking such risks their family had won over many imperial citizens skeptical of a self-proclaimed emperor. Marasia began decelerating as the night dark surface grew close. It was almost impossible to make out anything clearly, and if hadn't been for Roan they'd have saved this attack for daytime hours when they could actually see what they were doing. Whatever sensor jamming field the Restorationists had put up it was effective, even at close range Marasia still couldn't pick up any heat or metal readings. Her only option was to follow Vider's directions. Once they identified the valley, the ties began flying tight circles, and the troop transports dropped into low hovers over the surrounding terrain. Pools of light spread beneath the drop ships, illuminating forested slopes and white armored stormtroopers riding lowered cable to the surface, dozens at a time. As soon as the stormies started deploying, the forest lit up with laser fire. Red rifle blasts flashed in the night and a few explosions, grenades, or landmines, she couldn't tell, burst around the edges of the valley. Marasia reached out to her sons, Vitor first. She felt him approaching and told him to hurry. Then she reached out to Rome. He was conscious, she could feel his panic and fear and recrimination and tried to soothe them, knowing full well that the Restorationists might try and kill him any minute. They might also use him to barter. There was simply no predicting. All she knew was that she couldn't fly circles overhead while her son's life was at stake. Marasia dropped her tie lower over the center of the valley and turned on her forward headlights. It was immediately clear she was hovering above a stretched out tarpaulin, colored with camouflage, tones but flat in texture. To cover such a wide area, the camo net must have been held up by a metal frame, but that frame would never be strong enough to support a tie saber. She decided it didn't have to. She cut her repulsors to minimum power, extended the TIE Saber's landing struts, and let her fighter drop onto the camel net. Her ship rocked as it pressed down on the metal girders and snapped them. The net, thick and woven with sensor jamming metals, collapsed beneath her without tearing. When her fighter sat down with a final shudder, she immediately popped open the dorsal hatch, pulled off helmet, and undid her crash webbing. She pulled herself out of the fighter, jumped from the open hatch, and landed both boots on the crumpled net beneath. She pulled out her weapon and thumbed it to life. She constructed it with crystals from a moon of Sardinanian's largest gas giant to create a pure white blade and other imperial knights had taken to crafting their own lightsabers in imitation. The blade cut easily through the camel net and she slipped through the tear. The uncollapsed sections of the roof still held and Mirasia found herself in the dead center of the enemy base. The stormtrooper units were still advancing from the valley slopes and restorationist troops had mostly moved to the edges to defend. Her less than subtle entrance had still drawn attention. Men and women in brown civvy clothes and red armbands were rushing toward her, but when they spotted her white blade and red armor the trademarks of the Imperial Knights they skidded to a halt. Fear was good. But it wouldn't last long enough for the friendly Stormies to reach her. At least, Mirasia thought, there weren't any Cordosis armored troopers around. Mirasia summoned a wave of force energy that pushed the people around her back a few steps, when charged for the nearest cluster of stunned men. A few began firing, but their shots were easily telegraphed, and she could bat them back with her saber. Two swift strikes cut the barrels off three rifles, two snap elbows, and a kick dropped the fighters. Marasia was a small woman but she drew on the force to add extra strength to her blows. She spun on one hill to make a full circle survey of the area. The other restorationists had been frightened by her shell and hesitated to move on her or even shoot. She caught one man's eyes widening and immediately spun around. Three troopers with bronze-tinted armor were running toward her and firing away. She snarled back a swear and deflected their shots then jumped back toward the collapsed section of the ceiling to use it as cover. She kept her back to her landed starfighter, 
and kept on deflecting shots, but she knew that when the Cortosis armored troopers got close enough they'd break out bladed weapons and lunge for her. Her own red plasteel armor was as strong as standard storm affair, good enough to stop a viper blade or long-range laser shot but nowhere near as good as Cortosis. It was all she could do to throw up a hand and push them away with the force. The Cortosis trooper staggered but immediately charged ahead again, still shooting. Then she heard a voice shout, loud and clear, fire in the hole, and saw a small black sphere arc out of nowhere toward her, toward the approaching troopers. She crossed her arms over her face and raised a force wall just before the flechette grenade exploded. The trooper's cortosis was enough to deflect all the grenade's tiny metal shard but some still slipped between the armor plates, shredding fabric and skin, tendons and muscle. The attack in Stormies collapsed like dolls with strings cut, if not for the warning Mirajia would have been shredded even worse. Sounds of battle rose from all corners of the base but a trooper in friendly white armor rushed to her side and said, Your Majesty, are you all right? Mirajia had grown up on one of the Empire's neglected backwaters, and it had taken her a long time to get used to being treated as royalty. Right now she was glad for the honest devotion in the trooper's voice. Thank you for the help, soldier, she said. Now gather your men. We need to find my son. Ronfell had never been captured by the enemy until now. He had, however, thought about what he'd do if this situation arose. His father had insisted on it. As the emperor's younger son he was as tempting a target as could be, and for the restorationists he'd be a prize alive or dead. He'd run through different scenarios in his head, and some of them had involved waking up from a stun blast, gagged, and bound to a chair in an empty room, but none had involved sitting alone and ignored while some battle was clearly raging above him. He could feel his mother and brother up there, and he could feel Trees and Morgan too, and beyond those familiar presences he knew many more people were fighting and dying. They'd probably taken him down into the subterranean portion of the base which was why the only physical hint he got of the battle was the occasional muffled rumble from the ceiling. Just the knowledge that the people he loved were nearby and coming for him was enough to give him hope. He wasn't just terrified of dying, though that was bad enough. The thought of dying pathetically here and now was infuriating. He might not have been like Vitor, preternaturally talented, and heir to an empire, but he knew he stood at the front of a long line of illustrious men and women fells, solos, and skywalkers who shaped the galaxy again and again for the past hundred years. He craved to make some contribution to that legacy, somehow, and to die here would leave him pathetic and unaccomplished, a disgrace to the ones who'd gone before. When the door to his cell opened he knew his loved ones were still too far away, and his heart fell. A single human male, middle-aged and thick-set, walked into the room, he was breathing fast and sweat gleamed on his face. The door closed right behind him and he stood there, a good two meters away from Rome, with a hand on the butt of his holstered pistol. He stared at the young prince hard and Rome could feel his indecision. You don't want to kill me, Rome said. For suggestion had never been his strong suit, but he tried it now. You want to untie me? Take me alive. Use me as a hostage. The man took two steps closer but didn't draw his gun. Don't try your mind trick with me, Jedi filth. I'm not a Jedi. I'm an Imperial Knight. He tried to sound brave. The man took out his pistol and held it at his side. You're that damned pretend emperor's son. Exactly. That's why you need to use me to negotiate. There's no hope for you if you kill me. We're dead already, the man snarled and raised the pistol in both hands. The weapon trembled but he tried to keep the barrel aimed straight at Rome's head. This won't get you anything. Rome bleated. He was too terrified to try force influence now. He'd been in combat situations before Anshin, even faced death a few times, but he'd never been this helpless or scared. I'll kill the pretender's son. That's something. He spoke like he was trying to convince himself. No! My family, my parents... They'll do anything you want to get me alive. They'll give you anything. No, no, that won't work. The man shook his head and rasped, too late for you, kid. 
Rome found just enough concentration to grab the gun with his mind and wrench it to the side. It went off in the man's hand and a plasma bolt warmed Rome's cheek as it whipped past and scorched the wall behind him. Relief lasted a second. Then the man lurched forward and whipped the butt of his pistol against Rome's temple. His vision exploded with white right before the man kicked him in the stomach. Pain shot through his body as a rib cracked. One more kick tipped his chair over and sent him tumbling to the floor. He didn't have the presence of mind to lift his head and his cheekbone stung against the rough dirt His whole body shuddered with pain. His vision swam and he could barely focus on the man looming above him. Blaster steadied and aimed. Rome couldn't call on the force again. He was too wounded, too weak, too young to save himself. Indignant rage filled him but all he could do was squeeze his eyes shut and wait for the end. The sound of the laser blast came but death didn't. A moment of confusion stretched out endlessly. Then he felt a heavy body land hard on his. The back of the chair held up some of the weight as he twisted beneath it and opened his eyes. His vision was still blurred but he saw four stormtroopers and white armor filling the room. A smaller figure filled the doorway a figure in red armor and long dark hair falling from a pale face. His mother crouched down beside him and touched his face with a cool hand. Rome, are you all right? She asked. Rome. His eyes fluttered and he tried to nod, even as one broken cheek pressed hard into the floor. He was still too hurt and dazed to speak, but he felt his mother reaching for him in the force, sending assurance and love. He grabbed onto that feeling and tried to send the same back. Her expression relaxed with relief. Another figure appeared over her shoulder, his brother Vitor. Both looked strong and undamaged, even after all the fighting it must have taken to get here. They pulled the body of his attacker off him, cut him free of his bonds, then sat him upright in the chair. By that time he finally gathered the wits and strength to speak. The base, secure. That's right. His mother nodded. Trice. Morgan. They're doing fine, Vitor said, but we need to jetile to a medic. I'm fine, he said on instinct, though they all knew it wasn't true. You probably got a concussion, some cracked bones, maybe broken ribs. Fine doesn't cover it. Miragia looked at the lead stormtrooper. Sergeant, call a medical team down here for an extract. I'm all right, Rome said and tried to rise from his chair. His body ached, the world swam, and he fell immediately back down. His mother ran her hand across his face. Just stay calm, Rome. It's all right. We're here for you. They were, and it was good. The mission had been a success apparently, and that was good too, but he couldn't feel as though he'd been anything but a burden. He survived, though that was something. It kept alive the hope that one day he could be strong enough to protect himself, his family, and his empire. There wasn't anything he wanted more. Our spies in the Pretender's Navy have reported final confirmation. We have lost Anshin. Lionel Grave let the words sink in among the men assembled. Rumors had started a few hours ago that they'd lost contact with the Restoration Front base hidden on the planet's northern continent. When the Supreme Commander summoned all his top officers in the conference room aboard Nemesis, there had been little room for doubt. Now there was none at all. Despite this latest defeat, Grave stood at the head of the table, stiff and proud. He tried to keep up appearances like he kept up the fight, stubbornly, but the war against Davik Fell had aged him. His hair had as much gray as black in it and his tanned face radiated crease lines. He still wore the olive green admiral's uniform he started this war with, plus the red armband that had evolved into a loyalty badge for the remaining restorationists. Grave tried so hard to act the resolute imperial commander that it was somehow painful to see. Korosh Vol covered the scowl with a hand and looked away. Outside the viewport were the drifting asteroids that belted the middle of the Kovix 589 system. The Kovic star cluster was located at the edge of Imperial space and the edge of the galaxy, and of its 700 dot stars not one of them hosted a life-supporting planet. This particular white dwarf at least had a belt of mineral-rich asteroids that also happened to jam most starship sensor scans. It was the perfect place to hide, but they'd been hiding for so long this asteroid belt had come to feel like a graveyard in their great warship.
once the symbol of a strong empire restored, felt like a coffin. It had been almost three years since Nemesis had limped away from his last engagement with Davek Fell's fleets. The Superstar Destroyer hadn't left the Kovic's 589 system since then. Restorationist forces had scattered, seeding themselves on two dozen inhabited worlds through Imperial space, and bit by bit Davik Fell had ferrated the Restorationist bases out and eliminated them. To continue the metaphor, the loss of Anshin was just one more nail in the coffin. When the grim silence in the room became too much, Nemesis Captain, a white-haired but vigorous man named Huffenreck, asked, Is there any chance this will lead them to our other bases? Not even Anshin's commander had access to that information, Vo reminded him. In the years since they'd lost their last stronghold on Entrala, the restoration movement had been forced to adopt tactics like fast hit-and-run attacks, loose supply chains, and a compartmentalized organization that prioritized secrecy and damage control. In other words, those who preserved Palpatine's legacy now fought like rebels. The bitter irony was lost on no one. Anjan was not our largest base, said Grave, but it was our one closest to Bobringi. We won't be able to monitor his activities as easily. Vo found himself almost grateful. Every report on the Bilbringi shipyards hammered home how outnumbered and outgunned the Restoration Front was. The idea of surrendering has crossed his mind more than once. He imagined it had to most of them, though no one ever spoke it aloud unless he wanted summary execution. Punishment was only one reason he'd never attempted to escape this coffin. He joined the Empire Service 30 years ago with the goal of protecting the Empire citizens and guarding its proud history. Davek Fell's shoddy propaganda claimed that Admiral Grave and Corrine Veers had assassinated the Empire's ruling head of state to seize power themselves, but Vol had been there when this really started. He'd been commander of the air group for the ship, then called Invincible, and had seen Fell's fleet fire the first shots in a war that tore the Empire apart. He knew where responsibility for all this lay, and couldn't forgive. It was bitter irony that Korosh Vol had been there for the start of Davik Fell's ascent. Twenty-five years ago, he'd been a bomber pilot aboard a frigate called Shieldbreaker, and when that ship had been destroyed, his pilots had found haven on his partner Voidwalker. Voidwalker's captain had been killed in action, and his tactical lieutenant had taken over. For six arduous weeks, Davek Fell had led the men and women aboard Voidwalker through one near-death situation after another while trapped behind enemy lines. All these years later, Fell was emperor, and Voidwalker's Cag Vol's commander, an eventual friend, was Empress. He should have seen the warning signs. Growing up, Vol's grandfather had told him repeatedly how his own father had been killed in the Jedi coup attempt against then Chancellor Palpatine. He'd been raised to believe that the Jedi Order, by its very nature, was contemptuous of secular laws and bound to overthrow existing governments whenever their cult fell from favor. Eight years ago, right before his eyes, it had happened again and it had shocked him. He should never have forgotten his grandfather's lesson but his friendship with Miraji Avalter had caused him to drop his guard. For all these eight years he'd wondered what would have happened if he hadn't let his guard down, if he hadn't let his affection for one woman blind him to an existential threat. Do we know how they found our ancient base? Asked Fenrek, Jarnval from Grim Memories. Eyes went to Vreen Sajas once chief of Imperial Intelligence on Bastion, and one of the few senior figures who refused to bow to self-styled new emperor. The gaunt man clasped bony fingers on the tabletop and said, We're uncertain at the moment. From what our spies have gathered, the Jedi were at the fore of the attack. Some men sighed. Some shook their heads. Vol snorted and looked back out the window. Fell and Miragia had rebranded the cult as Imperial Knights, but they weren't fooling anyone. The cultists were brave, he'd given them that much. With Maragia as their leader, they'd been at the fore of every battle. Without their tricks, it was doubtful Fell would have seized power so quickly and so thoroughly. The sound of a door opening drew Vol's attention from the rubble. Everybody looked to see one last man step into the chamber. Corrine Veers barely paid them attention. He made long loping strides to the head of the table, where he dropped himself into the open seat beside where Grave was standing. Veers tipped back in his chair and looked up at the Admiral. Well, 
What's the bad news? Anshin has fallen, Graves said simply. Veers made a growling noise at the back of his throat and ran a hand through his hair. Complete losses. None of our ships escaped. Well, another one to cross off the list. Veers scowled down at the table. Vo was too far away to smell his breath, but he better carried the stench of liquor. Since they'd taken refuge in this graveyard, Veers had rarely smelled of anything else. Perhaps, offered Fenrek, it is time to make another broadcast. It may improve morale, offered Sajas, though by now it was common knowledge that whenever Veers made a bold defiant speech it meant the Restorationists had taken another loss. The speeches themselves were good and fiery as seemed to be the only skill Veers had left but it was impossible for them to inspire as they once had. Veers' face darkened a little more. A broadcast is pointless. We need action. We need to make them fear again. Grave asked, do you have something specific in mind? Sir, Veers didn't seem to notice the minute pause before, sir. I've been thinking about this for some time. We strike where they least expect and where it will hurt most. And we'll do it in a way that will cost us next to nothing. Admiral Sajas? Yes, sir. I want you to reach out to your criminal allies and arrange for us to have access for a ship inbound to Bastion, civilian. Can that be done? Of course, sir he said with a succinct nod. It seemed to grade everyone but Veers that they were desperate enough to buy their weapons and supplies from alien gangster trash. The man went on, we'll load it with warheads and make sure it can evade their best security sensors, then turn it into a weapon. Ram it into an orbital docking station. Drop it onto Ravelin, it doesn't matter. You mean like what the Jedi did to Coruscant? Asked Vol. Exactly. And then? Veers smiled grimly, I will make a new broadcast. This will only make them hunt for us harder, Sajas pointed out. Let them. We've hidden here for three years. We've mined this asteroid belt. We've put up defensive stations. We've turned it into a fortress. If he manages to find us, we'll give him a fight to remember. It was a bold move, nothing short of shameless terrorism. Not even the rebels who toppled Palpatine had stooped so low. Veers passed a stern look around the table, daring anyone to defy him. Vol wished he could offer some counterargument, but nothing came. This avenue of attack was the only thing they had left. It was the lashing out of the defeated, but the only alternatives were surrender or death, and no one was ready for that yet. Finally, Veers looked back up at Grave. Any friendship between the Restoration Front's leader and Top Admiral had dissolved years ago. Mutual desperation defined their partnership like it defined everything else. I want to review any plan before it's put into action, Grave said, lightly warning, but I agree this is a path we can look into going forward. Excellent. Veers grinned and looked back at his officers. Cheer up, gentlemen. We may be beaten, but we are not dead yet. Chapter 3 Arquilla was, by all accounts, a pleasant world with an equitable mix of blue seas and forested continents, mild temperatures outside the poles, rich soil for farming, and a wealth of precious metals buried underneath that made it ideal for mining. Combined with its location on the Perlemian trade route between Lantils and Roche, it was generally considered prime real estate. The fact that this world had such promise made its current status all the more tragic. As Starlight Champion dove low over his biggest oceanside port city, Arlen Fell could see the smoke rising from the blocks of fresh rubble that marked sites of the worst local unrest. I didn't think it would be this bad, Arlen muttered as he banked Champion to the right and dove toward the coordinates he'd been sent. I still don't understand what they're fighting about, the young man in the co-pilot seat shook his head. I've got an idea, but it'll probably be better if I let our welcoming committee explain things. As he slowed Champion's approach, Arlen glanced sidelong to see his passenger leaning intently forward, peering through the viewport with evaluating eyes. Nas Skywalker was 15 years old and big for his age. He was fast catching up on Arlen's height and his wide shoulders made him look just as massive, but that didn't hide the youth in his face. He wore his hair long and his sandy blonde color, if not the boy's build, reminded Arlen of Nat's mother. When Jay Skywalker was 15, Arlen had played a role in her Jedi training, 
and having her son as an apprentice made him feel at once very proud and annoyingly old. As Champion came in for a landing they got a good view of the burnt out remains of what had once been a refinery located along the ocean coast less than 10 kilometers north of the city. From the reports on the news Nets Arlen thought the violence on Arquilla had been limited to rioting and looting, but it looked like someone had dropped a few heavy explosives on this place. The tall cylindrical smokestacks were the only thing standing upright. Most of the attenuate buildings and manufacturing structures had been reduced to burnt-out skeletons. The landing pad, at least, was clear. Arlen sat down beside what looked like an income airspeeder modified for firefighting and began putting his ship through cooldown procedures. Nat was eager to get out of seat and waited impatiently at the cockpit door until Arlen lowered the landing ramp and came to join him. They descended the ramp together one big blonde-haired boy in a pale Jedi apprentice's tunic, and Arlen in a brown trouser jacket set that would have fit in anywhere in the galaxy. He no longer minded wearing homespun brown Jedi robes like he had when he'd been Nat's age, but he knew his friend outside would chide him for bad fashion sense. Chan's Calrissian was waiting for them on the landing pad along with the battered silver skin protocol droid. On seeing them, Chan's face lit up with this familiar smile but there was less light in it than usual. Part of it was age. Chance was getting perilously close to 60, and his close cropped hair and beard now had more gray than black in it. He still aged gracefully, and normally that smile could banish the years, but none of the grin reached his eyes. Chance was looking tired. Still, he had a firm handshake. So did Arlen, and so, from the little wince in Chance's smile, did Nat. At 15, the boy felt he had to prove himself to everyone. When Chance put his hands at his hips, he finally let the smile wilt. Thanks for coming on short notice. You can't see why I called. I didn't know things were this bad. Arlen looked at the refinery's blackened mez lumen over the landing pad. Stang, Chance, I don't even know where to start asking about this thing. Who did it? Nat piped in, the Duros or the Titans? Chance said, it's a little more complicated than that. Come with me. I'll show you what's left. As they walked across the pad, three humans and a shuffling protocol droid, Arlen asked, where's your business partner? Volgma's on Coruscant, trying to knock heads together and get the Alliance to dot or something. It'd be nice for everyone if he could, said Arlen. Thirteen years ago, he had been shocked when his friend combined his business interests with Volgma Enterprises and become joint CEO of the corporation alongside a surprisingly ethical, but nonetheless very business canny hut. Chance had inherited the Tendandro conglomerate from his parents and had run it like a family operation for decades, but he'd explained that a series of bad investments had combined with the temporary downturn in the galactic economy to make the merger necessity. When they got a better look at the wreckage of the refinery, it really did look like the place had been hit with missiles. Arlen saw what appeared to be fire scorched impact craters in the refinery wall, and their damage had brought the entire structure close to collapsing. Looks like a precision strike, Arlen said. That's what it was. Chance scowled and crossed his arms over his chest. We've got sensor and security cam records, so there's no doubt. Three shoulder mounted concussion missiles. We think they were fired from that ridge over there. He pointed to a green forested rise about a half kilometer away. Your security people scoped the area, asked Arlen. Didn't find much except some muddy footprints. They would have used either a tripod or shoulder-mounted unit. I don't suppose the local government's much help. They've got so many problems, they don't know what to do with them all. Nat's face scrunched in confusion. I don't understand. I thought the fight in here was between Duros and Tynans. Why would someone want to blow up your refinery? Chan sighed. This planet's problem isn't Duros and Tynans fighting. They've both been living on this planet for 70 years after the U.S. and Vong wrecked their homeworlds. When the refugees settled here, they all prospered, but relations between species has gone downhill in the past decade. Because of the war in the Empire. The boy was smart, Arlen thought. The conflict in his brother's empire has stopped being a real civil war four years ago and since become an asymmetric guerrilla conflict, 
but it had still wrecked the empire's economy which in turn had sown all sorts of havoc with its trade partners in the alliance. That and more, said Chance. Undersea mining was a big thing here, and the Tynans, being aquatic species, got rich off it. The Duro stuck to land-based industry, which was why the two species got along pretty well for a while. They moved in their own separate spheres and had their own separate economies. Then the Tynans started running out of ore deposits, and the Duro's companies have been taking heavy hits because they lost their clients and the empire. One industry stalling is bad, but when the other one is outright collapsing, well... Economic meltdown, summarized Nat. Which leads to Arquilla's nice 70-year social contract melting down to chance side. I still don't get it, said Arlen. Who would want to smash your place? My company's got contracts with Duros corporations on this planet and some other ones on the Duros diaspora. So I'm guessing my place was a casualty of Tynan aggression, but I'm still hoping you can verify that. I know I'm not going to get my investment back in this place, but I'm hoping I can recoup some of my losses somehow. And for peace of mind, I want to know who did it. I understand that. Arlen glanced at the wrecked refinery, then at his friend. So is this a formal request for assistance by the Jedi Order? Chance plucked a slim data card from his vest pocket. I've got it in writing. I knew you would. Arlen took it. Thanks for the vote of confidence. We don't get enough of those nowadays. Chance nodded knowingly. After a series of ups and down, relations between the Jedi Order and the Galactic Alliance had been mostly positive until the disaster on Coruscant eight years ago. Using the face of Nat's father, Jodrum Tainer, the ancient force abomination of Belith had devastated the capital with a captured Alliance warship, killing millions. Despite every explanation the Jedi could give, the incident had painfully blackened the Order's name. Every other day, it seemed, Nat was forced to hear his father refer to in the same black tones usually save for Palpatine and Darth Vader, even though it had been Jodrum who sacrificed himself to destroy Belith once and for all. The young man took it best anyone could, but it was an awful burden for Nat to bear. Arlen tried to brighten the mood and added, Well, you never know, things might change. Elena and Jade are on Coruscant now. Hopefully they'll make some headway. Best of luck. Chance looked at the wreckage and scowled. Maybe Volgma and them can work together to knock in some heads. We've already spent two full hours this afternoon listening to entreaties from one forceful individual with commercial interests on Arquilla Galactic Alliance Triumvir Darius Sebel said tiredly. For all our sakes, Masters Jedi, I hope you will be more succinct. It wasn't the star Jay Skywalker had been hoping for, but as long as they didn't star slurring Jodrum she could take it. She sat beside her cousin Elena at a short desk. The three leaders of the Galactic Alliance were arranged at a curved table in front of them, and the endless Galactic City skyline was lighting up behind them as the last bit of day dwindled to nothing. Elena Solo DJO was a former chief of state, former senator, and lifelong stateswoman who'd been trained by her mother, and grandmother for this sort of thing since childhood. Jade decided to stay silent and let her take the lead. I'm sure you're being pressed from all sides on how to react to this situation, Alana said sympathetically. I don't envy you this mess, which is why we've come here today, as Jedi, not to ask anything from you but to offer our help. Surely you're not suggesting unrest on one world is straining our resources, said the Vert Triumvir Sevlis Moore. I'm well aware of what tools the Alliance can use, Alana smiled patiently. However, I'm sure you want to avoid a military solution at all costs. Master Jedi, we've already sent a negotiating team led by Senator Torina to Arquilla, Sevold said. She'll be sitting down with lead delegates from the Duros and Tynan Sides tomorrow. What do you think your people have to offer that our top diplomats don't? It was one of those questions Alana would have to answer carefully so as not to denigrate the people she was asking favors from. Jade watched as the older woman said, I trust Senator Darina will make excellent use of official channels. However, as you know, the situation on Arquilla is very chaotic. Different Duros and Tynas factions are forming armed militias, and there's little in the way of central authority. This is all true, Triumvir Kerr Ash said with a whistling sigh. 
But what can the Jedi do for us, Alana? As Alana formulated her response, Jade reached out with the Force to get a feeling from all three Alliance leaders. After the disaster on Coruscant eight years ago, Kare Esh's close relationship with Alana and the Jedi had nearly caused him to be ousted from his role as Chief of State. The Mosi had taken the bold step of abolishing his own position and creating a new system where the President of the Senate, the Chief of the Judiciary Committee, and Chairman of the Economic Council combined to make a triumvirate of elected leaders. The move had been highly controversial but won out, Jay supposed, because Davik Fell's rise to absolute power in Imperial space had spurred a movement within the Alliance to prevent any individual from seizing total control on Coruscant. Today Esh emanated the weariness of a being who long ago lost confidence in his ability to handle his job. Several skepticism to the Jedi was blatant, more was cautious and tentative. Exactly as Alana had predicted then. In response to Esh's question Alana said, The Jedi can see and hear things that other beings cannot. That's why we were so instrumental in resolving hostilities in Synex Juvex after his rising. Master Skywalker here spent almost a decade hosting Unity and Justice Trials. She can tell you firsthand how she was able to arbitrate very nasty cases to the satisfaction of both parties. So you intend to supersede our negotiators, or merely work against them? Sniffed Sevold. It took all of Jay's effort not to groan, but Alana, still polite, said, As I'm sure you know, the Jedi Order's operations in Synex Juvex were entirely in agreement with the Lion's Law and under its supervision. We are offered to do the exact same thing here. We will send Jedi where you tell them to go, to mediate individual conflicts where you choose. The Triumvirs shifted awkwardly in their seats. After the disaster on Coruscant, there had been a movement in the Senate to ban the Jedi from operating on any Alliance member world, no exceptions. The extreme motion had lost out but Jade knew that Senator Sevold had voted in favor. Ash and Moore had voted it down. Still, the Alliance government had not formally worked with the Jedi in eight years, leaving collaboration to happen only on request of private citizens like Chance Calrissian. Moore tilted his green crest at Jade. Perhaps Master Skywalker can detail a little more of her actions in the Unity and Justice Trials. It was what Jade had come here to talk about, but she hadn't been looking forward to it. Just thinking of her quiet life on Fingerin brought back memories of Jodrum. Sometimes it seemed like a paradise from which she'd been expelled. But she took a breath and told them everything she could, using real examples wherever possible. She explained how, when questioning plaintiffs and defendants in those cases, she'd used the force not just to sense the emotion they were hiding but to draw out their true motivations. In drawing out those motivations publicly, before an audience she and the other Jedi had spread empathy and understanding and softened the hard divisions between people and groups in war-torn Synex Juvex. The Jedi have always been peacemakers, Jay said, knowing she risked one of them bringing up Chadra. They'd all been told what had actually happened on Coruscant that awful day, but Jade wasn't sure how much any Nanjidi could understand, let alone believe what Abeleth was and how Jodrum had stopped her from doing even worse damage. We only want the opportunity to continue that role on Arquilla. Just as before, we'll work under Alliance law at all times. And if any of your people break Alliance law, will they stand punishment under law? Asked Moore. Of course, said Alana. Nothing we're offering hasn't been done before. We want to complement Alliance efforts to bring peace to Arquilla, not stifle them. If you want to keep the Duros and Tynans from each other's throats, Sevo said, the most surefire way would be to undo what the Vaughn did to their homeworld so they can both go back where they came from. Can your Jedi do that? Not at this time, Alana said politely. Unfortunately, no one else can either, Sevo sighed. Unless the Jedi have anything else to say, I'd like to bring this to a vote. Seconded, said Moore, though he glanced at Alana and Jade as though offering them a last chance. Alana said, The unity and justice trials are proof that the Jedi can serve as mediators for the Alliance. We're willing to commit to this project for years, even decades. That's another advantage the Jedi offer. We make choices not dictated by election cycles. How fortunate you have that in common with Emperor Fell, muttered Sevold.
Jay fought and wins. We'll make the sacrifices we must to keep the peace, Alana looked at more imploringly. As we always have. I believe, said Ash, it is time to vote. It went as Jade had feared and mostly expected. No from Sevold. Yes from Esh. No from more. Perhaps the time will come when we decide we down need the Jedi, the Verk told them after the vote. But for now, this is a local problem. The Alliance needs to be seen as being in control of the situation, and we need to take control. That means that for now we rely on ourselves, not the Jedi. Jade felt crestfallen and tried not to show it. Alana, however, stayed straight upright in her chair and asked the triumphers, may I offer a second proposal? I promise it will be quick. Sevold frowned but more tilted his crest toward them. Be brief. I understand the optics and complications of enlisting Jedi on a large scale. As an alternative, I believe the Alliance could make good use of a single Jedi to help Senator Torina's negotiating team. Are you volunteering for this position yourself, Alana? Chirped Kiresh. I'm willing, though I know my presence would also be a big and complicated statement. She gestured to her cousin. I was going to recommend Master Skywalker. Jade hadn't expected that, while she stifled her surprise and immediately said, I've just described the arbitration process I used on Fangren. I think it can be a great asset anywhere. Sevo made a deep, low growling noise in the back of his throat but more said, we cannot permit the Jedi to pass judgments as they did in Senex Juvex. You would be an appendage to Senator Torina's team, an advisor and nothing else. The Jedi are here to serve, Jay said diplomatically. It was almost too good a line. Sevo's face twisted a little more. Esh asked him, do you have anything to say, Darius? It would embarrass Senator Torina and her team to have to rely on a Jedi negotiator. It may still prove effective, said Moore, and there's no cause to announce that their last-minute addition is a Jedi. One reason why I suggested Master Skywalker, Alana added. It made definite sense, Alana was one of the most recognizable beings in the galaxy, but Jade had never reached the renown of her father or grandfather. She hadn't wanted to either. For so long she'd lived a quiet life on Fingren with Jodrum, and after his death she'd laid low to shield her sons from the undeserved infamy heaped on their father. Sevo glared at Moore. You're too eager to buy what they're selling. And you're too eager to dismiss them, the Verk returned. Alana cleared her throat. May I remind the Triumvirs that we're offering to work for free? Esh hissed, a mossy chuckle. You point is clear. I recommend a second vote. Very well, Sevold sighed. I think we know the outcome. I vote no. I vote in favor, said Esh. I also vote in favor. Moore looked at Jade. We are placing great trust in you, Master Jedi. I won't disappoint, she said. I promise. When Jade and Alana stepped out of the chamber, they left it alone. Senatorial guards trailed far behind as Alana led them down familiar halls out of the building. Not a bad start, she told Jade. Chance Calrissians requested help from Arlen. We'll have an extra presence on Arquilla if we need it. Hopefully we'll be able to work together when I'm not with the negotiating team, said Jade. When Arlen went her son, that did too. And if he was going to get into trouble, she wanted to be at his side. Where will you go? I'm going to swing by New Hapes. There's some things I have to take care of it. Her tone was grim. How are our things there? On New Hapes, fine. The consortium itself. I know. But no news for the Jedi. The Sith had helped expel Alana's mother from the Happen throne almost 40 years ago. Their leader had personally murdered Jay's mother. There had been no definite proof of continued Sith activity in the Hapes cluster since then, but they both believed the Sith were still there, probably helping the consortium's young queen in her reign of terror. Still nothing, Alana sighed. Believe me, if we ever do get proof, you'll be the first to know. Jade nodded but didn't say anything else. A part of her yearned for the Sith to reveal themselves in the Hapes cluster. She'd been just a small child during that long ago revolt, but that tragedy had changed her life, her father's life, and Alana's life. Dark Zorin's death had brought Jade some closure for her mother, but the fact that the Sith were still out there, 
probably sheltered in hapes for almost 40 years, meant those events were still an open wound. For Jade, for Alana, for all the happen people, and for the Jet Order. One day there would be a reckoning. She was just afraid of what it might bring. Word that Jade would be joining the Monarquilla visibly improved Nat's mood and it cheered Arlen too. He certainly needed something to boost his spirits, because his investigation into the attack on the refinery hadn't uncovered anything that the chances people already hadn't. From the debris it looked like three shoulder-mounted Erika concussion missiles had been used, but even with Jedi skills Arlen and Nat had found no trace of whoever had attacked the facility. It had, therefore, been a dispiriting day in need of a pickup. The beings around the galaxy who still had a positive view of the Jedi tended to view them as miracle workers, even Chance, who knew Arlen long enough to be aware of Jedi limitations. Like a good sport, Chance kept his disappointment from his face, though Arlen could still pick it up in the Force. Since Chance's place had been mostly blown to pieces, Arlen offered him a spot in Starlight Champion's spare cabin. A long day of fruitless investigation had tired Nat out and the boy retreated to his bunk earlier than usual, leaving the two grown-ups with champions whole to themselves. Because Chance clearly needed it, and because Arlen wanted it too, the Jedi unlocked a special hatch in Champ's lounge and retrieved a bottle had hadn't opened in a very long time. When he saw the label Chance's face screwed up. Sardinanian brandy. How long have you had that in reserve? A while. Arlen admitted as he placed two small glasses on the table and sat down on the sofa opposite Chance. His friend was right to be shocked. That was the last of three sealed containers of Bastion's finest he'd had aboard when his old life as a Jedi Knight in the Empire had been suddenly severed. That had been eight years ago, and in the intervening time, on very select occasions, he'd worked the other two down to nothing. He couldn't help but feel a twinge of melancholy as he twisted the cap free, poured into the glasses, and slid Chance his helping. There wasn't much to toast to tonight, so they tipped glasses wordlessly and drank. After Chance swallowed, he looked down at his half-empty cup. That stuff ages well. That it does. Arlen settled tiredly in his seat. When's Jay supposed to get here? Two days, they said. Elias' team should be setting down. Any hour now. So she'll have catch-up to do. I appreciate you and Nat coming here. And staying. Sorry we couldn't do more. I'm sure Jade will help. Yeah. Arlen took a smaller sip. I was going to send Marin a message. Ask her if she can turn up anything. Ah. Uh, Chance's gray brows rose just a little. And where is she nowadays? Last I talked to her she was in the outer rim. Arkana Sector, I think. That was about two weeks ago. So she still gets around. Jedi business. She goes where they send her. Did they get her a partner or is she still working alone? Alone. She likes it that way, actually. Chance refrained from comment and took another sip. She'll drop what she's doing and help us on this one, though, Arlen added. He didn't want his friend getting wrong ideas. Just like his father Lando, Chance had groomed his child to succeed him in running the company. Even now she was apparently on Commoner, overseeing their biggest manufacturing operation. With Marin things were more complicated. She spent her first 14 years on Bastion training to be a Jedi along with her cousins Vitor and Rome, but Arlen's expulsion from Imperial space in addition to other experiences had upended Marin's life just when she needed a clear path. The ensuing years had been a struggle and she'd never felt at home on Asus. After becoming a full Jedi Knight two years ago, she volunteered to do long-range missions for the Order, mostly in Outer Rim backwaters most Jedi hadn't even heard of. Arlen had relished that kind of adventure in his younger days, and he didn't hold Marin's choice against her. He still talked with his daughter, not infrequently, but it had been months since they'd met face to face. What do you think Marin can do for us? Asked Chance. Those Arrakid missile launchers must have come from somewhere, and they probably came with some other nasty staff. Marin can poke around and see if there's any buzz about weapon shipments to Arquilla. She's got all sorts of connections. Connections like her mom. Among others. Best Arlen knew, Tamar was still on Mandalore with the rest of the Skorata clan, though it had been over a year since they talked. 
Well, glad to see you still make it a family affair, Chan said, and sipped a little more brandy. Hopefully she'll swing by at some point. Hopefully, Arlen repeated. It'd be good for Nat too. While Nat's and Marin's paths didn't cross that often, it was clear that the apprentice had a special admiration for his cousin. In Marin, Nat saw a Jedi who was brave enough to go off into the galaxy on her own, having the kinds of adventures any apprentice would dream of. They were also relatively close in age seven years apart, so her lessons carried a certain relatability that old man Arlen's didn't. More surprisingly, Marin seemed to enjoy Nat's admiration. She never made close friends with the other Jedi apprentices on Asus, but she'd at least bonded with the Skywalker boy. Nat seems to be holding his own, Chance observed. Where's Cole nowadays? Cole Skywalker was 11 years old and growing fast, but he was still too young to pick up a lightsaber and go adventuring like his big brother. Zan him a second. I hear he likes it more than Asus. Ah, your mom's still there. That's right. How's she holding up? Arlen looked down at the amber tinted bottom of his glass. The loss of his father had been sudden, shocking. The great Jaina Solo Fell was 91 years old now. When her time came, it would be less startling, but still difficult. So much of his family had slipped away already, even one still alive. She's holding out. It's been hard. You know, with everything in the Empire. And one of her best friends passed on a couple years ago. But she's never liked to let it show. How often does she talk with Davik or her grandsons? I don't know. Not often. There was a question waiting to be asked, and to his credit, Chance didn't hesitate. How long since Iowa talked to your brother? He rolled around the taste of Imperial brandy in his mouth. It always made him weak with nostalgia. A couple years. Chance exhaled and finished the last of his glass. Can you spare a little more, or are you saving for special occasions? This is special enough, Arlen said, and meant it. This wasn't a happy occasion, but it was important. He never entirely fit in with the Imperial Knights on Bastion, but being severed from them had hurt more than he'd anticipated. It had hurt his daughter even more. In a life that too often felt separated from itself, it was good to sit down with a friend he'd known for 50 years and who'd be there tomorrow. Arlen hefted the brandy bottle and poured a little more. The galaxy was a huge place with habitable planets too numerous to count. The aftermath of the U.S. and Vong War had sent refugees from ruined worlds like Duro and Tyna to verdant, unsettled ones like Arquilla. Decades later, the exiles from the Hapes cluster who stayed loyal to Queen Mother Tenoka had found their own planet to settle on. With Alana's guidance, the Alliance had provided them with a green world in the inner rim, not far from Burchest. It lacked the rich natural resources of planets like Arquilla, but the approximately one million happened exiles who first settled there were nothing compared to the trillions unsettled by the U.S. and Vong. Alana could never think of the name New Hapes without feeling a twinge of irony. It was in every way different from the Hapes she'd known. The Happen Consortium she'd grown up in has been secluded and ossified for centuries. His natural wealth had provided a cushion for his aristocracy to grow indolent and through indolence become petty, vain, and ruthless. Though she devoted 30 years of her adult life to leading and reforming hapes, Alana's mother had never loved that world or its people. New hapes and its people were neither indolent nor vain. The original refugees, so many of the members of Alana's broad extended family, had settled the world with little more than the clothes on their backs and the equipment in their ships. The Alliance had donated funds and supplies, but in the end, New Hape cities were plain, recalling only echoes of the splendors back home. An entire generation of two million men and women had grown up for whom Hapes was only a childhood echo or something totally unseen, and for the Ossify social structures were only a strange legend. When Alana walked the streets in New Hape's central colony, she saw men and women mixing freely as equals. While centuries of selective breeding still produced a people more attractive than average the precise makeup, proud jewelry, and expensive shimmer silk robes had been replaced by a more functional appearance. As the final proof of how different New Hapes was from the old, when Alana went to speak with his leadership she met not to some scheming set of aristocrats but a collection of a half dozen men 
and women elected by their male and female peers. This council managed life for the citizens of New Hapes in a manner as equitable as anything one could expect from a Galactic Alliance member world, but vestiges of the old remained. They still looked on Elena with veneration, and two years ago, after her mother's passing, she had been crowned rightful queen of Hapes in the most formal and elaborate ceremony ever seen on this colony world. It was not a throne she was wholly comfortable with, any more than Tenoka had been, but like her mother Elena knew she had to sit on it and guide from it the best she could. As a cruel irony, expulsion had allowed this community to rid itself of so much of the historic baggage that had kept the old Hapes trapped in the past. Damage and loss had conferred freedom to the exiles, and with freedom possibility. Now they just had to decide what to do with it. Old ties were still strong. They were new happens but still happen, which meant much of what had occupied them had to do with events in the consortium. When she came to New Hapes after her meeting on Coruscant, Alana sat down at the round table with the elected counselors and listened to the latest briefing from Tanith Zell. Tanith was about the same age as Jade but taller with sharp facial features and red hair that marked her as Alana's relation. Like Jade, she'd been a child during the Usurper's Revolt and lost even more. Her mother Taryn and her father Zek had both been killed in those events, and though the younger woman rarely led a show, Alana knew deep grief still drove her desire to retake Hapes. For that reason, Alana had placed Tinyth in charge of monitoring all events in the consortium, and for over a decade she managed a complex network of spies and informants feeding information to the exile community. It was through her that this council had been told of Princess Sarissa Lore's unexplained death, which had become an even more inexplicable when she'd reappeared. They'd learned of the usurper Queen Demia's real death, supposedly by poison, and the great purge of the aristocracy that had followed. Many in the exile community had watched the early stages of Queen Sarissa's brutal reign, with a kind of sadistic glee. Dutch after Ducha who sided with Demia against Tenoka had been in prison or killed. After a few months it had become clear that Sarissa was going beyond a ruthless house cleaning. Her purges were dismantling the ancient aristocracy itself. Entire worlds had been turned into labor camps for families of deposed aristocrats. The military and security apparatus had been called of anyone not fanatically loyal to Sarissa herself. The new queen had finally found a solution for the scheming petty nobles who dogged Tenoka and other past queens, liquidation. Once the nobles realized the extent of the new queen's ambitions, some had found allies in the military. Some had fought back. Others had tried to make fortresses of their homeworlds. Sarissa had responded with expected brutality. Over the past eight years, the entire galaxy had watched the Empire struggle through a nasty civil war. Far fewer were aware that a similar thing had been happening in the Hapes Cluster. The parallels were in some ways chilling. Two new monarchs worked rapidly to gather central control under themselves. Holdouts who didn't want to lose their old privileges fought back. Outright military conflict ensued, and after years and years the tattered remnants of the Happen aristocracy were much like Moff Veer's people, rebels who lost the hope of victory, fighting only from desperation and revenge. In the beginning, the Happen exiles had adamantly refused to help Queen Sarissa's enemies. These were, after all, the same women who'd expelled them and killed their families. Only when reports revealed the full scale of Sarissa's brutality did they start to consider any aid. By the time Tani started a pipeline of information and supplies with the rebels, they were broken beyond hope. At this point, there are only two worlds left with Happen loyalist presence, Tani explained to the council using the name ironically claimed by the aristocrats holding out against Sarissa. Only one of those has a major base. We don't think Sarissa has found it yet, but it may only be a matter of time. What defenses does the planet have? Asked one of the counselors. What's left of the Loyalist fleet? Which at this point comes down to a handful of support cruisers. There's no way they'd withstand a full siege by Sarissa's fleet, but they'll have no choice but to fight to the death. It was another eerie echo of the situation in Davikvel's empire. Tanith, do we know how many loyalists are on these worlds? Asked Alana. The smaller world has less than a thousand. The larger, I'd say around 100,000. Grim looks past around the conference room. 
Everyone was aware that the loyalists had been ruthlessly culled, but none had realized there were so few left. The exiles on New Hapes outnumbered their old enemies 30 to 1. As Alana felt that sober discomfort pass around the room, she felt a new feeling, sympathy, born from pity for a badly defeated and former enemy. Do you know the location of the last major base? Asked Alana. I do, Tanith said simply. As a matter of policy, Tanith revealed only the most essential details of her operations to the council. She kept the name of the world secret even from Alana. Ms. Zell, said a counselor, please be out with your proposal. I think the time for bitterness is long past, Tanith said gravely. If we ever want to liberate hapes, we should start by liberating the loyalists. We should do everything we can to evacuate them from the consortium and bring them here. They'd all expected that, and after giving it a moment to sink in another counselor raised the first rebuttal. A hundred thousand people is still a staggering number, especially if we have to extract them from inside hostile territory. We simply don't have the resources. We definitely don't have the firepower, added another. I know. Tanith looked to Alana. The only alternative is to ask the Alliance for help. That may be a challenge, Alana said. Her own mixed relationship with the Triumvirate aside, the Alliance would be rightfully wary of something that could start a war with Sarissa. Your Majesty, please. Tani faced Alana squarely, addressing her one-on-one. -on -one. We have to at least try. If we're going to put the happen people together again, we have to start now. Alana looked in her eyes. They were so like her mother Terrence, so like those of the older woman who watched over Alana as a child and ultimately given her life to protect her. She knew Tanith's hatred for those who killed her parents ran deep. Her desire to unify her broken people ran even deeper. Alana knew Tanith had agonized over this decision for days before bringing it before the council and her queen. Alana also knew she'd brought this before the council as a formality. The council governed things on New Hapes, but the real decision in the hands of Alana Solo Dijo, queen of a world she hadn't seen in 40 years. It wasn't the power she savored. Right now she wished she could throw it away. But what she saw in Tanith's eyes and Taryn's gave Alana only one real choice. I will talk to the Triumvirate and our friends in the military, Alana said. And I'll talk to the Jedi as well. You're right. What happened in the past is past. We need to start putting our people together again. Tanith's eyes brightened and she allowed herself a proud smile. And Alana, though she knew all the difficulties that might lay ahead, smiled back. Chapter 4 The planet Rabom had turned as Dale aside to face the approaching ships, and to them it seemed like a bright red jewel dead ahead. Darth Terran knew better. Its surface was a dry wasteland of iron dust with just enough atmosphere to be breathable. It was sparsely settled and located on the outer edges of the Hapes Cluster, so it's unsurprising that one of the last shelters for the so-called Happen Loyalists was here. By Terra's estimate, the souls down below had less than an hour to live. It had taken great effort to find this base, and he could feel the eagerness, the bloodthirst, and the crew of the ships around him. Darth Sadal Queen Sarissa Lore to her billions of followers had used her struggle against Hape's old aristocracy to hone her military into a fanatically loyal fighting force. Sadal Sith power had only been one of her tools, she'd proven herself a master political manipulator, and had roused the lower classes of Hape's ossified society by fashioning herself as their savior. It was therefore with the fervor of the liberated and vengeful that Darth Sadal soldiers gathered around Rabone, and prepared to fall upon it like hungry necks. Darth Zorn, who'd established the Sith presence in Hapes all those years ago, would have been proud. Darth Terror would feel the hunger of the soldiers packed into sleek Nova-class battle cruisers and swift middle fighters gathered around him, but he was not aboard their ships. Darth Seda wisely kept the existence of her Sith allies a well-guarded secret. The commanders of those vessels knew only that the three Fury-class starfighters at the head of the attack force contained their queen's most trusted executioners. The Sith were here to make sure not a single so-called loyalist escaped Rabone. Sitting in the cockpit of his fighter, Terrett patched the coordinates provided by Sadal spies into his computer. His sensors began scanning the appropriate section of the dusty red planet down below, and when they started returning data he turned on his comlink to speak to the other two Sith Lords who'd accompany him. 
I've scanned the location provided, but my sensors report nothing, he told them. Nor mine, said Darth Nexer from Terra's right flank. We should get closer to the surface, suggested Darth Tigran. They're sure to have jammers and camouflage erected around their base. Agreed. Stand by to approach. Terrett switched his comp channel and hailed the lead Happen warship. Black Majesty, this is Fury One. I need to speak to the Admiral. At once, Fury One, the voice on the other side young, Mel replied. These vermin knew nothing of what their queen's elite fighters really were, but they obeyed without question. A new voice came on, older and female. This is Admiral Vall. Report, Fury One. Our sensors show no signs of life at the location specified. Neither do ours. We will take our fighters down and scout the area. Hold in orbit and wait for our signal. If any ships try to leave the planet, destroy them? Yes. Fury One. As Terrett clicked off the comlink, he felt a surge of power. Loretta Vall had served Darth Sadel's grandmother, as well, and the woman had taken to the new queen's brutal reforms with surprising eagerness. It was a thrill that the old admiral, who'd been commanding ships since before Terrett was born, accepted his order so readily and passed them on to her thousands of soldiers. For so long he'd served Darth Crates one Sith on the promise that the dark side was a pathway to true supremacy. It was only when making his pact with then Princess Sarissa, training her to become Darth Sadal and helping her rule hapes with the bloody iron first, that he'd started feeling the thrill of true power that he'd been promised long ago. He looked forward to more of that power soon, but first, Rabon needed taken care of. He signaled the other two Sith Lords and together their fighters fell toward the planet. The rest of the Happen fleet remained stationary behind them, patiently waiting to kill and die as their Sith Masters commanded. Rabon was a miserable place. Storms of red dust whipped through the thin air and got so dense they blocked out the sun at midday. When the storms died down the sun returned, baking the surface dry. At night, the temperature dropped past freezing in a matter of minutes. The only water existed deep below the surface. Since coming to this world almost a year ago, Elia Chalk had spent every day peeking through the small slit windows of the Loyalist base, a mostly underground facility shielded from outside eyes by elaborate sensor jamming fields. The surface of her bone was a barren thing, but the sky, when clear of dust storms, was a perfect crystal blue, just like the sky of Hapes. When Elia looked out those windows, she could at least remember. She'd been eight years old when Sarissa Lord became queen of the Hapes Consortium. She'd been nine when she'd fled the world forever. The year in between remained the most vivid and horrific of her life. Her mother Lenore was a distant cousin of the queen's, and at the very start, that had protected their family, but the purges had grown wider and deeper. Elia could remember the growing dread in her mother right until the day when Lenore, too, had been arrested in the palace and publicly executed. The same fate would have fallen on Elia, even though she was just a child, but distant relatives she barely knew had spirited her off-world. They'd also taken her younger brother Hagram, her last link to her family and her old life. The sky was mercifully clear that day, and Elia was sitting by the window beneath the base's sole external observation tower when she felt Hagram coming. Hogram was three years younger than her, just fourteen, but big for his age and a half head taller. Like Elia, like their relative the murderous queen, he had pale skin and black hair. He came up to the horizontal window strip and looked out at the sky but said nothing, though she could tell something was getting to him. She could always tell what Hogram was feeling, even when they were apart. It had been that way since as long as either of them could remember, and it had taken Elia by surprise when she'd realized it wasn't like that for anyone else. When her mother had learned this, Lenore had furiously told both children never to speak of it to anyone. That was one of Elia's last memories of her mother, and it hadn't been until years later, when she and Hagram were with the other loyalist families constantly fleeing Sarissa's fleets that she started to wonder whether she and her brother might be bound by the so-called Force. The Happens had purged themselves of Force users before she was born, and the word Jedi was the worst kind of curse. As a child, she hadn't been sure they were even real. 
The realization that she might not have been so different from the hated Jedi had been the first moment of alienation with the other loyalists, but not the last. The old families with whom she sheltered stubbornly tried to pretend they were still aristocrats. They forced most males to act as menial laborers, save the prettiest whom they made into baubles, even though Elia knew her little brother was smarter and more capable than most of the grown of women he served. Even hiding on this barren backwater, they tried to live like royals in the Fountain Palace. Elia couldn't decide whether to hate or pity them. She hated Rabome, hated her fugitive life, hated the people she lived it with, except for Hagra. Her only escape was watching the blue sky, but she couldn't feel at peace doing that. Not when her brother was sitting sullen next to her and refusing to clarify the discomfort she clearly felt. It looked like she needed to take the lead. So she asked, what's wrong, Hagra? I don't know, her brother mumbled. I just know something's off. Elia wondered how he could pick just one wrong thing, but asked, when did that feeling start? Just today. I don't know why. Maybe you ate something bad last night. Maybe, he snorted. They'd eaten the same thing day after day for months, just like everyone else on Rabone. They could only grow so much in the base's underground hydroponic center. They heard the sound of pounding feet above, coming down the stairs of the observation tower. They both turned to the stairwell door to see open. The woman who came through made it almost to the second stairs leading down into the base when she finally noticed the teenagers. Master's Chalk, please come with me. The woman sounded breathless and not from the stairs. What's wrong? Asked Hagram. Please, Masters, come with me, she waved. Elia tugged Hagram by the sleeve, and both of them followed the woman down the stairs. Once she reached the hallway below, she gestured for them to follow, and broke into a run. Elia did the same as Hagram cried out behind her, What's going on? Please tell us. There's a fleet in orbit. The woman panted without looking back. We're under attack. Asked Elia. They haven't launched yet. But even if they can't find our base, they know we're down here. Somewhere. When they reached the entrance to the turbolift that would take them down further still, into the belly of the subterranean base, Elia felt a chill. She might never see blue sky again. This hiding place, encased in metal and buried under layers of rest dust and stone, could well become her grave. What do we do? Elia said weakly as the lift rushed up to meet them. The woman looked back at the teenagers and her face softened in sorrow. Pray, she said. The sensor jamming equipment the loyalists had was sophisticated and effective, but in the end nothing could hide the stubby gray observation tower jutting out from the plane of red dust. The observation post wouldn't be all, there had to be a structure beneath it and, most importantly, the entrance to some hangar, probably masked by camouflage netting, where the loyalists kept their ships. That was the primary target, so as soon as the Sith spotted the watchtower, they broke formation and scattered low over the surface to find the hidden hangar. Terrid reduced speed and reached out with the force for hints his sensors couldn't provide. He felt living beings deep below and a surge of panic from a thousand minds, but nothing to specifically direct him. It was Darth Tigran who called, to me. I found it. Terrid wheeled his fury over to the other Sith's vessel. Tigran was flying tight circles high above a patch in the red plane that looked exactly like the rest to Terrid's eyes. But when his and an extra's fighters joined up, Tigran swooped into a dive and fired a chain of laser blasts. They threw up a burst of red dust and black smoke, and when Tigran pulled around for another pass, Terrace saw black scorch marks scarring a set of heavy blast doors big enough to let a medium heavy transport through. They had come here to bring destruction, and they didn't hesitate before forming up and dropping a full barrage of concussion missiles into the blast doors. The explosions finally ripped through, and the three Sith fighters dove through the blown open portal and into the hangar. It was a wide space with a half dozen big transports parked in a row, plus some twenty battered metal fighters and an assortment of shuttles. There were people on the deck who just started to prepare some ships for takeoff. Some stared in shock at the strange Sith fighters that had just blown into their hangar, some pointed. A handful raised small arms and fired frantic shots that panged helplessly off the Fury's armor. The people they could deal with later. Skimming just beneath the hangar ceiling, 
the three Sith fighters cut a strafing run across the line of parked transports. Laser blasts tore through their unshielded hulls, spilling fire and smoke that quickly filled the confined space. The Sith pivoted a tight turn and delivered a second volley of laser fire that took out the middles. Fighters with warheads loaded burst into fireballs that shook the entire hangar and sent the frantic defenders tumbling off their feet. It was the perfect time to land. Terry sent a wordless signal through the force, and all three Furies sat down at an open space in the hangar deck near the ruined rows of middles. By the time they opened their cockpits and bounded into the smoke air, a few happens had staggered to their feet and started shooting through the haze. Darth Nexer was already moving toward them with a fast and animal grace. The young Kadru G was counted as the one Sith's finest duelist, in no small part because he possessed twice the arms of usual combatants. Terry could feel the happen defenders freeze with dread and disbelief as the alien rose before them and ignited four lightsabers at once. Before they could overcome their shock, an Exer was in motion, a whirlwind of deadly red light. As the Kadru G handled their immediate enemies, Terran and Tigran joined in the force to push the smoke filling the hangar up through the blown open blast doors. More smoke furled out from the burning transports and broken middles, but it bought them a minute of breathable air and sent a black signal out for Admiral Vault to see. As an Exer finished off the happens, Terran brought out his personal comlink and routed a signal via the transmitter on his fighter. Black Majesty, this is Fury One. Entrance is secure. Do you have our position? Yes, Fury One. We've got your smoke signal. Hold off landing. Wait for our next hail. Understood, Fury One. Terran pocketed his comlink and hurried to the hangar exit, where the other two Sith Lords already stood with sabers blazing. Darth Tigran's single red blade looked meager compared to an Exer's four, but Terry knew the Zabrak was as formidable a fighter as they came, and especially skilled with telekinesis. Fearsome black tattoos lined his green face, and marked him as Ray's one Sith from birth, unlike Terry and an Exer. Despite the difference the three of them had worked together for years as Darth Sado's vanguard. If Terry's intelligence was correct, this was the first of two loyalist bases remaining in the entire consortium. All their bloody work was almost over. Until they called for backup, it would be three Sith against a thousand happen loyalists. It would be a challenge, but Terran wanted to hunt down and kill the leaders himself. Once the head was cut off, Admiral Vol's vermin could finish the body. Terran reached out with the force and felt anxious minds moving just beyond the wall. The happens knew the hangar was lost and were setting up some brave defense. Do you think there is a second hangar for the leaders? Asked Tigran. The old duchess would never want to die with the peasants, Terry grinned. There will be a second, private hangar with escape vessels. We find it and we leave none alive. Very good. Shall we begin? Inexor bore sharp fangs, belying his canine ancestry. Terry knew the sight of three aliens for armed Kadru G, horned Zabrik and Red Atchis would strike primal terror in the happens, most of whom had never seen a non-human outside of monsters and holodramas. Please start, Terry said, and drew his weapon at last. After the one Sith had captured him all those years ago, he'd kept using the shell of the lightsaber he'd built as a Jedi apprentice on Bastion. That was another lifetime ago, another self. Even the saber itself had been destroyed. The new one he built for himself had a shell not of metal but obsidian stone sharpened to deadly point on the pommel end. As his red blade hummed to life in his hand, Darth and Exer moved forward and began tearing through the blast doors in a storm of red. Tarrant and Tigran used the force to blow the heavy metal outward, right into defenders waiting outside. A blaze of laser fire exploded at them but the Sith did not hesitate, did not doubt. They charged in with fury and dealt destruction to all who stood in their way. When word came that the enemy had smashed into the main hangar, the reaction was swift. Ducha Alra ordered her loyal defenders to meet the attackers and do everything possible to stop them. Then Alra and the other senior nobles gathered their families and hurried in the opposite direction, toward the hidden, secondary hangar where a handful of fast escape craft were located. Even with the heavy transports, there was no way to evacuate the nearly 1,000 loyalists hiding on Ravon. 
Reports coming from the main hangar were confused and garbled, but it sounded as though all ships had been destroyed. Reports also said the attack fleet hadn't budged from orbit. Nothing made sense. All Elia knew was was she would very likely die here. Death would have been certain if she and Hagram hadn't been born royal. Young though they were, their blood relation to Sarissa meant they were especially valuable to the loyalist leaders. Though Duchess Alra had never outright said it, Elia suspected the white-haired old woman had prepared Elia herself as a plausible replacement after removing the current queen. Deposing Sarissa may have been possible in the beginning, but by now it was a lost dream. The best they could hope for was to survive another day. Elia and Hagram had been brought to the chamber where the other senior nobles gathered. Most of them were older women, still dressed in the embroidered gowns and shimmering robes they salvaged when forced to flee their palaces years ago. All their gaudiness seemed darkly comic as they moved frantically around the room, gathering their belongings, barking out orders to their retainers, or hovering next to the communications console where a frazzled male technician, one of Dutch Alra's younger brothers, Elia, understood was trying to get a grasp of what was happening. The fleet in orbit still hasn't moved. The man shook his grain head. They must have sent a strike force ahead to break through. What are the forward teams saying? Asked Ducha Alra. And why hasn't the damned fleet moved? Hissed another noble. The technician tapped his earpiece as he cycled through different comm channels and tried to make sense of the confusion. They're taking heavy losses. They're falling back. They're talking about monsters. Monsters? Asked Tagram, who nestled close to the console beside his sister. Aliens, the man said darkly. Or, Jedi. Jedi. Elia couldn't believe it. There's some talk about aliens with lightsabers. The man looked up at Alra with rising horror. Madam, they are slaughtering our first lines. Which way are they headed? Asked Alra. He swallowed. They seem to be coming this way, madam. Then we need to muster our ships and run, said the Ducha. What about the fleet in orbit? Asked Hagram. The old woman looked at him disdainfully, like someone so young and so male should have known to hold his tongue. Elia said, we can't run with that fleet out there, can we? If they're coming for us, we have no choice. Alra mustered all her battered aristocratic dignity and raised her voice for all the room to hear. We must fall back to the ships at once. We must hope we can run the blockade and escape. A few other women cried out objections, but Alra said, there's no time to dawdle. Hurry. Elia grabbed her brother's arm and kept him close as the noble started a messy escape from the chamber. Alra was one of the first ones out and she ordered her two male retainers to keep the chalk siblings close. The tall, athletic men each had stunt pikes and sidearms, but as they hurried the siblings down the hall toward the hangar, Elia didn't know what good they could do. The loyalists had long believed that Sarissa used some elite warriors as vanguards when she attacked her enemies, but no one had ever learned anything about them. The reason was simple. No one who ever faced these vanguards survived. Their few spies within Sarissa's forces couldn't find out anything else. They only knew that once these elites attacked, there was no hope of escape. That Sarissa had enlisted Jedi those feared, half-mythic monsters from generations past was at once incredible and horribly believable. Even as they were jostled about by the crowd flowing toward the hangar, Elia reached out with the sense she and her brother shared. She felt his confusion and dread and tried to muster some confidence to share with him. It was hard to find, but they were luckier than the hundreds of lesser blood who had no hope of escaping Rabon at all. The crowd of nobles was almost at the hangar when the slaughter began. The sound of laser fire started far behind Elia and Hagram. Then came screams from the dying. Below that was a chorus of low humming sounds she couldn't place, but it was quickly drowned out by cries of panic from the nobles rushing for the hangar. Hagram and Elia clung to each other as they were swept along, and their two guards kept close and shielded them from behind. When they burst into the hangar old nobles, and their retainers were all scampering as fast as they could for any of the three sleek, emerald hull shuttles, two more sweet wing middles sat in the corner of the hangar to act as escorts, though what two snub fighters could do against an entire fleet Elia didn't know. She spotted Dutch Alra standing on the central shuttle's lowered landing ramp. 
More women were rushing past her into his hold, but she scanned the messy crowd until her eyes met Elia's. Come, she shouted and waved. Elia and Hogram tried to move for her but were mostly pushed by their two retainers through the frenzy, toward the waiting shuttle. That was when the hangar filled with screams. Elia spun around and saw a blaze at entrance. Swords of red light spun and danced, cutting down old women in gowns, young male retainers, guards whose every rifle blast was deflected by the three nimble attackers. As Elia's own guards tried to push her to the shuttle, she was frozen in awe as the bodies fell, and these three merciless, deadly warriors became visible. The first one she spotted was like a human but a crown of horns jutted out from a green-skinned head that was marked by vicious black tattoos like primitive tribal markings. As the watched him, the alien cleaved one old noble apart at the waist, deflected two shots from an armored guard with his blade, then thrust one hand toward her, palm out. She was suddenly lifted off her feet and thrown into another guard so hard both their armor cracked. The second attacker was even more hideous. It had four thin arms and a red sword blazed in each hand. Longer legs propelled it through the crowd and into the air, and to Elias' odd eyes it seemed to throw itself impossibly high and impossibly far, until it came down on the roof of the central shuttle. Its blade swept out, effortlessly ripping through the ship's armored hull and bursting essential equipment. Then the alien bounded down to the cockpit, sliced through its transparent steel with a few fast strokes, and dropped inside where it began slaughtering all the old nobles sheltering inside. The third Jedi, if that was what these were bounded right toward the central shuttle. This one looked almost human if not for the deep blue tone of his skin and the red glow of his eyes. Elia had heard of aliens like that, heard their name, but in her panic she couldn't recall. Her two guards pushed her toward the shuttle and began shooting at the red-eyed alien. The creature raised his free hand, palm out again, and Elia felt a wave of force pull her off her feet and throw her into the air. Her guards went flying too, so did Hagram. She spotted him, hurled toward the opposite wall, right before she hit the ground hard shoulder first and skidded across the deck. She rolled onto her back and pushed herself upright just in time to see the horned alien drop out of nowhere and cut the heads off both her guards. These weren't Jedi, these were monsters. Elia turned away from them and ran. She sprinted toward the shuttle on the far right side of the hangar just as an invisible hand lifted the heavy craft off its landing struts, raised it toward the ceiling, then threw it onto the nearby metal fighter. The concussive shock threw her off her feet, washed scorching heat over her, drowned out her hearing. The world became a soundless spiral of light and smoke and people dying. Elia tried to stand, fell back down then scrambled on all fours across the debris strew floor, desperate to get as far away from the monsters as she could. When she looked over her shoulder she saw, through the fire and smoke, the four-armed alien walked proudly down the ramp of the central shuttle. Saber still blazed in three of his hands. In the fourth it lifted what something round, something white. When Elia looked back a second time she realized it was Dutch Alra's head. She saw a chunk of debris ahead, the torn off wing of the destroyed middle slanted against the far wall and rushed for it. She forced herself not to look back, not to even think of the monsters behind her, the monsters who kill her any second. When she got close to the middle's wing, she let herself fall back and slid the last few meters that took her under the wing's curve. Her feet slammed into the wall hard, but stayed there, curled up and terrified but hidden. Then she felt Hagrid. He was calling to her. She called back to him. She tried to tell him she was safe and hidden, and she realized he was communicating the same thing. She told him to stay where he was, to keep absolutely silent and still because there was no telling if these monsters could find them. She did the same. She stayed pressed between the wall and broken wing, eyes shut, clinging to her brother in her mind and praying the monsters didn't find them. She listened to a few more sparks of laser fire more humming from those horrible red lightsabers and the soft thud of the last few bodies hitting the floor. When things finally went quiet, she stayed as she was, still cowering, still praying, still clinging tight to Hagram, still more terrified than she'd ever been in her life. Though she didn't dare peek her head out to look, she knew the monsters were still in the hangar, 
basking in their bloody victory. Terry couldn't help but feel triumph swell inside as he looked on the carnage around them. Burning wreckage filled half the hangar with smoke. Dozens of bodies lay strewn across the floor, mostly old female nobles who'd run for their ships and left hundreds of retainers and servants to die without a thought. These creatures were vermin among vermin, and Terra took no small pleasure in ridding the universe of their petty filth. He walked around the deck, examining the bodies for possible survivors. He spotted the twitching hand of one guard lying prone on her back, nimbly stepped over, and drove the tip of his blade through her spine, right between the shoulders. She shuddered and died. He withdrew the blade and checked a few more bodies, all clearly dead. The other Sith Lords did the same. Inexor had sheathed three of his lightsabers but used the last to stab a few more dying bodies. With his fourth hand, he still held the Duchess' severed head by the hair. Tigran kicked over the corpse of one old woman and stared contemptuously down at his face. It is good to rid the galaxy of these, the Zabrik said. I was thinking the same, Terra said. He deactivated his lightsaber and bent over the guard he'd just killed. It seems our mission is accomplished. You should call in the fleet then, said an exer. They will handle the rest. Indeed, Terrid hooked his lightsaber to his belt and drew out his comlink. Black Majesty, this is Fury One. We hear you, Fury One, Admiral Vall said. The nobles are all dead. You may begin landing your troops to finish the rest. Very good, Fury One. Your help is appreciated as always. We live to serve, Terry said with faint irony, then turned the come off. Just as the happens served Darth Sadal, all the one Sith served the dreams of Darth Krait. Even now the ancient ex Jedi lay sleeping in his stasis chamber on Shidu Mod, passing commands through the Force to his regent and messenger, Darth Wirelock. To be one Sith was to serve Krait's dream faithfully, trusting their obedience would bring about a galaxy under Sith rule, even if it was generations away. Those like Darth Tigran, raised one Sith from birth, seemed to find it easy to reconcile that selfless faith with the ambition stirred by the dark side of the Force. For Terran it had never been so. Still crouched over the dead guard he looked up at the other Sith. Inexor stood two meters behind Tigran, the dead Duchess' head dangling lazily at his side. We should retreat to our fighters and depart, said Tigran. The vermin will do the rest. I'm ready said an exer. I've already claimed my souvenir. Tigran turned around and looked down at the severed head. You're always one for trophies, aren't you? They're valued by my people, the Kadruji said. Your people are the Sith, Darth Tigran reminded. An exer lifted the head high and examined the old woman's face. Death had frozen it in a look of pathetic shock. You're right. I have enough trophies. This one can be yours. He tossed the severed head. Darth Tigran, on instinct, reached out to catch it against his chest. By the time it left Inexor's hand, Terrid had already scooped up the dead guard's blaster rifle. Just as the Tigran caught the head, three lasers caught him in the back, right between the shoulders. He staggered and dropped the head, but didn't fall. Terrid rose, rifle in both hands, and fired off one more shot that blew out the side of the Zabrik's horned head. Finally, Darth Tigran crumpled dead with all the fallen vermin. Inexor took a deep breath and held Terra's eyes across the body. They discussed this, planned it, prepared for months, but it was still no small thing to murder another Sith. Terra had only done it twice before. The first had been his former teacher Darth Avonk, eight years back. The second time it had been just eight months ago and on a mission just like this. That death, like this one, could be easily attributed to vermin. Just like Tigran, just like Avonk, that second kill had been another born Sith, another loyal servant of Krait, another powerful warrior who was best put down before Darth Terra put his final plans in motion. We should take his body with us, said an exer. Terra reached out with the force to make sure there were no unwanted survivors. Quickly satisfied, he tossed his rifle on top of the dead guard and said, I agree. Now let's get out of here. Inexor bent low and scooped up Tigran's body in his long, strong arms. Terrett led the way as the two Sith marched back toward their ships. From there they take Tigran's body back to Shidu Mod, 
and there'd be solemn grief for a one Sith fallen, and there'd be subtle suspicion against Tarot and the Nexer, because as Sith who'd been indoctrinated as adolescents they'd never fully been trusted by Darth Wirelock. But in the end nothing would be proven, and Wirelock would have one less warrior when her downfall came. Somehow Elia knew when the monsters went away, but she urged Hogram to stay hidden. She waited for them to come back, waited for some interminable and agonized hour, before she finally told her brother it was okay to come out. She crawled out from beneath the broken wing. Just the sight of so many dead bodies made her faint and she braced herself against the twisted metal to keep from blacking out. Then she saw Hogram and pulled herself together. Her younger brother wondered amidst all the corpses, as dazed as her. She hurried over, stepping around the bodies as best she could, until she could grab him by the shoulders. After they steadied each other, he asked, What can do now? Where do we go? They said they'll call down the whole fleet. She looked over his shoulder at the other middle fighter. She thought she'd seen the red-eyed alien dart over to the ship earlier, but as she led Hogram over to it, she found only a few superficial scrapes in his hull. Is this thing flyable? Asked Hogram. Can we get away? Elia had a little bit of training flying ships. She'd never be able to fight her way through that blockade in the little middle, but she knew how to get away from this planet and plot a hyperspace route to the final loyalist base on Orlan. She crouched in front of the fighter's cockpit pod and ran her hands over a smooth, rounded hull. Even if this thing still worked, they'd have to lay low and wait until the attacking fleet left the system or opened a gaping hole in its formation. It was such a little hope, but it was the only one they had. Come on, she told her brother. Let's look this thing over. We need to make sure it will fly. Hyperdrive travel through the Hapes cluster was never easy. Its sprawling nebulae and stellar gases provided a natural barrier between the star cluster and its neighbors, fueling its native xenophobia for centuries and isolated planets like Rabone from more populous systems. Darth Terrett was sure that wherever the last loyalist base was, it was on as good a hiding spot as the Sith's own complex on Shidu Mod. Terrett had the long multi-jump trip back to reflect. For the whole mission he tried to keep the goal of killing Darth Tigran from his mind, both to shield himself from the Zabrak suspicions and to focus on fighting the loyalists. Now it was all done and while he should have felt relieved, he felt tense instead. For years he'd been working quietly toward the goal of claiming the one Sith for a higher purpose than serving Darth Krayt's far-off dreams. In devoting their lives to a design they'd never see complete, the Sith were limiting themselves like Jedi and refusing the full power offered by the Force. He'd subtly sought out other Sith like Anexer who felt as he did and made them allies. Now, finally, things were nearing a climax. Hours after they'd left Rabom, his fighter's console lit up informing him that the last necessary piece was falling into place. During the attack on the noble's hangar, the Sith had destroyed all vessels except one of the middle fighters. Before leaving the chamber, he'd sensed two last vermin, terrified and cowering but still alive. Likely they were the two youths he'd spotted during the attack, whose bodies he didn't recall seeing in the aftermath, but it didn't matter. Whoever they were, they had only one place to flee, the signal Terrid was receiving now confirmed what he'd hoped. The tracking device he'd placed on that middle only became active once the ship left the Rabone system. By now those two survivors were on their way to the last Loyalist base left. When they got to their destination, Terrid would know their exact location. And once that was done, it would be time to end everything. As he stared at the console, Terrid felt the thrill of triumph, but he couldn't stop his hands from shaking. Chapter 5 For over half a century the most iconic starfighter in the galaxy had been the Incom T-65 X-Wing. It was simple in design along nose, quad thrust engines, for collapsing as foils tipped by landslide cannons but it was durable and effective. It had been used by thousands of pilots to battle the Empire, the U.S. and Vong, and other dangerous threats. It had been another half century since those days, and now Alliance pilots flew D-wing bombers and Tri-wing interceptors more often than not, but late model X-wings were still a common enough sight in the militias of backwater planets, or as private ships for mercenary and couriers. Because of their age, almost everyone still flying bore heavy modifications of some kind, 
and it was said that no two identical X-Wings existed in the galaxy. This ubiquity was one of the reasons Marin Fell had been using an X-Wing as her transport for the past two years. The extensive modifications she'd done was another. Aside from having reinforced shields and added fuel capacity, upgraded computer systems had made the slot once used for Astromech droids obsolete, which had allowed her to refit it into a sleeping space where she could lay down for days' long journeys across the star. This X-Wing was where she lived now, and cramped as it was, she'd grown fond of it. When her ship emerged from hyperspace, Marin was wide awake with both hands on her control stick. The planet that lay ahead was colored shades of dusty brown and fertile green, with only a few small blue pools denoting inland seas. It didn't quite feel like home, but Mandalore was still a welcome sight. It was the capital world of a mercenary band feared across the galaxy, but it still felt like an outpost, more sparsely populated and rustic than many of the outer rim worlds Marin frequented nowadays. There was no orbital flight control to ask her where she was going or demand a passcode. She simply set her X-wing on the predetermined course and fell into the planet's atmosphere. Keldave was the largest city on Mandalore, by far. Marin's destination was about 200 kilometers directly west, at the foothills of a forested mountain spine that ran north-south across the continent. The settlement was no city, calling it a town would have been too much. Kiramora was a hamlet of less than 20 buildings, plus an airfield and hangar where several larger vessels were parked beneath sensor-jamming camo nets. When Marin's X-Wing sat down, she threw the ladder down the side of her ship and clambered out. The first thing to greet her was, not unexpectedly, a barking AKK dog that nestled its head and shoulders against her knees. Nice to see you too, Eddie. Marin patted the creature's red scaled back then pulled off her helmet and shook black hair loose. She looked toward the settlement and saw two women walking toward her. One was the about Marin's age and bore a marked family resemblance. The other was older, with streaks of gray in her tied back hair, but had the same tall thin build as the other two. To the latter, Marin said simply, Hi mom. As Tamar Skirata brought her daughter in for a tight hug, her cousin Nene added, Good to see you too, America. What brings you? That's what I wanted to know, said Tamar as she stepped back and looked Marin over. How long was your flight? From my last location. Two and a half days. Nanette crossed her arms over her chest and looked the old X-wing over. Marin kept his parts in working order but tiny dents marked his hull and chipped at the red and black checkerboard pattern painted on the nose. You need to invest in something roomier, Nanette said. Sorry, Jedi are stingy about pay raises, said Marin, which got an amused snort from her cousin. Where's your boor? Off planet, chasing a bounty, Nanette said as they began walking toward the buildings. The ugly red AKK dog Eddie tagged behind them. You're not with him, asked Marin. He's helping Mecca with the job, actually, said Tamar. And Mecker doesn't want to split the bounty three ways, Marin rolled her eyes. Typical. It was late afternoon here, and the slanting gold sunlight brought a chill breeze. The fresh air and fresh light felt wonderful to Marin, so did stretching her legs. And so, too, did being among family. In many ways, she felt more at home here than she did among the Jedi on Asus. It was a situation she couldn't have imagined when she'd first met Nanette and her father eight years ago, but pretty much everything that had happened since then would have been inconceivable to the girl she'd been before. After two days of nothing but reheated food, she was glad to have a fresh meal. She sat down with a dozen other members of the Skirata clan, ranging in age from 70 years old to seven, and enjoyed a healthy mix of meats, herbs, and alcohol. These people would enjoy themselves brazenly like Jedi or Imperials never could, but for the most part Marin sat to the side, ate and drank, and listened to the conversation. It had taken her a long time to learn the exact convoluted ways in which she was related to these people, and in some cases there was no common ancestor at all, but as Mandalorians were wont to say, family was more than blood. This family had been wary of accepting the Jedi among them in the beginning, but after Marin's first fateful mission with her mother, Nanette, and Dorn they trusted her as a blooded member of their clan, and that trust was absolute. 
During the meal, she sat on the opposite end of the circle from her mother more by chance than design. She was by Nanette instead and listened to her cousin recounting the latest mission she'd gone on with her father. It was typical Mando stuff. Their group had been hired by one mildly successful criminal to steal another mildly successful criminal's cargo ship. Only this cargo ship had contained a surprise set of old Tendrando Arms YVH war droids for security. None of it was the kind of mission the Jedi would approve of. These Mandalorians were enthusiastically amoral in many ways. Their motivations never reached the lofty abstractions of light and dark that Jedi concerned themselves with and focused on little else but credits and family ties. Marin's mother had been raised to have those base values. It was one of the reasons she'd never made it as a Jedi Knight. Marin had, but she didn't find these people morally alien like most Jedi did. They'd accepted her too readily for her to reject them. After it was all eaten, Marin went out of the hut to watch the sun die down. This mountainside encampment, he's facing as it was, had a truly excellent view of sunrise but fell into shadow hours before the day's proper end. The cloudless sky was turning from red gold to violet to black, smoothly but quickly, and Marin set herself on a bench that looked down the forested slope and waited for stars to appear. As the first light started to twinkle up above, Tamar sat down on the bench beside her daughter and said, Not that we don't appreciate you coming here, but I know you didn't stop by to say hello. No, Marin admitted. Dad sent me actually. Your father. Tamar sounded incredulous. Well, kind of. He wants me to do some information gathering, and I figured this was one good place to look. Marin could have easily called from her ex-wing from the far corner of the galaxy, but she'd chosen to take the two-day trip here. Tamar knew that, understood that, and let her pleasure register with a tiny ripple in their correspond. Then she said, what kind of information? Dad's on Arquilla now. He's got Nat with him. They're looking into the violence that's been kicking in between the Tynan and Duro's populations. I've heard about that. The Alliance asked him to do it. Chance Calrissian, actually. Those two are still dragging each other into Asik. Then, Tamar shook her head, but she had a wry smile. What what do you expect to get from us? They both understood that as much as Marin liked being here, she wouldn't just use the job as an excuse to come. Dad says Tynan groups have gotten their hands on military-grade weapons. It's gotten that bad. Somebody supplying them and fanning this fire. You may not know yourself, but you've got to know people who know. And sign of Mando involvement? None. Have you heard about any? No. But you're right. People on this planet tend to have friends in the gun-running industry. Since Dorn and Mecker are out, I was thinking Jovar might know. You can't talk to him yourself, right? Or I can introduce you to your Bavado and then you can ask him. Okay. She'd been expecting about that. Tamar sighed in frustration with her daughter's weakness of nerve. She was within her rights. Marin's current hesitation wasn't fitting of a Jedi or a Mando. Tamar pushed herself off the bench and started toward the settlement. Marin followed without a word. Jovar Skorada was technically Tamar's uncle not Marin's. In his 70s, he was the oldest person in the settlement tonight, and though he was still as fit as a man his age could hope for he moved slowly, his hair had gone white, small battle marks dotted his face and his knuckles were encrusted with scars. Jovar was the child of Tamar's grandfather Venku, who himself had been born to an old Republic Jedi and a clone soldier. Those force user genes were hit or miss but Jovar had them. Venku Skarada had purposely repressed his ability to use the Force for most of his life, until a late encounter with Marin's grandmother Jaina had changed his mind and motivated him to impart some wisdom to young Tamar. For Jovar there'd been no conversion. All his life he'd followed Venku's initial path and resisted using the Force. He'd been the one Skarada who never let go of his reluctance to accept a Jedi into the clan. He was also the one with the most friends and connections the one who'd be able to tell her about arms shipments to Arquilla. Tamar and Marin found him in his round, simple hut. He was doing what Marin usually saw him do, caring for his extensive collection of antique bladed weapons from culture she hadn't even heard of. Marin's got a question for you, Bavodu, 
Tamar said as she and her daughter filled the hut's entry portal. Jovar glanced up from his workbench for a second, then put his eyes back on his knives. Ask away. Tamar gave her daughter a nudge in the force, and the younger woman said, I came here to get information on armed shipments going into Arquilla. Do you think you can ask around about that for me? Jovar ran a callous fingertip along the straight edge of a dagger. Do you think Mandas are involved? There's no indication, but someone is giving them arrogant portable missile launchers and more. Hmm. GD business, is it? You know it is, Marin said, then added, I just want to stop the fighting, even though it wasn't much of a Mando sentiment. Jovar held his knife up to admire the sheen of lamplight on smooth metal. What more? Marin blinked. What do you mean? Arrogant missiles launchers, and more. What more? I'm not sure at the moment. Everything's kind of a mess down there. I bet it is. He placed the dagger on the table. Give me some time. I'll make some calls for you. It was the most unenthusiastic offer of help Marin had ever heard, but she wasn't about to turn him down. Thank you so much. Jovar nodded, picked up another knife, and started looking it over. Tamar gave her daughter another wordless nudge in the force. It was their signal to walk away. As they went out into the night, a cool breeze rushed down the mountain, chilling them. Marin hugged herself and said, I shouldn't have expected anything more, should I? Probably not. But he'll do what you asked. Because I'm Maleite, Marin said, naming the Mando a term for inviolable clan. That's right, Tamar said, and after a few seconds of silence added, you should be glad he can go around asking these questions. It wasn't so long ago nobody would answer them. Marin knew what she meant. It started before she was even born. Her mother's actions during the Synex Juvex crisis 25 years ago had made her an enemy of the Mandler, Jevron Alchus. Alchus had avoided an overt fight with the rest of her clan, but the Skaratas had laid low for almost 20 years, still a part of the Mandalorian's League of Mercenaries, but always on the outside circle. Everything had changed eight years ago for Marin, the Skaratis, and it seemed everyone else. Back then, she had been a 14-year-old Jedi apprentice, desperate and terrified, and trying to save her mother who'd finally roused Ox lethal ire. Marin hadn't intended to kill Jevron Archers, but she had, with a clean lightsaber sliced through the neck. To this day, only Tamar, Ninette, and Dorne knew who'd killed the Mandalor, and sparked a messy two-year succession war that had ended with Clan Archers on the outside circle. The Mandalor now was a man named Ekram Shal. By all accounts, he could be a nasty figure to his enemies, but he wasn't taking contracts with the Sith like Archas had, and he wasn't persecuting the Skaratas. When Jovar reached out to his old friends from other clans, he'd find people happy to talk. He had Marin to thank for that, though she had never once been tempted to bring that up. Eight years later, she tried to think about her first kill as little as possible. Mother and daughter walked quietly through the assembled huts until they reached Mars. She asked, how long do you think you'll stay? Not long. It depends what Jovar has, obviously. We're all glad you came. I figured that. Marin looked up at the star-filled sky. Do you still take a lot of jobs nowadays? Tamar tilted her head. Do you mean are you getting so old and broke down you're staying at home all the time? I was just asking. Tamar looked up at the skies too. Your father's as old as me. Is he staying at home? You know he isn't. Well, there you are. Just stay safe, Mom. Tamar looked down at her daughter. Darkness in her eyes, but Marin could feel sentiment through the Force. Marin might have been a full Jedi Knight, but to Tamar, she'd always her child. Rhett, America, Tamar said softly, then slipped inside her hut. Marin watched her draw the door shut tight, then started slowly for the room prepared for her. Nat was looking pensive and Arlen couldn't blame him. His mother had arrived on Arquilla the night before but had passed only a short com message to Arlen and her son before meeting up with the Alliance negotiation team and the local counterparts at a facility on the outskirts of the port city that hadn't been touched by the recent violence. Chance Calrissian was still on planet but locked in furious discussions with his lawyers about how much money they could wrangle from their insurance providers over the destroyed refinery.
which left Arlen and Nat on their own. Though the Alliance was explicit about Jade being the only Jedi allowed on the negotiating team, Master and Apprentice had decided between them that it would do nobody any harm if two additional Jedi stayed in the area and kept on the lookout. Because the facility was located up in the hills, away from the city, and under thorough guard from Galactic Alliance security, trying to get close was pointless. Arlen had instead decided that he and Nash should patrol the town itself and use their heightened force sense to search for anything suspicious. Under normal circumstances, Arquilla's port had a healthy mix of afforder traders to mix in with the lanky gray-skinned Duros and squat furry Tynans. The recent civil unrest had sent most of the afforders packing, which meant two humans drew stares as they walked around the city, even though they both tried to hide their pale faces beneath the hoods of long loose robes. Arquilla cities had been thrown up hastily after the U.S. and Vong War. The layout of this one was a plain grid, and the buildings were mostly angular and utilitarian. As they moved through the streets, Arlen and Nat could see small signs of unrest even on the main thoroughfares. Smashed open windows, torn down banners, even a few buildings with dozens of blaster marks pocking their facades. The people on the street moved quickly, sparing only short, suspicious glances at the rogue humans. Nobody stopped to talk. Everyone wanted to finish business and get inside. As an apprentice, Nat couldn't pick up much in the force from these passing strangers, but to Arlen, all of them, Duros and Tynan alike, emanated an interesting cocktail of paranoid tension, dread, and resignation. All of them expected things to get worse and were mentally bracing themselves for the next spark to start a fire. If any of these beings had heard about the Alliance negotiating team that was meeting just a few kilometers away, none of them seemed encouraged. Arlen could send something else against all the anxieties of the locals. Nat was soaking in everything he could, with the Force and his five senses, and burning them into his brain. Arlen had taken his apprentice to some relatively rough worlds on the Outer Rim but never to a place that had seen fresh, large-scale violence. The boy was far from his usual element and knew it, but instead of shirking from the danger he tried to anticipate and be ready. It was a reaction that made Arlen proud, and he decided that since Nat seemed willing, he'd lead the boy away from the center of the city, which had gotten through the recent violence with relatively superficial damage and take him to some of the worst areas. A ten-minute walk from the main boulevard was enough to show them entire city blocks that had been burned to the ground. Cleanup crews had moved debris off the streets but charred out shells of buildings housed layers of wreckage. Arlen didn't know if the government had sifted through all the ruins for bodies yet. Even if they had, there were probably some still buried deep. They stopped outside the remnants of what had probably been an apartment block. A fire-scarred wall jutted ten stories up but everything around it had collapsed. It felt different than being in front of Chance's refinery. Arlen could feel how it unsettled Nat. Wind carried the taste of day's old ash, and the force brought light echoes of all the being that had called this place home. This isn't right, the boy said, hugging himself in the warm sunlight. Your mother's helping put a stop to this right now, said Arlen. Is she? The Alliance sent a negotiating team, but will that be enough? Arlen had no idea. He frankly doubted it. Panic and desperation fed themselves, and there was already plenty of that on Arquilla. There should be more Jedi here, Nat said. Doing what? Ending this. We need to make these people stop fighting. With the Force. Isn't that what Jedi do? Arlen sighed. Trying to control the desires and actions of millions of people isn't a Jedi thing, Nat. It's a little too close to Sith for my liking. How is wanting to help people with dark side thing? Nat's face screwed up, honestly confused. Arlen knew too well what good intentions could get a Jedi. His mother had told him everything about the uncle he'd never met, the one who'd been so determined to stop a war that he sold his soul to a Sith. Arlen had heard that lesson early and it had always stuck with him. His mother had once bluntly suggested that it had given Arlen an attitude that veered away from both authority and responsibility. Arlen didn't want to explain that to his apprentice now, so he said, you can't trust good intentions alone. Come on, let's get back to the main drag. As they walked away from the shambles, Nab wouldn't let it go. There's nothing wrong with good intentions. 
And you can't say power always corrupts. It didn't corrupt Alana. If you've ever talked to Alana about being chief of state, she'll tell you she less ruled over the alliance and more juggled priorities from a couple thousand senators. Which is fine, because that's how democracy's supposed to work. Nat hesitated for a second before going there. It didn't corrupt your brother either. Davik doesn't have the force at all. No dark side temptation for him. But his wife and all the other Imperial Knights, they haven't been corrupted. Have they? This was really not a conversation Arlen wanted to have right now. For eight years he'd watched from afar as his sister-in-law and nephews had become famous galaxy-wide as faces of the new empire and the new order of Imperial Knights. Maragia had promised him that no matter what she'd keep those knights on the light side of the force, and he knew she'd never willingly let her own sons dabble in the dark, but he also knew how cruel the fight for the Empire soul had been. Whatever kind of knight's responsibility was forging Vitor and Ron into, it was very different from what Nat and Cole would become. They don't have an easy path, he told Nat. Mine isn't either, the boy said defensively. I know. But count yourself lucky you grew up away from all that, in peacetime. Is this peacetime? Nat looked back at the black wall of the apartment building. No, and be thankful this is only happening on one planet instead of the whole damn alliance. Nat let that one sink in. As they neared the main boulevard again, and the crowd started getting dense, he shouldered close to Arlen and asked in a low voice, Do you think the Sith are behind this? It was a question worth asking. Most of the major flashpoints in Arlen's lifetime that happened secession, the Sinex Juvex rising, the Civil War and the Empire had been helped along by hidden Sith machinations. I don't know, Arlen admitted, but just because something goes bad doesn't mean there's Sith behind it. All the things you're feeling in town now, the desperation, paranoia, anger, all of it come naturally to most sentience. That's why the dark side is so seductive in the first place. It wasn't an answer, but Nat nodded anyway. As they walked the center of the town, Arlen moved them toward the transportation center. Things got especially dense here, and it was more difficult to track the thoughts and emotions of all the Duros and Tynans weaving around, but Arlen did his best to concentrate. When he sensed the intent toward violence, he lashed onto it and grabbed Nat by the sleeve. He let his feet draw him closer to the source of that strong, angry emotion, deeper into the crowd and deeper into the complex of hangars and landing pads that stored many of the city's hoverbuses as well as private airspeeders. Arlen, what is it? Nat said. What do you sense? Arlen tugged his apprentice into an unused hallway and bent close to whisper. Do you feel it close by? Feel what? There's too many people around here. It was all too much for the apprentice. Arlen slipped one hand into the folds of his robe to confirm the lightsaber still clipped at his waist. He reached out with the force again and felt it, not far away at all. He hurried deeper down the empty hall, and Nat followed, confused but obedient. When they reached the hallway's end, Arlen glanced back to make sure they were still alone then thumbed his weapon to life. It hummed softly in his hand as he cleaved through the metal wall panel in front of them. He cut carefully so as not to damage any wiring that might be beneath, but when he pulled the cut free panel away with the force he saw only metal framing and the backside of another wall panel. Who is it? Nat asked. Arlen tapped a finger to his lips and cut a small hole into the other section of the wall with the tip of his lightsaber. He used the force to remove that small piece and bent close to look through the hole in the wall. It was a sealed off hangar with some kind of airspeeder inside. He couldn't name the model but it looked new, probably income and decidedly military, with laser cannons attached to the end of each wing and what looked like concussion missiles mounted on external hardpoints hanging beneath. The cockpit looked like it had room for two and, sure enough too short, furry Tina stepped into range. They started speaking to each other in their fast, chirping language. Arlen had no idea what they were saying, but he reached out with the force to feel their intentions more fully than before. They meant violence, all right, and soon. If they were prepping this airspeeder for launch, they meant to do harm somewhere not far away, perhaps in the city, perhaps at a certain meeting place in the hills outside. Arlen couldn't get that much from them in the force, but what he got he didn't like. Someone's up to no good, 
Arlen told his apprentice. And you just found them. What are the odds? One nice thing about being a Jedi is that you can chalk up dumb luck to the will of the Force and sometimes mean it. As he said it, the Titans started scampering into their ship. Arlen bit back a swear and thumbed on his lightsaber again. Nat jumped back in surprise as the blue blade shot out and began burning through the metal wall plate. As Arlen cut a circle big enough to leap through, he heard the airspeeder's repulsors whine to life. They're getting away, shouted Nat. Get back, Arlen told the boy, and when the circle was complete he used the force to push the cut open wall panel into the hangar. He ducked through the hole just in time to see the airspeeder rise up and the broad hangar wall start to groan open. Arlen lifted his lightsaber to hurl it at the target. Then the ship pivoted hard and fast so his winged cannons pointed right at the hole he'd come through. Nat, despite the warning, had crawled halfway through the opening and froze when he saw the barrel mouths ahead. Arlen felt their intention right before they fired. He jumped in front of Nat, dug his heels into the floor, and raised his lightsaber. At this range the impact force of the single laser blast was enough to punch him into the wall, but he caught the plasma bolt on his blade. It bounced away, right into the dirt creek floor, and cut a black smoking scorch line all the way to the opposite wall. As Arlen tried to push back from the wall and ignored the pain, the airspeeder kicked itself forward and soared out through the hangar mouth. Nat was right beside him, squeezing his arm with both hands. Master, are you all right? The boy said, why died and breathless. It was the closest he'd yet come to dying. I'm okay. Arlen lied, odds were good he'd cracked ribs or shoulder blades, and was fortunate not to have damaged his spine. What do we do? What were they? We need to alert local security and warn your mother. How? Another nice thing about being a Jedi is that you can usually find somebody willing to lend you their speeder in an emergency. With or without force suggestion. Only one way to find out. Come on, Nat, no time to waste. The selling point in Jay's participation in these negotiations had been her experience in the Unity and Justice trials on Fingren, and this was bringing back familiar memories. She found herself seated at the same table as Senator Darina and her aides, facing two more groups seated at separate tables representing community leaders among the Duros and Titans. They'd convened in a private complex in the mountains outside the city and were meeting in a room with broad, transparent steel windows overlooking green forests. The Alliance people were trying to arbitrate and force a compromise between the parties, and the moment Jay stepped into the room she could feel tides of recrimination and anger washing back and forth between the Duros and Titan gatherings. That alone had brought back memories from Fingren, where grudges centuries old and fresh, personal wounds had pitted aggrieved parties against each other. The biggest difference between then and now was that Jade was here to observe only, not arbitrate. Senator Torina had made that very clear as soon as she'd arrived. Ithorians had a reputation as a gentle people but the chair of the Senate's Federation Committee had skipped the niceties and told Jade that she disagreed with the triumvirate's decision to send a Jedi arbitrator and expected her to watch the proceedings in silence and only offer advice between sessions. Jade was, therefore, stuck at the end of the table with little to do besides sink into the force and feel the emotions of those around her. The Duros complained that their communities were besieged and blamed the Tynans for the violence. The Tynan representatives quite honestly, Jade felt rejected blame and insisted that if any of their race had been launching military-style attacks it was being done by rogue elements. Both groups appealed to the Alliance team and insisted that their species were not warriors by practice but business beings, which was true as it went. Duros were renowned galaxy-wide spacers, engineers, and manufacturers, Tynas were famously adept at trade and finance. The situation on Arquilla, Jay thought, was proof of where high emotions and extreme situations could drive otherwise rational beings, but per Senator Torina's request she held back from making several statements that, she felt, could have soothed nerves. The Senator, Jade had to admit, was doing a decent job of that herself. The Ithorian's blunt private nature was carefully shielded behind a gentle diplomatic front, and though Jade could feel her frustration in the force as the Duros and Tynans bickered on and on, 
she let none of it leak into her measured stereophonic speech. For 70 years your peoples have made Arquilla your home, she told them during one lull in the argument. Neither of you can claim this place as your own. You settled here together, at the same time, after both your homeworlds were ruined by the U.S. involved. You both worked together because you were united as exiles. Now the toll of that same exile drives you against each other. Gentle beings, I know the pain you feel. The U.S. Hinvong seeded poison into the atmosphere of my world and burned the mother forest. Trillions across the galaxy must live with the pain of an exile that has lasted generations, and trillions more will live with it in generations to come. But, gentle beings, we cannot let that pain blind us to all we have in common. It was, Jade admitted to herself, a pretty good little speech. When a new mind touched hers, it came without warning, but it was instantly familiar and instantly understood. Empathic bonds had never been Nas' strength, but with his mother, he'd usually been able to form a connection if he was close by. Arlen had said they'd be scoping out the town, almost 10 kilometers away, and her link with Nat normally didn't care over such long distances. From the panic she felt, he was a lot closer than that and coming closer still. As the lead Duro's delegate started speaking, Jade closed her eyes and tried to hear what her son was telling her. He was with Arlen, and they were coming fast. But it felt like someone else was coming fast and they'd get there before the Jedi. There was no time to doubt or hesitate. Jade popped to her feet and said, I'm sorry, but we need to get to a secure area right away. The Duro's delegate, stunned by the interruption, was speechless, but the lead Tynan twitched his whiskers and asked, Excuse me, but who are you? Jade ignored him and looked at Torina. Call your security team. They are coming by air. Who is coming by air? The Ithorian asked from both mouths. Clear the room. Jade added for a suggestion to her shout. The other Duros jerked from their seats first and that started a rush. Tarina, however, went straight to Jade and swung her hammerhead so close it almost knocked the Jedi in the face. This is outrageous. You have no authority to break these proceedings. Jade could feel Arlen calling to her in the force as well. She looked away from the senator and out the windows, where a dark shape was swinging in from the right side. It flew low over the treetops and suddenly turned. A small shape grew larger fast as it began its attack run. Get out now! Jade shouted and gave Torina a force push toward the door. She vaulted over the table and rushed toward the window as the last members of the Titan party grabbed their data pads and rushed for the exit. Jade didn't wait for the approaching speeder to blast through the chamber's thin glass windows. She did it herself. One gust of forest energy shattered them and pushed the sharp shards outward so they fell into the forest below. She drew out her lightsaber and extended his violet blade just as the first chain of lasers lanced straight toward the broad window frame. These were no small arm shots, easily batted aside. Jay gathered the force inside her. The armored rush of the lasers, a mere second in real time, seemed to slow and stretch out. She knew where the two shots would come and lifted her saber, high and diagonal, to catch them. She raised an invisible hand behind her that pushed her forward to counter the inertia of the heavy plasma bolts. The lasers were on her, and then they ricocheted back out into the sky. Her heels dug into the room's soft carpet but hadn't budged a millimeter. Two more shots came two seconds later. She kept the invisible strength behind her and knocked those shots away. The speeder was too close for a third shot. It veered her to the right and rushed overhead and out of view, but she was sure it was already beginning a tight circle for another attack run. Then another craft dipped into view. It flew low over the treetops, right toward her. It was smaller than the attacking ship, a mere speeder bike, and as it drew close Jade could see his rider's long cloaks flapping like banners in the wind. Even before she saw that, she felt them in the force, and New Arlen and her son had arrived. That income speeder the attackers were flying looked hefty but it was fast and could turn on a pinhead. Arlen counted himself fortunate, our force blessed, that he'd been able to command her a very nice Mob K swoop bike to give chase. He hadn't actually flown a swoop in many years but it came back to him, mostly, on the straightaway chase here. 
Now that they'd arrived at the complex in the hills, he had to wrestle with the controls and outmaneuver the airspeeder, which was proven tricky. When it had fired off the first round of shots, Arlen's heart had sunk, but he should have had more faith than that. A violet saber came to life and batted all four shots back. The airspeeder broke right, was coming, came around for another attack run. Arlen gunned the swoop forward. By his estimate, they'd be able to take the airspeeder on his left flank just as it got within firing range for a second attack. He had a feeling this time and would use his one mounted missiles, and even Jay couldn't do much against those. Arlen could get there in time. Unfortunately, they hadn't been lucky enough to grab a swoop with working armaments. Arlen had a single blaster pistol on his belt, but small arms wouldn't do any good against that speeder. He'd have to try something else. He shifted against the apprentice clinging to his back and shouted over the wind. Nat, get ready to take the controls. I don't know how to fly a swoop. Learn fast. Get ready to pull it hard right. He elbowed Nat's arms off his side and pushed himself halfway out of the swoop saddle while still gunning forward. The airspeeder was wheeling around fast. When his port wing flashed close, Arlen jerked the bike's control stick up and to the side, then jumped. He didn't spare a look or thought at Nat wrestling with the controls. He couldn't afford to. He was in the air for less than a second before he hit the top of the airspeeder's wing hard enough to knock it off balance and mess up his tight turn. The smooth surface immediately began slipping beneath him, but he used the force to slow his slide and called his lightsaber to right hand. As he turned it on his free hand, grab hold of the wing's forward edge, and he dropped down, stomach against the wing's flat surface. <laughs> then he ran the lightsaber through hard metal, burning through the surface, cutting the lines that fed power and plasma to the wingtip laser cannons. The speeder bucked beneath him like it was trying to throw him off but one glance to his other side revealed black smoke trailing from the flickering engines. Something he'd cut must have triggered a power failure in the propulsion system. The craft veered away from the conference center and dropped, smoking, toward the forest. In seconds and would crash, and in second he'd be dead. He could try jumping right before it hit the tree line, then use the force to cushion his fall and hope he didn't impale himself on a tree branch. It was a long shot. It was his best hope. There had to be a better way to die than this. And then, without warning, the airspeeder stopped falling. The sudden arrest jerked Arlen so hard he nearly lost his grip on the wing's edge. He looked back the engine, still smoking. The ship seemed dead but it was being lowered, with surprising smoothness, toward a small clearing in the forest below. Still clinging hard to the ship's exterior, Arlen allowed himself a sigh of relief. Jay Skywalker didn't make a show of it, but she possessed more raw power than any Jedi in the Order. When she set down the speeder, it didn't have any landing struts extended, which made for a rough impact on uneven terrain. Arlen was prepared for that, just as he was prepared to release his grip and jump upright to land force assisted but stable on the slanting wingtop. The cockpit popped open and, just as he'd expected, the two Titans inside came out blasters blazing. They were shocked and disoriented, not just from the crash but from the surprise failure of their attack. Arlen cleaved the barrels off both their weapons in the first five seconds. From there it was easy to subdue them. After that, once everything was done, Arlen took a deep breath, sat down on the airspeeder's jutting wing, and waited for help to come. Jade arrived with an Alliance security team that was quick to take the Tynan attackers into custody. Senator Torina and the local negotiating teams were still in the conference complex, huddled safe in an armored basement. The Ithorian had offered grudging gratitude to Jade for her help, then said she'd contact the Triumvirate right away and ask what more Jedi were doing on Arquilla when only one had been requested. Jade was pretty sure it would all work out legally, and even if it didn't go totally smooth she found she couldn't care. Throwing yourself from one moving speeder to another moving speeder, then cutting it open and forcing it to crash land was the kind of stunt you'd expect from a brash young Jedi Knight, not a master who'd push past 50. Arlen didn't look seriously injured but he was clearly winded, and even after the Alliance people took the Titans away he stayed where he was, seating on the edge of the crashed speeder's wing with legs dangling beneath. Jay stood on the ground looking up at him and said, that was a big risk. 
It worked, didn't it? Thank you, hey, by the way. Not a problem. Aj stopped and turned around. She felt Nat before she heard him breaking through the undergrowth or saw him press into the clearing. Her son looked winded too, and his unruly shoulder-length blonde hair was stuck with twigs and pine needles. Had a hard time setting the bike down. Arlen asked. I landed eventually, Nat said, and pulled one large twig from his tangles. He stopped a half meter from his mother. Their eyes met and he struggled for something to say. Jade closed the gap and wrapped his broad shoulders in a hug. At 15, he was already taller than her. He'd probably be as high as Jodrum once he stopped growing. The thought tugged her heart. We uh, borrowed a swoop bike, her son said as he started picking needles from his tunic. We should probably give it back. Jade looked at Arlen. What kind of borrow are we talking about? I asked nicely and used a little for a suggestion, which, given the circumstances, was the best I could do. We stumbled on those guys right when they were taking off and had only a split second to make the choice, so we gave chase. Arlen said, I think I did something like that with you way back when. That sounds possible. Jade looked over her son again. Does your uncle always get you into this much trouble? Not always, Nat said, then added with a sly smile, just sometimes. I'm not that bad, Arlen said, and finally dropped off the wing. He used the force to soften his fall as he landed boots to dirt right next to Jade. I hope our hosts are grateful. You mean the Alliance? As grateful as she'll get. I was thinking about the locals. You get any hint the Tynan delegates knew two of their fellows were going to try and blow it up? None. Which means we're looking at multiple factions within the two main ones, and generally a big mess that's probably being fueled by outside help. Do you know that for sure? Not yet. Arlen shook his head. But Marin's on the case. If there's someone shipping weapons to Arquilla, she'll find it. Sunrise from Kiramorit was indeed as gorgeous as Marin remembered. She sat herself down on the same bench as last night and watched golden light crest the distant flat horizon line and spill across the plain. She watched the sky, streaked by thin clouds, turn from black to red to pale pretty blue over the course of an hour. About halfway through the watch, she was joined by her great-uncle Jovar. I got what I could, the old Mando said. Marin was surprised he'd worked so fast. Like what? She asked. Just rumors. A ship full of arrogant weapons got hijacked three weeks ago by unknown pirates. Where was this? Off the Hidian, near Selenon. There's been a few other hits on arms manufacturer shipments too. Nobody knows if it's coordinated, but rumors say the huts are behind it. There are a lot of hut crime families out there. Do you know which one? Sorry, but no. It wasn't much, but it provided just enough clarification that it might be useful. If one of the hut cartels was shipping weapons to Arquilla, then it meant their competitors were not and those competitors might be amenable to helping the Jedi shut down their rival's operation. Marin already had one specific competitor in mind. Well, she said, I think this points me in a direction. Glad to help. Jovar exhaled and pushed himself off the bench. Marin turned on the bench and said to his back, Thank you. I really appreciate this. The old Mandalorian stopped for a moment, and Marin picked up his faint hesitation in the force. Then, instead of turning back, he continued on. There might be a day where he and Marin would talk one-on-one -on -one about the Force and why he so stubbornly turned away from it, but it would not be this day. She looked back to the sunrise. It was still lovely, but a bit of the glamour was gone. She had work to do, and as much as she appreciated her short breaks on Kirimura with her mother, she had her duties. Marin might not have been a typical Jedi, but she was still firmly a Jedi and then meant her job was to keep the peace, even if it meant that for her, this morning's peace was all too short-lived. Chapter 6 Roan Fell Knew He Was Lucky He had access to the best doctors in the Empire, not to mention the few Imperial Knights skilled as healers, and less than a week after receiving a concussion, cracked cheekbone, and two broken ribs on Anshin he was physically as good as new. 
He tried to keep telling himself that as he put himself to the test. Tree Sand was two years older than Rome but had been ordained an imperial knight at the same time. The other young man had never acted superior, nor did he act obsequious and deferential to the emperor's younger son like most people, even other imperial knights, did. He was glad for that, and grateful to have someone he could spar with who he knew wouldn't hold back. He knew Tree's fighting style and Tree's knew his, and in normal fights they were pretty evenly matched. They sparred in a private chamber in the Bastion Academy's lower levels, and this time Tries kept getting the better of him. He moved faster and hit harder, and though Roan was familiar with his attacks and knew how to block them, he found he was always just a little too slow. Once they were both panting and damp with sweat, Trees finally stepped back, shut off his lightsaber, and said, You're trying too hard. Not hard enough, apparently. The doctors and healers say I'm back in perfect condition. I just don't feel it. Try shook his head. Nobody blames you for being rattled by what happened. Rome's first instinct was to deny he was rattled at all, but Trees knew him better than that. He shut his saber down and said, This isn't the first time I've been hurt, or been close to dying. It was the first time you were captured and had to be rescued. The memory of his mother and brother, his saviors, bent over him with love and concern on their faces should have been a warm one, but instead it made him flush with shame. Tri sensed it and said, The important thing is not to drag it all with you the next time we go into battle. Take your time and make sure you've got it out of your system before we face the enemy again. Tree spoke with hard wisdom there. His father had been killed by the Sith at the very start of this war. He'd been just eleven at the time, and the following years had been very difficult for him. His training as an apprentice knight had been fraught with frustration and anger and a simmering desire to avenge his father against the Sith who, surprisingly, had not shown themselves since Veer's first attack on the Jedi Academy all those years ago. Tree's road to full knighthood had been longer and more difficult than for most but he'd seemed to have passed through all the dark side's temptations and reached a place of quiet, sanguine maturity that bellied his years. That was how it seemed, and Roan hoped it was the case, but he still wondered how Trees would react if the Sith ever made themselves known again. They were out there somewhere, and the Imperial Knights' efforts to root them out had revealed only that they didn't seem to be working with Veers anymore. So, Trees said to break the pensive pause, any idea where we'll be going next? Another rat's nest, I'm sure, but I can't say where. Viter's meeting with the intelligence director now. I'm sure there's plenty more nests out there, but we don't have to find each one personally. We won't, but when we find the big nest, you know my father will want every night he can get. Trees nodded. Veers and Grave were still out there, and so was their battered but lethal superstar destroyer nemesis. For years people had talked about finding the Restorationist's last big hiding place, but despite extensive searches it had eluded capture. One day, though, they find the big nest and exterminate the rats inside. Everyone on both sides was just waiting for that day to come. The door to their sparring chamber slid open. Roan hadn't told anyone they'd be here, but he wasn't surprised to see his cousin step into the chamber. At 16, Morgan Valter was a year and a half younger than Roan and treated him with the respect for both his age and title. That sort of behavior would have rankled coming from Trees, but from Morgan, Roan found it rather comforting. I thought I'd find you two here. A knowing smile formed on Morgan's dark face. He wasn't the best fighter among the apprentice knights, but he had great empathic skills, especially where his cousins were concerned. I'm just trying to get back to peak form. Roan tried a confident grin. He's making progress, Tree supported, but I think I'm worn out for today. I'd be willing to give it a try, said Morgan. They all knew he wouldn't have joined them if he wasn't itching to participate. Then by all means, join the fun, Tree said as he stepped off the practice mat. Assuming our prince is ready, of course. Morgan he could beat in a normal sparring match, and he'd definitely make an easier opponent than Trees. The apprentice could be just what he needed for a confidence boost today. Why wouldn't I be? Roan asked. Let's get started. Vitor knew that his sitting down with the Director of Imperial Intelligence and the Supreme Commander of Navy this afternoon 
was not a privilege afforded to other imperial knights, especially ones as young as he. Emperor Fell showed no qualms about delegating authority to his wife and sons, and Vitor had been designated to attend this meeting while Davik was off at Yaga Minor. If that kind of imposition rankled the two older beings, they'd long ago learned to hide it. Supreme Commander Hallis was a white-haired and crease-faced man who handled the administrative aspects of the Empire's military machine and had commanded the Imperial First Fleet for 20 years before that. Intelligence Director Venefra was a different case entirely. After the former Intel Chief Sajas had joined Veer's rebels, Emperor Fell had moved his sole alien deputy into the role as part of his policy of integrating and promoting non-humans. The secretive and analytical element a gaunt pale-skinned humanoid with horns like a crown on his bald head, matched Vider's mental image of a spy master perfectly. It's unfortunate that we were unable to recover anything useful from the computers at the ancient base, Venefra said after summarizing the results of the raid Vitar had led. But as to be expected, the Restorationists have learned how to fight like true underdogs. Each cell is isolated from the ones around it. We've still dealt them a blow, said Hallis. The amount of war material we confiscated or destroyed will set them back severely. None of it brings us any closer to finding the big nest, Vitar said, using the colloquial that had come to signify for everyone the place where Veers and his nemesis were hiding. This is unfortunately true, the old admiral nodded, but if we keep this pattern of action we can consistently chip away at their support base. We've already removed their power to do more than guerrilla raids. And even then, they've not mounted a significant attack on a supply convoy or a military base in the past two months. That in itself is what worries me, said Venefer. It signifies they may be ready to change tactics. Change to what? Asked Vitor. Our civilian populace has gotten comfortable. Walk down the streets of Ravelin and ask yourself if it looks like a city at wartime. It does not. We are still ruthlessly pursing the enemy, but our citizens think the war is already won. And you think Veers will aim for them next? It's very likely. The element looked to Hallis. Right now our fleets are clustered around military targets to protect them. I recommend spreading them out wider to better protect civilian targets. Hallis said, we went through this issue against the raiders eight years ago. We have nearly a thousand inhabited systems in the Empire, and barely enough capital ships to defend them. The raiders were attacking with a huge, savage fleet, Vitor reminded grimly. One such force had killed his grandfather. The Restorationists don't have that kind of power. They still have Nemesis, and by our count a dozen smaller star destroyers, Venefra said. If Veers wants to launch one big assault against a lightly defended civilian world, he can do it. Hallisai, yet you tell me it's wise to spread our fleets thin. We'll have a better chance of a slowing an assault. If Veers does decide to put Nemesis into action, we'll have to scramble a full fleet to stop it. One or two ships will at least sound the alarm and let us know what we're up against. Very well. I'll consider your suggestion and speak about it to the Emperor. I've already told him about it myself. He's quite amenable. Good to know, Hallis said dryly and looked to Vitor. If you have a suggestion as to the role your Imperial Knights can play, please let us know. There's less than a hundred knights in the whole empire. We can't spread ourselves wide. But I do think we can be useful in other ways. Such as, we need to find the big nest somehow. Director, I know your agents have been working for years to track down Veers. The Chiss have their own intel teams but they haven't found him either. I think, as Imperial Knights, we may have skills that your people don't. Lots of non-Force users didn't like being reminded about that sort of thing, Venefra took the comment with an unreadable nod. Do you have a specific plan in mind? We've pretty much verified that Nemesis is hiding in an uninhabited star system. That means Veers needs to bring in supplies. Food, water, fuel for the ship, material for repairs, all that. My people have been very thorough in tracking the movement of those things, the element said. Is how we found several restorationist military clusters in the past. But it didn't lead you to Veers. Have you considered that they might be getting supplies from outside Imperial space? 
We've all considered that Veers may be hiding in an alliance system, said Hallis. We've alerted Karuskin to that possibility. As of yet, we haven't found anything. Well, maybe the Imperial Knights can have a longer reach than any of your people. That gave them pause. It was a well-publicized fact that the Imperial Knights were no longer part of the Jedi Order, that their loyalty was to the Empire and its people above all else. There were plenty in the Imperial hierarchy who harbored doubts over whether the Knights were truly as separate from the Jedi as they claimed. Sometimes Vitor wished those doubts were justified, but his parents had been severe in their break with the Order. Some personal communications were allowed, Vitor spoke with his grandmother Jaina from time to time via the hollow net. More rarely he spoken with his uncle Arlen. He hadn't seen his cousin Marin, who'd once been as close as a sister, in eight years. He knew from his uncle that Marin was working as some kind of Jedi Ranger in the Outer Rim, which seemed the very opposite of the life she'd have had if she'd stayed on Bastion. He wondered if she was happy with it. We won't overstep our bounds, and we won't work with the Jedi, Vitor told them. But we will be able to reach into new areas your people can't. Hallis asked, have you spoken with your mother about this? Just this morning. She endorses the idea. And no, I haven't talked to my father yet. I'm sure he'll make the final decision. Vitor was prince of the empire, but he knew when not to press his vague authority on people three times his age. He hoped they respected him more for it. There's no reason we can't keep serving the empire outside our borders. No, I suppose there is not, Vinefra said. As usual, the element was impossible to read even in the Force. Very well. I'll start to consider how we can. The comm link in his pocket started to buzz. A tiny bit of consternation leaked through in the Force, but, with a stolid face and cool voice, he turned on the comm link and said, this is the director. I hope this interruption is important. As he started speaking, Hallis' comm link went off as well, which was a pretty sure sign this was important and probably not a good sign. Two half-heard voices buzzed at once, and both officials turned them off at the same time. When Vinefra showed a scowl, Vitor knew things truly were bad. What happened? He asked them. Hallis reached over to the control panel for the conference room's table and turned on the hollow projector. What immediately sprung to life was an INN broadcast showing a scene of chaos in Bastion's low orbit. It took Vitor a moment to recognize the remains of Skyhook 1, the low orbital station that handled much of Bastion's incoming civilian ships. It looked as though it had been shattered into a half dozen flaming pieces that were drifting slowly apart. Vitor spotted Frigga swooping low to grab them in a tractor beam before they could fall into the atmosphere and impact on the planet below. Even if they succeeded, the death toll would be in the thousands. Hallis tapped the controls to bring up the audio, and the INN announcer, a female Deveronian in a crisp civvy suit, explained. Our contact with Bastion Orbital Traffic Control had just provided us with the name of the ship that collided with Skyhook 1. VODC names the craft as a heavy DeMorean VB-100X type freighter called the Heavy Hauler, registered as outbound from Corson. As our audience knows, Corson is an Alliance world, and we are not certain if this craft is registered to an Alliance or an Imperial company. If you're joining us, you can see the destruction of Skyhook 1 that took place less than 10 minutes ago over Bastion. We have no judgment was to the cause of the collision, and it will probably take BODC some time to analyze whether the attack was accidental or... Alice turned off the audio. Look at that damage. That's not a collision. The ship must have fully docked inside the Skyhook and then exploded. What could have caused that damage? Asked Vitor some kind of engine core overload. To destroy Skyhook 1 like that, it must have been loaded with explosives. Unlikely, the Nefra said, Skyhook 1 had some of the best security scanners in the galaxy. Any security system can be beaten. Hallis scowled at the holo. I know an intentional detonation when I see one. Viter's jaw dropped. You think this was? So it was as I predicted, the Nefra said without a hint of satisfaction. I just didn't expect Veers to do something so brazen. They've moved beyond guerrilla fighting to outright terrorism, Hal is nodded. Vitor was speechless with shock, not just for the sudden ferocity and naked barbarism of this attack, but because he'd had no anticipation of it at all. 
It was hardly the first time his inexplicable dreams had failed to prophecy, an important event they'd given him no peek at the huge battle at Entrala four years back, but as he stared at the holo he felt, as he never had before, that the force itself had failed him, and in doing do had failed the thousands of innocent lives snuffed out over Bastion. Do you think Veers will claim responsibility? Hallis asked Venefera. It was something else that hadn't even occurred to Vitor. It will be interesting to see how he spends this if he does. He won't win himself allies. The element turned to Vitor. It seems your proposal was as timely as mine. I believe the services of the Knights will become more important than ever. Veers made his broadcast, as he always did. Since the beginning, Davik had tried to stop his public pronouncements using any means necessary, but it had proven surprisingly difficult. There were thousands of communications arrays in the Empire, and all the restorationists had to do was slice into one to start casting their message across the entire system for all the Empire's people to view. On Davik's orders, increasingly sophisticated security software had been installed in the communication system, but again, and again the restoration of slicers found way to access the system and play their messages on all channels. The only way to stop the broadcast was to shut down the entire comm system and plunge the whole empire into blackness. The very fact that these transmissions kept getting out was cause for shame and anger. The circumstances of this speech left Davek feeling positively wrathful. Since in trial of four years ago, he'd been dreading the day when the Restorationists gave up their meager head and runs on military installations and went straight for civilian targets. Veers and Grave had lost the chance to win this war long ago, and their only hope in fighting now was to cause as much damage as possible. Sometimes Davik wondered what he'd done to inspire such rabid ferocity in his opponents. Proclaiming himself emperor had been a bold step, yes not just an affront to Palpatine, but an intentional rebuttal. Those who still glorified the old emperor were bound to hate a new one so different and if any other man were in Davek's position now he might draw the same ire. In fighting Veers and Grave, Davik wasn't just battling particular fanatics, he was fighting to keep Palpatine, Tarkin, Darth Vader and the rest in the graves where they belonged. He's seen plenty of Veers broadcasts before. And as he watched this one in the commander's office at the Agaminer shipyards, he noticed the familiar things and the subtle differences. The ex moff stood in front of his usual podium, with his usual row of white armored stormies behind him and a big image of Palpatine looming above. His voice had the familiar bite in anger and defiance, but Veers was also unusually sober as he said, What happened today should send a message to those who support the self proclaimed emperor. Those who'd align themselves with the puppet for aliens and Jedi in the name of order and security have invited only chaos. Those who've betrayed the core principles our empire was founded on in the name of expediency or compromise have invited death and suffering on the imperial citizens they should protect. This is a sad day for us all. We did not want to attack Bastion, but we who would restore the empire to greatness were foresaid to do so by the pretend emperor, his Jedi, and Chiss puppet masters, and all the good intentioned and weak willed imperials who abide their treason. We've sent a message to the pretender, his puppet masters, and his accomplices. We who protect the true spirit of the empire will not go quietly. We will not stop fighting. We will strike again, and again, until the pretender realizes that his perversion of the true emperor's ideal has only brought suffering and discord. We call on all true Imperials to rise up against the Pretender and those who sold their souls to his cause. It is only by rejecting his corruption that we can finally restore the Empire to greatness. It is only then that we can truly end the fighting and secure peace and prosperity for all the men and women on the Empire. He stopped and tilted his gaze upward just a little, like he was straining his eyes to a bright horizon. Then the holo winked off. What a load of Bantha Pudu, sneered Lucas Briggs as he sat on the edge of his desk. He just murdered 11,000 people. He can't think that's going to win him friends. He sounded like a man gearing up for a last stand, Miracia said thoughtfully as she stood beside Davik. If we can find the bastard I'll be happy to give him one, Davik said, though he knew that wherever Nemesis had been hiding the past few years must be well hidden and fortified. 
When the restorationist fire was finally snuffed out it was going to take a long and grueling siege. Finding him has always been the hard part. Briggs crossed his arms over his chest. Say the word, your majesty, and I'll give you every ship in my yards to hunt him down. They all knew it wouldn't be that easy. Davak said, if anything this attack means we need to spread ourselves out more. I talked with Venefer earlier today about casting the fleets wider to defend our inhabited worlds. That'll also mean spreading ourselves thin, but if they're attacking soft civilian targets that means we have no choice. A destroyer or a frigate over every world will also reassure people, Marasia added. From the start she'd been more in tune with the necessary symbols of leadership that her husband. Give me the specifics and I'll do what I can, Briggs said. Don't worry. You'll get your final orders through Hellas, Davik said. He made himself emperor but he didn't want to become a tyrant. Men like Briggs, Hallis, and Venefra men he could trust he'd let keep a good deal of individual power. Even the Moths retained autonomy over their sectors, though Davek made sure the elections were carefully managed to keep out potential governors with restoration as sympathies. Spreading our ships is necessary, but it's still plain defensive, Marasia added. He'll strike again and again until we find the big rat's nest. Briggs smirked at the phrase. Despite being first knight and empress, Marasia kept up to date on soldier slang and used it appropriately. Part of it was that ever-conscious symbolism, but deep down a part of her remained the type pilot he first met. I'm really interested in finding out how that freighter got filled with explosives, Briggs said. And who owned it in the first place? There might be something we can trace there. I've already talked to Venefera, Davik said. He's looking into it. Did he also mention Viter's idea? Marasia asked. Only briefly, and I haven't talked to Vitor yet. It sounds like you have. You can't guess what it is. He wants to use the Imperial Knights to track restorationist activity outside the Empire. Since this ship came from Alliance territory, that sounds like a place to start. Davek refrained from comment but their eyes held, passing familiar hesitation between them. Neither of them liked sending their sons into potentially dangerous situations. Waiting for results from Anshin, and the subsequent news that Roan had been captured, and nearly killed, had put Davik through a hundred awful emotions in the space of an hour. Vitor was older, more experienced, and exceptionally talented in the force, but odds were that if he took the lead on this next mission Rome would insist on coming with his big brother. Davik and Marasia could refuse him that, but it would crush the young man's confidence just when he needed a strong. Leading an empire and fighting a war were difficult enough tasks, Raising two sons in the middle of it all sometimes felt like the biggest challenge. We should speak with Vitor together, Marasia told him. And Rome. Hear what they have to say. Briggs awkwardly cleared his throat. If I may make a comment, your majesties. An emperor shouldn't drag his personal problems before a third party. He also shouldn't look afraid to discuss them once he already was. All right, general. Go ahead. That we've come this far speaks to the new empire we've made under your leadership. We all serve where we can, and we all do whatever we're willing to do. I believe my daughter is the same age as Prince Rome. She's already signed up for infantry training at the academy on press belt. Wants to be a stormtrooper like her father, apparently. I'm proud of that. Concerned and worried, of course, but proud also. I never thought of standing her way. Davik wanted to tell him that a trainee stormtrooper and Imperial Knight faced drastically different threats, but at the core of it he was right. Thank you, hey General. I understand. Briggs nodded, then quickly found a new subject to discuss. As Mirasia had said, they'd reckon things with their sons later, in private. Yet even now, Davik knew what the end result would be. He might have been ruler of the entire empire but sometimes the battles closest to him were the ones he knew he would lose. Chapter 7 Over the past few years Marin Fell had gained friends in strange places. One of the strangest places, and one of the strangest friends, was found in the Taloman system. Even by the standards of Outer Rim locales Taloman took a while to get to, 
and once there the whole system appeared uninhabited to even the most rigorous of scans unless one was lucky enough to spot a ship slipping in or out of a certain moon swinging around a gas giant. The satellite had been impacted by a stray astral body millennia ago, and despite its cracked open appearance it retained a steady orbit over its planet. Sections of Broken Moon had been hollowed out a generation back, and made into a hidden shadow port popular with thieves, smuggler, and especially drug runners. It had passed through several changes of hands over the years but it retained its status as a rendezvous point for the galaxy's fringers. Its owner nowadays moved more information than hard merchandise but it was enough to keep a rich flow of credits going. It had been here that her parents had first met. Many years later Marin had first come here on a mission that had irrevocably changed her life. It seemed unlikely that it would become one of the few places where she felt somewhere close to home, but she realized her life was a construction of improbabilities. When most vessels arrived at Broken Moon and requested access, they were guided through a series of guarded tunnels that wound inside the rocky guts of the satellite. Because of her special status, Marin's X-Wing was allowed to land in a small private hangar accessible through the moon's surface via a camouflaged portal. Once there, she was escorted to a small but lavishly decorated chamber to meet the master of Broken Moon. Marin didn't remember who said the best revenge was living well, but Sheriff had turned it into a maxim. The former Twilic dancing girl had been able to escape from her master and ultimately kill him and take over this facility thanks to Marin's parents, and she always let Marin sample some of her gratitude on these visits. Even before Sheriff showed up a succession of servants, all humanoid males, very attractive and partially clad, came in and offered Marin a variety of exotic food and drink. The first time Marin had come here and gotten this treatment she'd been suspicious, and while she never let her guard down totally she'd realized that Sheriff's goodwill was mostly genuine both toward Marin's parents and to her personally. When she finally appeared, the Twi'lek stalked into the room trailing loose rainbow-tinted shimmer silk robes that left her blue limbs bare. Sheriff had almost 20 years on Marin but most of them didn't show. She helped herself to some of the Hesterian wine Marin was already sampling, and set herself down on the same plush velvet sofa. This was all I could throw together on short notice, the Twilik said as she crossed one leg over the other. I hope you appreciate it. After spending the past three days on an X-Wing it's good to have fresh food. In truth Marin wanted to stretch her stiff legs, but this moon base didn't have much walking space and their conversation had to stay private. I really don't know why you don't get yourself a better ship, Sheriff shook her head. Something with room to stand and a nice kitchen. Sorry, my budget's limited. I'm sure you could convince the Jedi to give you something else. She tilted her head thoughtfully. Or perhaps you don't want her handouts from the Order. Every time they met the Twi'lek liked to badger her and imply that a Jedi's life was not where she belonged. Sheriff seemed to have taken her ranger status as evidence for the fact. Jedi are taught to do more with less, Marin smiled sourly. Doing more with more is easier. Sheriff reached and ran fingertips down the soft gold and red silk curtains covering the chamber's carved stone walls. All right then, Jedi Knight. You clearly came here on some important business where the fate of the galaxy hangs in balance yet again. How do you think I can help? I'm looking for information. Of course you are. What specifically? My dad's on Arquilla now trying to help settle things down. It's not easy when outside gunrunners are supplying military-grade weapons to radical Titan groups. I bet a lot of credits that you've heard something about that. I thought y'all or Don have a lot of credits. You know what I mean. I do. And you've come all this way just on the hope I might know something and subsequently tell you. She tipped her wine glass toward Marin's. Or perhaps you were really enticed by superior refreshments and the high quality of my servants. I can't say I don't appreciate the hospitality. The servants also. I like them just fine. But you're chasing me off the topic. Am I? I'll be more specific. The Titan partisans have been found using Arakid heavy infantry weapons. I've got a source that tells me a shipment from Arakid matching that description got nabbed by pirates off Selenon three weeks ago. Have you heard anything about that or similar hijackings? Sheriff got that distant look as her mind worked. 
She was hard to read with the force in most circumstances, and it was especially hard to glimpse her thoughts how. Marin threw in the last bit. I've heard it's connected to one of the hut syndicates. That little spark of recognition Sheriff couldn't hide. I don't suppose you know which one. No, I don't. Do you? The Twilik allowed a little sigh. The huts make a point not to keep their business opaque to outsiders. You're not a normal outsider. Very true. Tell me about your other source. Family. Marin had a pretty diverse family, but only one side was likely to know about arms piracy. It came through family, yes. And that's L, 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 they know. I just told you everything. Sheriff went thoughtful again. She pushed out of the sofa and, wine glass still in hand, started pacing the room in long steady strides. I can't tell you anything about which Hut family might be involved. It could easily be more than one. But, there's been three separate pirate raids on Erika's shipments, not one. Whoever's been hitting those cargo vessels clearly has someone inside the company. Blast Tech has also lost two shipments in the past three weeks, near Roche and Geyser. There's no indication there's one person coordinating all these raids, but they are suspicious. It was interesting but not much more helpful than what Jovar had told her. What else? Sheriff finished the last of her wine and set it on the low table between them. I've heard rumors of a hut syndicate with a large storehouse orbiting Lant Hills that's supposed to be very active of late. Marin frowned. Lant Hills is an alliance world. It's law-abiding. What better place to hide a shadow port? I'm sure few well-placed bribes were all it took to get the honorably elected government to look the other way. You'd think this place is big enough for them to move stolen weapon shipments through. So I've heard. Also take note, Geyser, Roche, and Selenon are all less than a day away from Lant Hills with a fast hyperdrive. The lead sounded worth checking out. As much as Sheriff seemed to like Marin personally, she knew that wasn't why the Twilik was giving her this information. The operation she ran on Broken Moon was relatively modest, but sometimes it placed her in competition with bigger, richer hut syndicates. Any damage Marin could do to hut operations would be a win for Sheriff. Do you have anything more specific about where I can find this storehouse? Asked Marin. Lantils has a lot of orbital stations. I know. Sheriff frowned in thought and Marin could sense her indecision. She knew better than to try for suggestion on the Twi'lek, so Marin tried something else. It's all right if you're not sure. I can call a team of other Jedi, and we can start combing the stations for evidence. I have one clue for you, Jedi, the Twi'lek said. I've recently come into possession of several decryption codes for transmissions used by prominent hut syndicates. If you monitor com traffic over land hills, you should find something that leads you to the storehouse. Marin understood why she wouldn't want that one to get out. Which families? Angeliac. Vesadii. Desilegic. Ipid. And more. Marin whistled. I'm not even going to ask how you got those. Good. I would consider lending you those codes. Consider. What do you want in exchange? Instead of answering, she asked. Tell me, what do you plan to do with that storehouse once you find it? You Jedi aren't part of the Alliance. From the rumors I've heard, they're not in the mood to hire your services either. That killed one lie Moran had planned to use. She said, nobody hires Jedi. We work for free? More's the pity. You could be a rich woman if you used your powers a little more selfishly. Moran caught a bit of jealousy in her tone. If you must know... We're helping a private citizen with interests on Arquilla. So once you find the storehouse on Lant Hills, you won't bring the long, strong arm of Karuskin down on it. Marin sighed. Just tell me what you want. Am I supposed to destroy that storehouse for you? I'd rather you liberate it. You mean let Tyal have what's inside? Yes. Oh, I wouldn't fund any upstart rebel movements anywhere. My predecessor tried that and how did that work for him? You emptied a dozen blaster rounds into him. Exactly? Unlike Crux, I know to keep a low profile. Nothing good ever comes from meddling in galactic politics. Something you Jedi should learn. No, I'll sell off the goods to different private buyers. 
I know many local militias that could use those weapons. If I keep them intact for you, you will. Otherwise, this is the last favor you will get from me, Jedi. That last word stung a little. In her work in the Outer Rim, Marin made trades all the time with criminals. Sometimes dirty deals had to be done to secure the greater good. Sheriff was no different, but she knew none of this was ideal Jedi behavior. Normally that didn't bother her. Being an apprentice on Asus had been stifling. The lessons and training had felt dry and too often abstract. Here on the French, she was using the Force power she'd earned to get results. It made her feel more Jedi than ever, even if some of the instructors safe in the temple might have quibbled with her ethics. What do you want me to do? Send you a hail once I infiltrate. Lentils was a week plus trip from Broken Moon. Sheriff smiled. I'll give you a recorded beacon to broadcast. My team will be ready and waiting to help secure the storehouse. Your team? You mean mercenaries? A good investment, considering the profit potential. You hate Mandalorians? She rolled her eyes. There are good mercs in this galaxy besides your tin head relatives. All right, fine. Marin stood up and extended a hand over the table between them. Give me the transmission codes and the beacon. I'll get you whatever's inside that storehouse. Sheriff eyed it but didn't shake. Tell me, you don't plan on taking that storehouse all alone, do you? You just said you'll be sending back up. She rolled her eyes again. I was just wondering whether you call your father's Jedi or your mother's Mandos for help. Marin already knew, so she smiled tightly. Trade secret. Of course. Sheriff looked down at the hand as though judging all it meant. Then she reached out and shook. As Marin had learned a while back, that small blue hand had a strong grip that promised and threatened in equal measure. Besker was a miracle metal. Once properly forged from or buried deep under Mandalore's mountains, it became nigh invincible. Lightsabers left only a scratch. Blaster rifles made only tiny dents, even when fired at close range. Only the most extreme heat caused it to lose its impregnable shape. Mandalorians liked to brag that Besker was the perfect embodiment of the unbreakable Mando spirit. Tamar Skirata had seen enough of the galaxy, as a Mando and as other things, to know that wasn't true, but she still appreciated the sentiment. Even if the ideal could never be lived up to, it was a good thing to strive for, so long as you accepted you could never fully reach it. That was what Tamar had decided after returning to Mandalore after almost 20 years, spent first as a Jedi apprentice, later as an all-purpose mercenary and bounty hunter. She'd been a mother during those years too, though she hadn't felt like one until after coming back and living with her clan here in the mountains of Kiramorit. Marin stopped by to visit every few months, not often enough and never long enough, but whenever she did it left an afterglow that lifted Tamara's spirit for days. Less than a week after Marin's one-night appearance, her cousins Dorn and Mecca reappeared having successful captured their bounty and handed him over for the reward. The job had been a little hairy. Both of them came back with a lot of small but noticeable dents in their armor, not to mention lots of dirt through what Dorn later explained was a very messy chase through some muddy swamps on Mimbin. Besker was nigh unbreakable, but it was still important to keep the stuff clean, so Tamar spent the day after their return helping them wash and polish their gear until it shined. You need to come with us on the next job, Tamika, Mecker said as he dried his chest plate. Like Dorn and Tamar, he had a thin frame and black hair, and a pale, jagged scar across the bridge of his nose. Really? I didn't realize you'd want to split the bounty three ways, she told him. The warrior shrugged. Wouldn't mind if it's a big enough bounty. Having your GD powers could come in handy. I'm not a Jedi. Never was. He always gave her Asik about her inherited force powers, never seriously, but enough to get on her nerves sometimes. He never gave Marin anything, which was good at least. Still, you have the talent. Mecker looked over at Dorn, who was checking the inside of his helmet. Shame about Jovar, isn't it? If he'd have polished his force skills, he could have really struck it rich. Jovar does what Jovar wants, shrugged Dorn, who didn't want to be dragged into this conversation again. Mecker looked back to Tamar. I'm only saying that in our line of work, it's best to use all your talents. 
Good for credits. Good for saving lives, too. He hesitated as he said the last bit. He was surely thinking of what had happened eight years ago, when nine members of Clan Skirata had gotten ambushed and killed by a Sith Lord on a mission Tamar had pulled them into. Nobody had ever implied it was Tamar's fault, not once. They saved all their anger for Retor of Qvault, who was still out there somewhere, doing whatever Sith Lords did. Surely nothing good. For Tamar, though, those last words took her mind back further. Her sister Nile had been killed by a Sith too, and from what Arlen had told her that nasty bearable was still breathing, probably lurking, and scheming right with Retor. If she ever got a sure shot at vengeance she'd mutter think she wasn't a Jedi and take it right away. She knew that feeling well. Her long grudge against Jevern Arches had ended in a way she'd never expected and never wanted. For a time she thought it would only make things worse, but her daughter's killing of Alchus had resulted in a better Mandalor taking his place. Without it, Tamar wouldn't be with her clan now. She wouldn't be and she dared use the word content. She heard feet approaching from behind and looked back to see Nanette. The young woman called, Bavodu Tamika. You've got a hail. From who? Tamar got off the bench. You're a dicka, Nanette waved. Come on. Tamar followed her back to the camp's communications hut. Marin's old X-Wing couldn't transmit holos, so Tamar went over to the console and tapped the audio link open. Merica, is that you? She asked. Right here. Bet you didn't expect to hear from me this soon. I didn't, Tamar said. What's going on? I've got a mission, and I think I could use a little help. Tamar glanced back at Nanette who leaned in the open doorway with her arms crossed. Mandalorian help. That's right. Tell us about it, said Nanette. Marin ran through a short summary, explaining her meeting with Sheriffith at Broken Moon and the leads she'd acquired that could help her find a potential hut syndicate storehouse in Lent Hills. Tamar didn't like it for a lot of reasons, Sheriffith being the first in the series and the huts being the last. Merica. What are you trying to accomplish in all this? You're not working for the Alliance, you're working for Chan's Calrissian. Even if you knock over his hut storehouse and get proof of what they're doing, then what? We can't stop the weapons flow to Arquilla and make peace there possible. Sounds like a win to me. And make yourself the enemy of some hut syndicate. I'm willing to take the risk. And you want us to help you? Ask Nanette. Mercenaries aren't generally afraid to make a few enemies. Besides, you'll stand to profit from it. Profit how? Sherevith wants me to call in her mercs to claim whatever we find there. I still plan on doing that, but I'd like you guys to be there to get the best stuff first. Why do you need us if you've got her people to back you up? Ask Nanette. I need backup I can trust. That's you guys. Tamar sighed. She was the last person to lecture her daughter on how to be a good Jedi, but she felt she should say something. The worst part was that Marin could see the problems, but she was willing to charge in any way because she thought she had a way to handle them. It was the recklessness of youth, but there was something more. Until 14, her daughter had lived a staid, orderly life at the Imperial Jedi Academy on Bastion. Then in the span of a week, she'd killed the Mandalor, and been wrenched from her closest friends to live on a strange new planet. She'd hated Asus for not being Bastion, but instead of seeking solace and imperial discipline, she'd gone out to roam the Outer Rim, still doing Jedi business but doing it by her own rules. The afterglow from Marin's visits always went away because Tamara kept worrying her daughter would get herself killed. Marin seemed dead set on going to Land Hills because it was the job Arlen had given her and because she wanted to prove to herself that she could. She wasn't going to be talked out of it over a fuzzy long-range audio link. Well, Marin crackled over the comm, do you think you can round up some Mandos interested in a job? Tamar looked back at Nanette. The young woman, so like Marin in appearance, had that reckless, youthful gleam in her eye too. I think we can get a few, Tamar said without enthusiasm. Just tell us where to meet. Chapter 8 Under his previous ruler, the Fountain Palace on Hapes had been a monument of centuries-old wealth and a showcase of luxury. That much remained under Queen Sarissa lore, but so much else had changed. The Grand Audience Chamber now had a martial air, 
for whenever Sarissa gave speeches, she gathered loyal soldiers for her audience instead of fawning, lying nobles. The wings devoted to guest rooms for visiting duchess, each chamber as big as a mansion, had been hollowed out and turned into barracks. The secret prisons deep below the main halls had been expended greatly, though most who were sent down didn't stay long before their inevitable execution. Most striking of all, Darth Terra did not have to creep over rooftops and slip through hidden passages whenever he wanted to speak with the queen. There were still protocols to observe and secrets to keep, but the Sith who now ruled the Hapes Cluster made accommodations for her kin. When Terra's Fury Starfighter arrived it docked in one of the private hangars built into the Oceanside Cliff on which the palace perched. A handful of the queen's most loyal guards were waiting to escort him to their master's private chambers, where he could be alone with Darth Sadal. On ascending to the rank of Lord, every Sith was given the choice of what name to take. Many drew their titles from the ancient Sith tongue, extinct for millennia but passed down in the lore of the Dark Side users. Terrid had selected the word for primal fear, a word which some believed had loaned itself to basic and kept its meaning. Darth Zorin, the first Sith he'd met, had chosen the word for justice. Sadal was the Sith word for royal majesty. It was almost too obvious for a woman-born princess of Hapes, but anyone who met Queen Sarissa Lore could not deny she embodied royal majesty at his most fearsome. When Terrid arrived in the chamber he found her standing before his window, looking out on an ocean that shifted and gleamed in the moonlight. The lights were turned down to a dim sensual glow but Darth Sadal remained by the window, shapeless in her black robe, a shadow limbed by silver. Admiral Vall was quite complimentary, she said. The attack of her bone was flawless. Are Theo dead? He asked as he stepped toward her. Some are being sent to the labor camps. We spared others for interrogation. None provided us with anything we wanted. Her head tilted but he couldn't see her face in the dark. It would be easier if you're spared a few duches for us to pick apart. Sometimes you're too eager. The Duchess had to die. You know they still have spies in your military. If some nobles were taken alive, the loyalists might get word and scupper their last base. Then we'd have to start this all over again. Not if we move quickly. As it is. As it is, I know exactly where the last base is, Terrick Grand. And how do you know that? I placed a tracking device on a ship and left a few survivors to take it. They're in the Orlon system now. Silence spread between them for a moment. Then her laughter filled the room, high-pitched, haughty, musical. Ah, I should know better than to doubt my former teacher. She angled herself so some moonlight lit her face and shone on the black curtain of her hair. Sadal was a beauty even in a society that bred for it. Terry stepped closer. You'll have to send scouts to verify that the base is actually in the system. But if it is there... Then the time has come. She took a deep breath, in and out. He could feel her radiate eagerness in the Force. They'd planned moment for years, and a part of Terra couldn't believe it was here. Are you certain you can convince Darth Wirelock to commit herself? Asked Sadal. We will convince her, together. She'll send as many Sith as she can to Orlan to make sure we end the Loyalists once and for all. Sadal snorted. You're too certain. She's never liked to involve the Sith in fighting the Loyalists. She's afraid of exposing ourselves to the Jedi before her sleeping master tells her it's time. She's let opportunity after opportunity pass her by, Terra nodded. She's also jealous of your power. That power makes you a threat and she knows that. She arced her eyebrow. And I thought we were supposed to be one Sith, serving Darth Krayt's dreams. Hardly. But I have lords like Anexer and Morlet to back me, and they'll bring others. And you're certain they'll leave themselves vulnerable. No Sith Lord is invincible. I shot Darth Tigran in the back, and all Anexer did was distract him for one second. When we gathered the other Lords at Orlin, they'll be helpless against a few well-placed turbolaser blasts. It will be difficult to sort out which Lords to protect and which to survive, Sato said. Some will have to be killed. Why your luck? Melth. Keek it. They'd never accept our leadership. Inexor or Morlin may have to be sacrificed to kill them. I'm aware. Terra smiled viciously. 
As long as you don't vaporize me, I'll count them as acceptable losses. Of course. She reached out and cupped the side of his face with a soft white hand. I plan on sending Val to Orlan. I'll take the rest of my fleet to Shidu Mod. You'll have to time the strikes for exactly the same moment. If you attack Shidu Mod first, Wyerlock will realize she's been betrayed. And when you do strike, you have to grind the planet's surface to ash. I don't know how powerful Darth Crate will be in hibernation, but we can't take chances. You think a man in stasis can destroy a full battle group in orbit? She sounded coy, cocky. He grabbed her hand and squeezed it hard. Do not underestimate Crate. You felt his presence just like I have. Grimly, she nodded. Upon being appointed full lord, all members of the One Sith were finally granted a look at Darth Crate lying in his stasis chamber, moving through dreams. Even as he slept, he emanated incredible raw power, the kind that brought new acolytes to their knees and all. I'm aware of Crate's power, Sato said without withdrawing her hand. But we have something he doesn't. His age has made him conservative. Timid. We have boldness. Passion, he smiled wryly. Exactly? She pulled her hand free, then snaked it around his back and drew him close. What is one old man against that? She kissed him finally. Terrett slipped his hands beneath her robe, felt warm flesh beneath, and drew her closer. A long time ago he'd been raised by Chis who prized discipline. Then Jedi had taught him to value serenity. Even after becoming one Sith some of those lessons remained. It was only since he found this princess and made her into a Sith queen that he discovered the true source from which the Force was mastered. Through passion they gained strength and everything flowed from there. When the Sith had claimed Shidu Mod as their sanctuary, they very purposely erected their fortress around the bones of the former Jedi Academy that had been hidden on this world for many years and protected by the late Jedi Queen Tenoka. Compared to the Great Pyramid on Asus, the one on Shidu Mod was a more humble thing, afforded extra prominence by its position at the edge of a great chasm, layers and layers of the planet's unique dark blue rock, carved over eons by a river since dried. The Sith had taken that pyramid and added to much more. They cut a section deep beneath in which to house Lord Crate's stasis chamber. A shield generator and weapon turrets had been placed around the site, most of them hidden in the surrounding forest. Smaller pyramids extended from the larger one on either flank. These ones made from black stone instead of blue and polished the mirror smoothness. Darth Crone had a good view of the South Pyramid as he stood on a balcony halfway up the main complex. Shidu Ma's two moons were both high in the sky, and their silver light reflect beautifully on the structure's slanting walls. The pyramids were certainly the most aesthetic addition to the complex, but for Crone's reckoning, the most important barring Crate Stasis Chamber, of course, were the weapon and defense emplacements. They'd all been installed under his guidance long ago, back when the Queen of Hapes had been mere vermin instead of a fellow Sith. The ascension of Darth Sado had been a great victory, but he often yearned for earlier days when paranoid Demia Lore had ruled from the Fountain Palace, and Darth Crone had also been Retor of Qvault, chairman of the Kuit Drive Yars Board of Directors and one of the most wealthy men in the galaxy. With his ability to root resources and credits, he'd done more to help the one Sith than any local monarch. That was forgotten too often nowadays, even by those who should have known better. It is not too late to help the Restorationists, Darth Crone told the woman beside him. They've proven they're willing to fight and fight bitterly. They can still be a tool. A tool against whom? Asked Darth Wirelock. The Chagrian's hornless head was laced by red and black tattoos, while the rest of her was draped in robes as dark as the night sky above. Davak fell, and his Imperial Knights will never be allies to us. I doubt they'll even be tools. We should use the ones we already have. The tools you created and have already proved faulty in the past. I admit that Veers was not the most effective proxy, but he still accomplished much. Davik fell split the Jedi Order. That sort of schism hasn't happened in millennia. And by involving ourselves in Imperial squabbles, we invite the Jedi to side with the Imperial Knights, maybe even draw them back into the Order. Wirelock shook her head. Let Veers do what damage he can before Fell finally kills him. But we will not get involved. 
He tried to hide his frustration. What about the situation in Arquilla? This is a place where we can drive fishers in the Alliance. The Jedi are already involved there. Are we shirking confrontation now? They know of our existence. We allied with them to kill a Beleth. A deal which worked out well for us overall, I remind you. That was because of what Abella did to them, not us. No, Darth Chrome, we will not meddle with the situation on Arquilla. I understand the Jedi are already chasing down the gunrunners. We'd risk much and accomplish nothing. I see. Chrome glowered at the pretty pyramid and moonlit forest. So we continue to huddle here. And wait. Darth Sadel's hunt for the remaining loyalists is drawing to a climax. We'll assist her. That took Crone by surprise. While the ascension of a Sith adept to Queen of Hapes was hardly an opportunity she could turn down, Darth Wirelock had remained distant and cautious where Sadal was concerned. The Queen was ambitious and ruthless, fine talents for both a monarch and a traditional Sith, but she lacked the loyalty to Darth Krayt that had been drilled into all those born one Sith. Those born outside the Sith were never fully one, Crone knew that very well. Those who were young, ambitious, and inordinately powerful were distrusted for good reason. What happens after the Loyalists are exterminated? He asked Wirelock. The Chagrian looked out at the night scene. Eventually, she said, We will do as Lord Cray commands. It was the most infuriating non answer. Sometimes he thought Wirelock went out of her way to confound him. When his identity as Rator had been outed to the Jedi and his Ali Veers deposed by Fel, Crone had been forced to flee to Shidu Mod. As punishment for his failures, Wirelock had scarred him with a burst of force lightning. Every time he looked in the mirror, he saw one's handsome face darkened and ugly, the constant reminder of Wirelock's wrath. He could almost bear the shame if she didn't keep inflicting these smaller humiliations. I will think on this, Crone said stiffly and turned to leave. Please do, said Wirelock. The time to act against the Loyalists will come soon. Be prepared. I will, he said, and walked back into the pyramid. The thought of slaughtering helpless vermin had a certain appeal it would at least be acceptable outlet for the anger that smoldered constantly inside since failure had trapped him here. He walked the pyramid stone hallways and made his way toward the habitat section. After going to the lowest level, he passed through what had been a broad open foyer in the days of Jedi residence. Now in a brooding dark space, with a loose ring of torches providing faint illumination. As he passed through the circle, Crone felt a vague presence, but he didn't realize Darth Inexor was there until the Kadruji stepped into a pool of torchlight right in front of him. Lord Inexor, Crone said, how unexpected. Inexor did not step out his way. It is late, Lord Crone. I merely had a conversation with Darth Wirelock. My congratulations for your victory at Rabon. Darth T. Grant was a grave loss. Indeed. But we'll be mounting an even larger force to destroy the last loyalists. Darth Wirelock said so herself. Did she? Inexor seemed faintly surprised, but Crone always had a hard time reading the four-armed alien. Kadraji were a strange species that began life as six-legged canis only to mature into humanoid bipeds, but even as adults there remained something animal and predatory about them. She did. Perhaps she's spoken with Darth Sadal or Darth Tarrant. Perhaps. Inexor paused a moment, then asked, does she plan to intervene in the Empire or Alliance? If you want to know you can ask her yourself. I'm sure you have asked her already. Your desire for a more act of one Sith is well known. Crone didn't know what to make of that. His fall from grace was known to all Sith, so he first took the words as mockery. But Inexor was a known associate of Darth Tarrant. The Chiss clearly shared ambitions with Darth Sadal as well as her bed. Tarrant was the elder of the two, her former master, and Crone had never determined who was leading whom in that partnership. Darth Wirelock believes we must lay low for now he said evenly. We must follow the will our Lord Crate, said Inexor, and Crone thought he caught a touch of mockery, but the damned alien was unreadable in the force. If Inexor was sounding him out, maybe on Terra's behalf, Crone wasn't going to show everything in a surprise conversation. Wirelocks will his crates will. For now, we follow them. 
I'm sure destroying the last loyalist will be a task worthy of the Sith. Indeed, I have never seen you in combat, Darth Krohn. He was old and scarred, and he'd never be able to fend off a Cod Ruji with four lightsabers, but he put on a confident smirk. Perhaps you'll be able to judge soon. I look forward to it. I'm sure you do. Good night, Darth and Exer. Until later. Until later, the other Sith said. Crone slipped past him out of the ring of torches, and only looked back once he was sure he was occluded by darkness. There was no hint of an Exer, nothing visible, nothing in the Force. If he wanted more, he would come back. Crone walked out of the chamber and tried to put the conversation from his mind. Elena was preparing her shuttle for a flight to Coruscant when Tanith appeared at the bottom of the landing ramp with an urgent request to speak with her. Elena took the younger woman into the passenger lounge so she could get out whatever she needed to say. Your Majesty, I just got off the comm with my contact in the Loyalist movement, she said. Elena, feeling a vague premonition she might need to sit down, had taken a spot on the sofa but Tanith remained tense on her feet. What happened? She asked. I told you the Loyalists had one small base and one large one. The small one has been destroyed. Alana sighed. How many escaped? Two. She blinked. Two. Out of almost a thousand. Yes. Our sources inside Cirrus's fleet confirmed the rest were either killed or exported to the labor camps. Alana sunk back into the sofa. Past Happen Queens had a reputation for carefully selected brutality, but there was nothing subtle about Sarissa's action. Over the past eight years, she'd been engaged in the systematic enslavement and murder of an entire class of people. By Alliance law, she was a war criminal a hundred times over. There's more, Tani said. The two survivors were teenagers who escaped in the middle. They said Dutch Alra and all the other nobles were murdered by three Jedi. Jedi. Elena Gate. You mean Sith? The survivors used the word Jedi. So did my contacts. But the survivors specified the killers were using red lightsabers and slaughtered indiscriminately. Sounds very Sith to me, Elena muttered. She'd assumed for years that the Sith had a presence in Hapes, but despite Tanith's capable spy network, they'd never had any actual evidence. Now they had what they'd been waiting for all these years, and it brought no relief. Did the survivors say anything else about the Sith? They were all aliens. One was described as having four arms and four lightsabers. That sounded like a nightmare to fight. What else? One had horns around the top of his head. Possibly an Elemin or a Zabrik. Tanith paused significantly. The last had blue skin and glowing red eyes. Elena was very, very glad she'd been sitting down. The Jedi Order had only taken one chess as an apprentice. Ramor and Caspla had bonded closely with Arlen Fell and Jay Skywalker, but he'd been thought killed during the Synax Juvex crisis. Then, during the hunt for Abeleth eight years ago, he'd reappeared as a Sith Lord. He, Jade, and Jadrum Tainer had worked together to destroy the ancient abomination once and for all, but the chess had escaped with his kind and disappeared. Deep down, Alana had known it was only a matter of time before he resurfaced. Jade had known it too. Is there anything else? Alana asked weakly. Not from my contact, Tani said. Your Majesty, I think this makes it all the more imperative that I meet with the Loyalists. That the situation was more dangerous than ever made Tani more determined to charge again. Alana smiled faintly. She'd not expected anything less. I understand. Have you talked to the Alliance about procuring aid? I was about to head over to Coruscant to speak to the Triumvirs. I'd just gotten a spot on their schedule. Alana didn't try to sound hopeful. They didn't need dishonesty right now. Even Kirash isn't gung-ho about this. What Sirissa is doing is a slaughter. She's as bad as Darth Zorn. The Alliance stopped her. Alana sighed. It was more complicated than that and you know it. Synex Juvex was at least a part of the Alliance until Zorn took it over. Legally, the Alliance recognizes this government, here on New Hapes, as our real one. If Sirissa's power isn't recognized by the Alliance, then, legally, a military expedition in the Hapes cluster wouldn't constitute an invasion. A war is still a war, Tanith. Nobody in the government wants that. 
We have to do something. I know. I'll talk to the Triumvirs. I'll also ask around and see if we can't arrange transport and escorts on private channels. What mercenaries would fight a war with Sarissa? I don't know, but I'll look at all our options. She fixed Tiny the hard stare. When do you plan to go there? I'd like to leave as soon as I make arrangements. Within a day? You have people you'll take with you? Of course. If there's Sith involved in this, you'll need more? Tiny looked hesitant. You know how the loyalists feel about Jedi. Well, if we're going to stop Sarissa, people need to get past old prejudice and old grudges. I hope you've been telling them that. I have. But telling them is one thing. Parading Jedi in front of them is another. Tiny knew she had to lose an argument, so she added, at least make sure all the Jedi are women. And human. Alana smiled tiredly. Wouldn't want the shock to kill them. Go make your arrangements. I'll make mine. Thank you, your majesty, Tiny said, and gave a short stiff bow. The woman hadn't always been this formal. Since Alana had officially received the queen's crown two years ago, Tiny had started showing more deference. Once Tanith was gone, Alana went into the shuttle cockpit, dropped into the co-pilot seat, and fired up the comm system. She definitely hailed Asas and asked Grandmaster Lobaka for some human female Jedi Knights to send to the Hapes Cluster, but there was someone else she needed to talk to first. Alana was up to date on the situation on Arquilla, which seemed to be getting worse and worse. The Jedi may have heroically saved lives, but nobody seemed in a hurry to thank them. The assassination attempt by Tynan extremists had scuppered Senator Torina's talks, and Jade had been left without the job she'd come there to do. The solace was that she was getting to spend time with her son Nat, and when Alana hailed Starlight Intruder, it was the long-haired teenager whose holo image appeared before her. Oh, it's you. The boy's eyes lit up. No deference from that one. We weren't expecting a call. Do you want to speak to Mom or Arlen? I need a word with your mother, please. All right. I'll get her. Nat didn't seem to pick up the gravity in Alana's tone, but when Jay stepped into view 30 seconds later, she had a serious expression. She couldn't have known what Alana was calling for, but she surmised it wasn't good news. I hope this isn't a bad time, Alana said to soften the blow. Not really. It's about time for bed here, but we're all still up. What is it, Alana? Nothing about Arquilla. I just spoke with Tiny Zell, who's been communicating with loyalist insurgents in the Hapes Cluster recently. She just got a very distressing report. Sif. Jade breathed. She'd been expecting it too? Three of them were seen in action, killing a number of nobles. Jade, one of them was a chiss. The other woman closed her eyes. Alana couldn't imagine all that was running through her head just then, but when Jade opened them she said, Tiny is going to take a team to the Loyalist's last base to negotiate. I'm trying to put together an evacuation of their people, but honestly, I don't know where we're going to get the manpower. I'm also going to ask Lobaka for some Jedi to send along. It might rile the Loyalists, but if there's Sith involved, it might be the only option. Are you asking me to come? I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just telling you what we know. You deserve to know? Thanks. I think the reasons I deserve to know are the same reasons I need to be there. They both knew this choice was inevitable from the second Alana made the call. Grimly, she said, I'll leave it to Lobaka to assemble the team. If you want to be part of it, contact him. I will. Thank you for telling me all this. Just be careful. Please? I will. Give my love to Arlen and Nat. Her son's name made Jade flinch a tiny bit. I will. Thank you. As Jade reached for the button to turn off the link, Alana said, I'll talk to you again. I hope more than anything. Jade nodded and shut off the link, leaving Alana alone in the cockpit, wondering if she'd soon regret what she'd done. Chapter 9 As Imperial Knights, Rome, and his brother had infiltrated enemy bases and masqueraded as civilians or criminals in pursuit of restorationist cells, this was the first time they'd done it outside Imperial space, and that alone made it feel different. There were other teams of knights on this same mission, disguised as fringers, and using battered Corellian freighters as they sought the source of the terrorist attack on Bastion, 
but this was unfamiliar territory, and it made Rome feel alone. Vitor didn't show it, but he wouldn't have. Morgan was visibly on edge, and so was Trees, though he hid it better. Things would get smoother, Rome hoped, once they actually started doing something. As it was, their team had been instructed to fly out along the Perlemian trade route while another team paid a visit to the port at Corson from which the terrorist ship had launched. They might be called to Corson themselves, or they might be sent elsewhere. A half dozen teams of knights had been scattered and waited to go wherever they were needed. Waiting was the worst part because you had too much time to start wondering how things could go wrong. After two days of hovering outside the hyperlanes between Chaswa and Tanab, they got their hail, and all four young men crammed into their CT-2000 freighter's cockpit to speak, with Yaren September, leader of the Corson team. Thank you for your patience, the older knight said. The investigation took longer than we'd hoped. What did you find? asked Vitor. The ship the terrorists used to destroy Skyhook, one was listed as belonging to a commercial shipping company based on Axela, but when we went there we found its corporate offices empty. A shell company, said Rome. Did you trace its owners? We had to persuade the government on Axela to share their incorporation records, but yes. That company is owned by another one incorporated on Selenon. We were able to access records for the Selenon company and found it's an umbrella owning a half dozen other units besides the Axilla company. So what are we getting at here? Frowned Morgan. Do we think all these companies are owned by Veers? Is this how he's been getting supplies and stuff the past few years? It's possible, but the Selenon company was created 12 years ago. That's public record. The Axilla company was created five years ago. Ronald suggested, Veers could be working with some criminal syndicate and using their network to shuffle money and supplies. And civvy ships loaded up with bombs, Trace added darkly. His Majesty the Emperor was very thorough in going after Veers' financial resources, September told them. We've suspected he's been relying on criminal ties the past few years, but we've never had a good lead on them until now. It's unpleasant to say, but that attack on Skyhook 1 did us a favor. If we can trace his supply lines, we may even be able to find Nemesis. Vitor sighed. What do you need us to do in all this? You're a short jump away from one of the other shell companies. It's listed as a shipping and storage firm on Lantils. I'll transmit its commercial address at the end of this message. What do we need to do once we get there? Observe. Investigate. Infiltrate if you can. Our theory is that the criminal group provided the freighter and its cover and restorationist agents set the explosives. If there's anything on land tells anything in their records or computer systems that can verify or deny that, we need to know. If you can figure out which criminal syndicate is actually behind all of this, even better. You've got other teams checking the other sites, asked Rome. Yes, we're on our way to Terrace now. Then may the force be with you, said Vitor. We'll let you know what we find. Thank you. Be safe, your majesty, September said, and killed the link. Roan felt his brother flush with embarrassment at the other night's sign-off. In theory, seniority decided ranks among imperial knights, but as the emperor's sons, they were showed reverence when it wasn't strictly their due. Embarrassment rolled off Vitor easily. He looked at the young knights and said, Okay, you've hurt the man. Let's head to Lantils. The planet's low orbit was thick with a constant stream of inbound and outbound traffic. Heavy industrial transports lifted off from the surface. Light cargo ships, personal shuttles, and medium scouts docked and detached from berths aboard the space stations and skyhooks. Lantils was one of the primary transport and industrial hubs on the Perlemian trade route, and with all the ships moving about nobody paid much attention to a single ovoid light freighter sitting high above the world's largest orbital station. The bottom line angled itself to look straight down on the station and the broad gray planet beneath and through the cockpit viewport to Marscarada examined the artificial structure. From straight above it looked rather like a gigantic Dedrick board, with two dozen exactly equal square compartments arranged in a grid. The station's lower layer was a disk for smaller vessels to dock at, 
But this main grid was a collection of industrial grade storehouses, each with its own access station for heavy cargo ships to dock at. According to her daughter's maybe reliable sources, the criminals who were supplying weapons to Lantils may have been routing their merchandise through the station. Tamar hated just about everything in this arrangement. She hated the tenuous leads and suspected Sheriff was just using Marin as a pawn to strike out at a competitor. She hated that Marin had docked her X-Wing in one of the lower ring hangars and gone alone into the station's great belly to try to access the storehouses from the inside. The only that provided any comfort was that she had a good set of warriors stuffed into the ship with her, starting with its owner, her cousin Mecker. Dorn and Nene had come too, and a half dozen other Skiratas all enticed by Marin's offer to let them in on whatever was inside that storehouse. Bottom line had been waiting almost a full standard day in its current position, monitoring the comm signals constantly flaring in and out of the station. There were too many to keep track of, but all they needed was to find some transmitter using one of the HUD syndicate encryption frequency sheriff it had provided. They set the ship's computer to alert them if the signal came up and sat down for a long wait. Marin, meanwhile, docked her X-Wing and explored the station from the inside. The wait was aggravating but eventually patience paid off. Mecker called everyone to the cockpit and announced that the computer had picked up one of the flag frequencies and traced it to a private transmitter attached to a storehouse on the grid beneath. What clan did the freak belong to? Asked Tamara as she hung over Mecker's pilot seat. Looks like, for Sadie, I, the scarred mandal said. What do we know about them? Not as major as the Angeliac or Desilegic. But I've heard they've been getting bigger lately, Mecker's son giant said from the co-pilot seat. Tamar tapped him on a yellow Besker shoulder plate. Patch a line in with Marin. Sure thing. Giant tapped on the comm console. A few short seconds later Marin's voice came up. I'm here, she said simply. What's going on? We've got a fix on the storehouse. They just sent a signal on the Vesadii freak from storehouse Bash 7. Can you get there from where you are? Yeah, I've had plenty of time to look over this place's internal schematics. That sounds doable. Do we know what the message said? Coming right up, Giant said, and his fingers played across the comm controls again. It wasn't very long. Hold up, here it is. The transmission they caught seemed to be audio only, and it was all in Huttese. The voice wasn't low and rumbling enough to be a hut and Tamar guessed it was a Nikto or Weekwe. She picked up her share of the tongue during her years as a fringer, but it had gotten rusty since her return to Mandalore. She could make sense of a few scraps, future tense verbs, references to a shipment, and references to weapons. The word Arquilla sounds almost the same in Hatties as in basic. That was confirmation of a pickup time for another shipment, Marin translated. It sounded like they were talking to contacts on Arquilla. Sounds like we've got the place then said Mecker. How do we want to play this? I'll scope the area from the inside first, said Marin. Once I get a grip on how many people they've got inside, I'll call you down. Are we looking at hard insertion? Asked Giant. We've been scoping out those exterior docking ports. We can probably burn through if we have two. I don't know yet. Those storehouses are sealed super tight even from the inside. I'm going to try and get close to the port and sneak in from there. Security's gonna be tight, said Mecker. Be very careful, Tamar warned. I know. Just hold position for now. I'll come when I get closer. Checking out. The comm line severed and Tamar couldn't help but sigh. Mecker leaned back in his chair and flashed her a grin like a knife slash. They grow up fast, don't they? She has major getsy for a GD said Giant. Can definitely see the Skirata blood. Don't get carried away with the flattery, Tamar said. It's time for everybody to get suited up. We need to be ready to move. Sometimes Marin wished she could have a nice set of Beskar armor like her mother or Nanette. It was terrible for getting places without drawing attention but in a firefight it was hard to beat. Marin had more or less completed the former stage. She'd had almost a standard day to scout the insides of the great orbital station. The large storehouses were meant to be accessed from the inside as well as via the external docking ports, but both the internal 
and external portals connected to a single vestibule that led through a single gateway. The storehouses were pretty much impregnable otherwise, separated from each other, and the rest of the station by meters thick metals walls even a lightsaber couldn't cut all the way through. The station was so vast and the storehouses so huge that a series of internal lifts were designed to carry personnel from a central hub to the different storehouse gateways. Marin had no doubt that if she tried to ride the lift to storehouse Besh 7, she'd alert its owners to her presence, which meant she had to take the slow path. The force was enough to pry open the doors and access the tube. From there it was a long, long climb up the rungs of a maintenance ladder that lined one side of the lift shaft. After about 30 minutes of climbing the infinite seeming tunnel, she decided that, even above some Biscargam, what she really needed was a good jetpack. Some Jedi could draw on the force to give energy to their worn out muscles, but it was a skill she'd never learned. And once her arms and shoulders started to ache, she began to use the force instead to propel her few extra rungs every time. She knew she reached the end of the line when she saw the bottom of lift capsule sitting above her. From the schematics, it looked like there was only a start and an end point for the lift and no other places it was stopped, which meant that the capsule was almost certainly parked at the storehouse entrance. It also meant that whoever had last used the thing had ridden it into the storehouse rather than away. That told her nothing about who'd been aboard, how many there'd been, and whether they were armed, but it was something to be aware of. She knew that if she cut into the lift capsule, and forced her way into the gateway vestibule she'd alert the gangsters inside. Instead, still clinging to the ladder rungs with tired arms, she scanned the opposite side of the shaft. Running parallel to this lift tube was a climate control duct that carried atmosphere from the station center into the storehouse itself. She searched for the metal grate through which she could access the duct that ran beneath the vestibule, but what she found was a rectangular hole about a half meter wide without anything to cover it. She had looked closer to be sure. Marin drew on the force to carry her across the shaft as she jumped, but when she grabbed hold of the hole's edge, she nearly cried out in pain and let herself drop. Instead, she clung harder, even as the scorched edge dug into her glove palms and planted the tips of her boots against the sides of the shaft for purchase. Then, with an addition boost from the force, she pulled herself head first into the duct. There had been a gate here, all right and somebody had cut through, probably with a plasma torch, though even a lightsaber could have left burnt marks like those. Marin couldn't tell how long ago those had been made, but she didn't like them. Lying flat on her stomach, pressed on all sides by the dark compact duct, she closed her eyes and reached out with the force. There was conscious activity above her, directly above, in fact, in what must have been the gateway vestibule. She sensed other minds, a little more distant, inside the storehouse itself. She had no idea what any of it meant, but she did what she could, which was keep crawling ahead. She didn't have space to turn around if she wanted to. Marin pulled herself with palms and elbows until she reached a place where the duck branched off in two directions, straight up and straight down. There was no way she'd be able to crawl vertically up this tight slick shaft and she wasn't crazy about trying down even with the force but it seemed to be the only option. Bending her body to crawl through the narrow bend was difficult and she found herself glad she didn't have bulky Biscargam on now. She used the force and the palms of her gloves to slow her awkward face first slide down the air shaft. She was relieved when she found the grate that let her out into the storehouse itself, but she reached out with the force once more to make sure nobody was nearby. She says presences, still faint, and awkwardly pulled her lightsaber from her hip. After that, she pressed its tip against one corner of the grate and thumbed its golden blade on. It cut easily through the sides of the grate and she shut it off the second she was done. A one-handed push was enough to knock the grate outward, and she reached out with the force to slow its fall and soften the noise it made when it hit the floor. To her surprise, there was no noise and there was no floor. When she let the grate go, it started to float away slowly, utterly weightless. Marin crawled out head first and pushed herself into the great zero-g cavern of the storehouse. It made perfect sense, she realized. Moving heavy industrial objects was a lot easier without gravity, and removing it entirely saved the station considerable money and energy. Still, 
Marin used the force to steady herself in place and looked at the rows of storage racks that spread out above her, below her, and ahead. There must have been several hundred in here but about half of them looked like they were empty. The others contained standard heavy cargo crates 10 meters long, 4 wide, and 4 high. The only way to find out what was inside was to look. Before she used the force to push herself toward the nearest crate, Marin looked around. There were bound to be some internal security cameras inside, and probably heat or motion sensors, but she couldn't see any on the racks or long chamber walls. Just when she felt tentatively safe, Marin saw something flicker over the edge of a cargo crate stacked three shelves directly above her. Instead of drawing out her lightsaber, she grabbed the blaster pistol she'd brought along. The inertia of firing the thing would kick her downward, but she didn't want to immediately out herself as a Jedi. She used the force to edge herself beneath the nearest crate while she still looked up and sensed with the force. There were multiple people three rows above her, alarmed but ready to defend themselves. Well, so was she. Marin gave herself another force push and edged herself toward the crate above her. Just as she did so, she felt a spike of danger behind her and kicked away. A laser blast sizzled past her shoulder, and with the force again, she spun herself around and raised her blaster. Another figure human, male, was peeking around the edge of the crate directly beneath her. A second shot just missed her and she fired back two of her own. The attacker ducked behind his cover and her shots went sizzling across the vast chamber until they shrunk to nothing. The kickback from her blaster sent Marin flying. Her shoulders and the back of her head hit the bottom of the crate and she snarled back a swear as she fumbled out her comlink. Do you read me? I'm having trouble here. She called. What's happening? Her mother responded at once. Taking some fire. Here. I'm inside the storehouse. Big zero G thing, fear fact. The guy beneath her darted into view again. She popped off a shot before he could fire, but he ducked away. Copy, we're on outway. Hold on, Tamar said, and killed the link. Marin spotted the guy beneath her and she fired again, but once more he fell behind the cover of his crate. She sensed another one, closer by, just in time for a second male figure to bound over the edge of the crate she was using. He grabbed the corner with his hands and swung two booted feet right toward Marin. They took her in the stomach and he followed through with his blow to knock her whole body shoulders hips, and legs flat against the crate's underside. She still had her blaster, and she raised it up to fire point blank. Before she got the shot off, a pure white blade of energy burst out of nowhere and cut through her weapon. The pistol sparked apart and the barrel drifted away, unnaturally slow. The white blade buzzed so close it took Marin a stunned second to see the face beyond. It was immediately seemed an echo of one she'd known, longer but also wider with unfamiliar bags beneath the eyes and a few days stubble on the chin. Everything seemed harder, more angular, than what she remembered, even as the features went slack in surprise. She felt him in the force too. Like his face, it was similar but different, changed so much by all their years apart but instantly recognizable. Vitor. She gasped. What the hells are y'all doing here? The one who'd been hiding behind the lower crate swung into view. He seemed to fly toward her effortlessly, surely using a force push of his own. He had dark hair and tan skin, and as he grew closer she realized his face was familiar too. He reminded her of another apprentice Jedi she'd known on Bastion all those years ago. Tree Sende, all grown up. Vitor was struggling with something to say. Marin, staying it. What are I doing here? Marin stared into his eyes. Those, at least, seemed unchanged after all this time. As the sheer unlikely absurdity of this situation finally struck, her odd expression relaxed into a slanted grin. Hey, I ask first. Vitor opened his mouth to answer when the sound of laser fire echoed through the vast space. As Sin threw himself up toward Vitor and Morin, she heard the sound of lightsabers snapping to life above and the ricochet of laser blasts into hard metal. As the fighting sounded above, new figures fell into view. Rather than pulling themselves across the cargo racks, propelled by the force, they arrived on the burn of jetpacks strapped to their backs. 
three green skin Nikto, and one Leatherface Weequay dropped on the three knights as one, raised their blaster rifles, and opened fire. Chapter 10 As the bottom line dropped rapidly toward the exterior docking port of Orbital Storehouse Besh 7, Tamar Skarada's concern for her daughter was just briefly overridden by the thought that a black market facility owned by a hut syndicate might have hidden defenses not. Even a charging Mandalorian ship could break through. There wasn't time to worry. Mecca was pushing them hard and fast toward the storehouse, and right as his flat blocky form filled the viewport he shouted, Hold on. And wrenched his ship's controls. Tamar was bound to the seat behind him by crash webbing, but bottom line sudden twist nearly wrenched her out of it and smashed her helmeted head into the nearest bulkhead. As it was, her brain swam, and her stomach tried to punch out of her ribcage, and then both tried to leap straight up as Mecker dropped the ship hard right onto the docking port. Metal screamed against metal, the cockpit shook one more time, and then Mecker shouted, We're in. Oh yeah, Mando. Oh yeah? By the time Tamar got out of her crash webbing, Giant and Nene were already free, and scrambling for the hold where the rest of them were already gathered. As Mecker pushed out of the pilot's seat and fell in behind her, he slapped her shoulder and said, Don't push too hard, Tamika. We'll never keep up with the young ones. That was the problem, she thought, but kept it to herself. She could still feel Marin's presence, not too far away. It was panicked, but there was something else strange about it. She didn't know what. She came up behind Nanette just as Bottom Lion's external laser cutters burned through the first layer of the storehouse to seal tight airlock. Like all Mando ships, Mecker's was built for forcible entry. Tamar listened as the cutters ripped a hole through the second layer. She made a quick scan of the surrounding warriors, her family, Nanette with red armor over a white body glove, Mecker in black with a big white mythosaur symbol painted on the face, Dorn in his customary green, giant in slightly garish yellow and violet. Tamar was in black and blue besker, and she'd had that suit all her life, after all she'd been through. There was a reason Mandas valued dead Vol's armor over their bodies. When the last layer blew, bottom line's main airlock slid open. The younger, faster fighters like Giant and Nene were at the front of the charge, and from the tang of laser fire it sounded like they had opposition waiting. When Tamar got out and joined them in the fray she saw an open space with doors on the left and right walls plus stacked up storage crates the opposition used as cover. She did a quick count, four piled. Marin said she was in the main storage chamber, which Tamar was pretty sure lay through the large right gate. She spotted something small arc out from behind a crate and drop toward Nene and Jai. She immediately reached out with the force to grab it, arrest its fall, and throw it back to the place where it had been thrown. The crate partially contained the grenade's concussive blast but the entire chamber still shook and filled with smoke. Tamar quickly switched her helmet viewer to IR scope and charged ahead. She followed Nene and Giant as the two warriors charged into a spray of enemy fire. Their Biscard deflected the laser blasts, and they leaped high, atop the crates and over them. Tamar came around from the flank to find Giant putting two shots into a Nikto's chest while Nanette wrenched a knife from a Rodian's hand and dropped him with the snap of armored elbow to green forehead. Try to take some alive if you can. Tamar told them. She'd never been as comfortable with casual killing since her stint of Jedi training. She looked across the room to see Mecker and Dorn charge around another set of crates and gun down the two platoonins behind. The room resounded with a few more blaster shots. Then all that was left was the clank of boots and armor. Are we clear? Tamar called. She dared reach out in the force. Marin was still alive and still fighting. Room's clear. Mecker confirmed. We need to get those open. Tamar threw an arm at the set of blast doors big enough to move cargo through. The portal opposite was much smaller, probably the entrance to a turb lift. Dorn was already at the controls. After a few quick taps, the doors began to groan open. Shablaki, Mecker grunted. I thought we'd have to blow these things. Any sign we've alerted station security? Asked Nanette. We made a lot of noise. Nothing I can tell, said Dorn. They might have turned off built-in alarms. You can bet these guys don't want to involve legitimate authorities if they don't have to. 
As the wide doors opened, Tamar stepped to the threshold's edge. Her eyes were immediately drawn downward into a steep plunge. Rows and rows of industrial-grade racks for heavy cargo crates lined the chamber walls hundreds of meters down. Clear space ran down the center, about four meters square. They heard laser fire down below but from this portal, at the top of a long, long drop. Tamar couldn't see much aside from light flash from unseen sources. Mecker stepped beside her and looked down. Great. How do we handle this? Nanette appeared on her other shoulder. Merica said this thing was zero G. Let's find out. She plucked a blaster from one of the dead and gave it a light toss into the vast chamber. Instead of arcing up and falling, it tumbled in a straight and lazy line toward the opposite wall. Zero G, Nanette confirmed. And like I said, how do we handle this? Snarled Mecker. None of us have jetpacks. Told you we should have brought him, Boor, muttered Jine. Well, it's too late now, ain't it? More laser fire sounded below, and Tamar heard the hum of a lightsaber. No, more than one. She didn't know what the hell was going on down there, but there was no time to hesitate. She took two steps back, then jumped through the threshold. Gravity disappeared in an instant and left her disoriented. The sound of laser fire was enough to give her direction. The chamber spread out far below, and she saw red rifle shots maybe a hundred meters past her flailing boots. She also spotted bright, darting flares. Someone else had jetpacks. Lovely. She could use the force to give her body some direction in this zero-g void, but she'd never be as good as Marin or any real Jedi. Her family behind her couldn't use it at all. So instead, she extended her left arm and prepared the fiber core grappling hook mounted over the wrist. She remembered his range, took a guess on distance, and aimed for a cargo crate two racks down. Then she let it fly. This damned mission had taken too many turns for Rome's liking. It had been Tree's idea to climb up the long, long turbolift shaft to restore House Bash 7 and Viters to crawl through the air ducts and sneak up on the beings they felt inside. They hadn't expected the storehouse interior to be one giant zero gravity compartment and they definitely hadn't expected a Jedi Knight to come popping out of another vent ten minutes after they did. That this Jedi was their cousin Marin, a woman they hadn't seen in eight years, and had grown so much Ron barely recognized her made things downright surreal. Fighting an enemy in Zero-G also helped the surreality. Ron had grown up in wartime and seen a lot of action but he never had to use the force to throw his weightless body back and forth across a giant chamber while enemies with directional jetpacks and blaster rifles whipped about, popping off shots. Roan and Trees were taking cover beneath the cargo crate on the opposite wall and one level up from Morgan, Marin, and Vitor. Their opponent's seven beings with jetpacks were hovering in the center of the chamber, jerking back and forth and never staying still popping off shot after shot from their rifles that the knights were forced to deflect with their lightsabers. Only Vitor had a blaster rifle, and he wasn't half as skilled with it as he was with his saber. Right now the enemy was bobbing and weaving through the air five meters away, and it was impossible to score a hit without throwing themselves helplessly into the weightless void and trying their lightsabers. Only one of them seemed game. Roan felt Marin's force presence, half familiar, reach out to the rest of them, and tell them to get ready. Then the woman pushed off from the crate and shot headfirst across the gap. She held her lightsaber in front of her one gold amidst four white blades and deflected the first few shots coming at her. She used the force to direct herself onto the jetpack equipped Rodian nearest to her and tackled him midair. A flick of her saber cut off his blaster hand. The alien wailed, and both their bodies spun head over heels toward the wall. Then her hand found the controls to the jetpack, and both of them went flying up on a burst of flame. The others flying in the middle of the chamber turned their weapons upward and fired. Roan looked up just in time to see a dozen more bodies coming toward them, and his heart fell. Treese, though, was emboldened and threw himself across the gap. He moved less gracefully than Marin, but he collided with a Nikto distracted by the newcomers, and used the force to hurl both of them into the far wall. The Nikto impacted back first, breaking his jetpack with a crunch and a flash. Taking one more out wouldn't do them much good. 
The newcomers didn't have jetpacks, but they used fibercord grappling hooks to move across the racks with surprising speed. Rome spotted a body in gleaming black armor with the bullet-shaped T-visor helmet of a Mandalorian. Another fell beside that one, armored in red, and another in green. Against a squad of mercenaries in light saber-proof armor, five knights wouldn't stand. It would be ancient all over again. Yet as Rome steeled himself for a vicious fight the red-armored Mandalorian raised the rifle in his free hand and shot the nearest jetpack-mounted Rodian. More shots from the Mandalorians rained down, all of them aimed at the aliens who suddenly found themselves surrounded. Two jetpacks exploded, taking their riders with them. A Nikto threw away his gun and waved his hands in surrender. One jetpack took a winging shot and released a burst of thrust that slammed his rider headfirst into a crate with a sick crunch. When it was done, when all the storehouse's defenders were disposed of, a single jetpack mounted figure thrust into the group of Mandalorians. It was Marin Fell, and she wore a relieved grin on her face. You all have wonderful timing, she said. Hell of a stash you found, the red armored one said with a woman's voice. Gonna have to call up another ship to haul all this cargo back, whooped another Mando. Rome decided the situation had crossed the line from surreal to outright impossible. He knew his cousin had a Mandalorian mother but from all he'd heard, she'd been trained as a Jedi Knight on Asus by her father. Marin tilted herself to find Vitor. Come on, she called. Let's get up top. I'll explain everything. Vitor looked as stunned as Rome, but he nodded. Marin flew close to him and Morin on her jetpack and said, Come on, in zero-g this thing can take some weight. Suddenly a grappling hook lashed onto the crate next to Rome and the red-armored Mando dropped onto it, feet first. Her body titled perpendicular to Rome's but she turned her helmet to face him and asked, almost casually, want to ride? The knights and Mandalorians worked their way out of the storage chamber one row at a time with the force and fibercord grapplers to pull them along. Vitor and Morgan ascended more easily with their cousin's jetpack and they were first to reach the threshold into the main vestibule. When they dropped out of view, Rome felt a spike of panic from them, though he had no idea why. He and the Mando woman, Nanette, weren't far behind, and he clung to her red-armored back as her grappler pulled them both through the threshold and spilled them into the gravitized entry chamber. They landed on their sides but disentangled when they saw what was waiting. Nanette reached for her blaster and Rome for his lightsaber but neither drew them fully. Filling the chamber were two dozen more beings, mostly human, layered in combat armor with blaster rifles aimed and ready. Marin stood in front of all those bristling barrels with her hands raised high and prayed she hadn't miscalculated her relationship with Sheriff. The rest of the Skaratas clambered up through the threshold and into the chamber but none of them fired. The Mandalorians knew when Oz were against them and practiced restraint. She prayed the mercenaries would too. When she was sure she had enough armored mandos at her back to give a trigger happy Merc pause, Marin stepped forward. A few rifle barrels twitched to track her but nobody fired. Marin scanned the soldiers. Each wore armor of a different design. Some had open-faced helms with visors, others full buckets on their heads. She spotted the blue crescent stamp on many of their outfits, variously on shoulders, breastplates, or helmets. She'd heard of Blue Moon as one of the new mercenary groups that had popped up on the Outer Rim. She should have taken the name as a hint of Sheriff's involvement. She fixed her attention on a yellow-skinned Twilig man at the center of the group and said, You were supposed to wait for my signal. We were, the Twilig replied from behind the barrel of his gun. Then we saw a Mando freighter smash his way into the storehouse and figure somebody might need some help. These are my people. They helped me secure this place. Well, that's good. Some people might think you were trying to get the jump and claim all the merchandise for yourselves. You've seen our ship. Does it look like we can haul all this stuff out of here? We've seen one ship. How do we know that's all you've got? He was put in on a hard act, but she knew he didn't want to fight. Can you get me a direct line with your boss? Let me talk to her and we can sort this out. The Twilix eyes narrowed. Give me one minute. He ducked away from the front lines, between the shoulders of two bigger mercs, probably to get his long-range comm equipment. 
Marin, what is this? She heard Vitor say. What's going on? She glanced over her shoulder and saw him staring so many questions. His eyes amplified the confusion she already felt in the force. What she felt, what she saw, stung hard. Vitor was looking at her as though she were a total stranger. She still had no idea what he and his brother were doing here. They didn't have that pretty red armor on like she'd seen in news holos but they were clearly here on Imperial Night business. She and Vitor both needed explanations, and they shared the first chance they got, but right now she needed to make sure nobody else got killed today. With the look, with the force, she tried to tell him that. No matter what he was thinking now she was still a Jedi, more Jedi than him. The Twi'lek stepped back out of the crowd. He had his rifle dangling from a shoulder strap and held up a holo projector with both hands. An electric head and shoulders image of Sheriff had blazed in front of him as she turned a familiar smile at Meringue. It looked colder than usual. It appears you've secured your target, Sheriff had said. Congratulations. I see you called your family for assistance. It's good to have people you can trust. How true. She twirled a finger around the tip of one Leku. You also haven't told your family to lay down arms. I'd love to say we're all friends. Tell me, did your lovely kin help you because you were family albeit a half-Jedi prodigal, or did they come because you promised them a cut of the merchandise? Marin was still pretty sure she could end this with everyone happy. I said they get the first shot. Whatever they can load back into their ship. They've got a light freighter. Enough for two or three crates worth of goods. There's at least a hundred crates here, and you can have the rest. Resell this stuff to whomever you want so long as they're not Arquilla. Though you might want to do it quietly, since the huts are going to want to know who knocked over their storehouse. I hope your ten heads can keep their mouths shut. My people won't talk if yours won't. We all take what we need and get out of here. I think that's a win for everybody. Have you opened any of those crates yet? No. We just secured this place five minutes ago, and we haven't gone through their computers or cargo manifests yet. Those are what we really need if we're going to get to the source of this thing. I see. Now tell me, did you find the storehouse using the decryption codes I provided? I did. And would you mind telling me which code came in handy? Marin had a feeling this was the last thing. With a tight smile, she said, for Sadie, eh? A little surprise played on Sheriff's blue features. Very interesting. Well, I think we found a suitable arrangement for everyone. Captain. Yes, said the Twilic Merc. You've heard our terms. Let the Mandas have the first shot at things. Once their ship is gone, proceed as planned. Very good, madam. The Merc shut off the holo and raised a flat hand. The two dozen men behind him lowered their guns. Marin grinned at them. She'd been terrified, but exhilarated too. Victory pumped like adrenaline through her body, filling her with lightheaded energy. Normal Jedi stuff studying, practicing, negotiating, mediating never gave the rush of knife edge risk. The sight of the faces behind her brought her back down. Her mother, Nanette, and the other Mandas still had their helmets on but the confusion in Viter's eyes had only deepened. At his side was Roan with the same expression, grown so much in eight years she hadn't even recognized him until the fighting was over. Marin hooked her lightsaber on her belt and called, Okay, you hear all that? First let's find a computer terminal see what we've got. Shipment schedules, cargo lists, anything to save us the trouble of opening each crate one by one. There's gotta be an inventory somewhere. We'll take care of it, America, said Nanette. The other Mandas were already in motion. She could tell they were eager to count the spoils from their hard work. Marin shifted her gaze to Vitor. I think we got a lot to talk about. I think you do too, said Tamar. She wrenched the helmet off her head and looked to the Fell brothers. Vitor. Rome. It's been a while. You're right, Vitor said blankly. It really has? Okay, let's talk. Marin stalked over to the open door into the storage chamber. Her mother and the four Imperial Knights circled around her but she looked straight at Vitor and said, First things first. How did you find this place and what are you here for? 
He crossed arms over his chest and replied in a voice guarded like his posture. We were trying to track the people responsible for the terrorist attack on Bastion. That was Veer's people, said Tamar. It had to be. Yes, but they used a ship belonging to company from Elias Space. Best we can tell, that ship flew out from course and loaded down with enough explosive to tear Skyhook 1 apart, which means Veers has outside friends. We followed a trail that pointed here. Now what are you here for? She didn't like the accusation in his voice. This is Jedi business. The Huts have been shipping weapons to Arquilla, fueling unrest and giving the Alliance a big headache. I'm working with my dad to stop them. His expression softened but his eyes drifted across the crowds of mercenaries. What about all your friends? Some of them are family. You know that. The rest are people I have to make deals with to get things done. What happens now? Asked Rome. We've taken the storehouse. Will that stop these arms shipment to Arquilla? I have no idea. Probably not, which is why I'll have to dig deeper. You mean challenge a hut cartel? Morgan asked, incredulous. I don't know yet. I need to talk with my dad and see if he has any ideas. What about you? Vitor said, if Veers is working with the hut syndicate, knocking out one storehouse isn't going to change anything. We need to dig deeper too. So you'll challenge a hut cartel. She looked at Vitor and saw something else in his eyes, something deeper than disbelief or confusion. He looked away. I think so. If we can help each other, we should. She tried to touch him in the force, share that connection that had once come easy for them. They'd been close as brother and sister once. They shouldn't have to stay strangers. He pulled away from her touch, and he refused to meet her eye. But he said, yes. You're right. We've got the same goal. There was a lot more they needed to say to each other, and they needed to say it without her mother, Roan, and the others around, but that time wasn't now. She started to reach out with the force one more time but was interrupted by a loud, triumphant shout from Mecker. We're in their computers, America. The Mando called. Come on, let's see what they've been shipping through this place. We should all have a look, Tamar said, and started toward Mecker and the computer. Marin followed, then Vitor and the others joined her. Vitor tried to pay attention as they reviewed the storehouse's data files, but it was difficult. Since he woke in his bunk aboard their freighter this morning, everything around him had seemed unreal. When Marin had appeared before him, floating in that zero-g storage chamber, he first thought had been that he was still dreaming. Then the Hutz thugs had arrived, then the friendly Mandalorians, then a second set of mercenaries whom Marin convinced to lay down arms after a personal chat with their boss. It was absurdity piled on absurdity, but more than them it was Marin herself who knocked him off balance. After they'd first been separated, him on Bastion and her on Asus, he'd indulged in fantasies of what it would be like to meet her again. He'd imagined they'd both be full knights, her Jedi, and he a servant of the Empire. Some mission would bring them together, and that mission would in turn help heal the schism between Imperial Knights and Jedi. The bridge between them would bridge their respective orders. He clung to that with a young person's faith for years. He never lost it exactly. Rather, he'd quietly forgotten about it, misplaced it somewhere as the grim realities of youth and wartime superseded fantasies of what should have been. And yet, buried and neglected, it had always been there, the hope that the friendship which had meant so much was not gone forever. The Marin in front of him now was not like the Marin he'd known or expected to find. In eight years she'd gotten tall and grown out like a woman, her appearance recalled her mother more than her father. More disconcerting was her behavior. Marin claimed she was helping her father, and he believed her, but were it not for the lightsaber he'd never believe she was a Jedi. For all their differences the Jedi and the Imperial Knights both pledged themselves to a life of service balanced by contemplation. In the short time since their reunion he sensed in her an exhilaration and recklessness coupled with hard pragmatism. It was a combination better suited for a mercenary or bounty hunter than a force serving knight, but from what he could sense from Marin's mother, Tamar Scarada was less than pleased with today's events too. Even Marin he could have dealt with, 
transformed as she was, if not for the dream that had thrown him out of sleep four hours before their ship arrived at Land Hills. For years his dreams had never showed him false. Sometimes he was grateful for them but more often he raged at them for not warning him before the Restorationists ambushed an Imperial fleet or drove a transport loaded with bombs into a skyhook over Bastion. Well, he'd gotten his warning this time. As usual, he remembered only the last fleeting moment of this morning's dream. The end was enough. It was all that mattered. When he jerked up, shaken in his bunk his eyes had burned with the last images of a woman's face pale and beautiful but curled into a vicious sneer. That face was lit from beneath by a sickly red glow, and he remembered his dream vision panning down from her face to the double-bladed lightsaber in her hands, then following a hot buzzing blade as it speared right through the center of his chest. Even now, after everything that had happened today, he could remember that beautiful, horrible face. He remembered the blade that would kill him. His visions never showed him false, he knew that. But in the hours after waking he tried to argue otherwise. He told himself the chest he'd seen impaled was not his own, or that he could somehow survive a lightsaber through the heart. He'd even indulged the old maxim that the future was always in motion. He wasn't sure if he'd believed any of it. Focusing on the mission was the only thing that had kept his nerves from breaking down. But with Marin's appearance he couldn't deny what else he'd seen. Beyond the lightsaber. Beyond that beautiful snarling woman, he'd seen a little more. There had been a second woman behind the one who killed him, not distant but not close enough to reach them. On waking her face had been a blur, remembered only for his expression of shock and horror. Now he knew it for certain. As Marin had said, they had the same goal. And they would walk it together for a time, until they encountered that beautiful woman with a double-bladed lightsaber and eyes full of murder and they would face her together, and Marin would be there to watch him as he died.